This evening's discussion, as you know, will center on the objectivist theory of volition. It will be concerned with elaborating the principle that man is a being of volitional consciousness. This theory is central and basic both to objectivist philosophy and to objectivist psychology. What is meant by the statement that man is a being of volitional consciousness? Well, I will ask you first of all to consider the following. In a previous lecture, I have discussed the fact that there are three basic cognitive units or forms of awareness that characterize man's consciousness, sensations, perceptions, conceptions. And I have discussed the fact that the process of integrating individual disparate sensations into percepts is done automatically by the nervous system and the brain. That is, sensations flow into the organism. These are automatically integrated and related, enabling man to be aware of reality perceptually. That is, to be aware of objects, of entities. I then discussed how man moves from the perceptual level of consciousness to the uniquely and distinctively human level, the conceptual level, by integrating his percepts into concepts, then integrating his concepts into still wider abstractions, and so forth. Now, the first level of abstractions or concepts, the awareness of such phenomena, let's say, as green or hard or soft, these also take place automatically and universally in any normal brain. That is, these most primitive of concepts, which are the building blocks of all subsequent thinking, these two appear to be integrated automatically by the brain. By that I mean there's no way that a normal person could escape forming such fundamental primitive concepts as green, brown, red, hard, soft, etc. The category, in a word, of attributes which can only be defined ostensibly. In other words, that level of concepts which constitute, as it were, generalizations of direct sensory experiences, which are one step away from percepts. For example, if one looks at three different green objects and forms the concept green, well here we deal with a very easy, very elementary and just about inescapable kind of concept that no normal brain could escape forming. Beyond this level, however, the brain no longer produces concepts automatically. That is, as soon as you rise above this most primitive level of concepts into the genuine sphere of the conceptual faculty, in a word, as soon as the infant is functioning on the level where thinking can set to have begun, we are no longer dealing with a cognitive process that functions automatically. Whether or not the infant, the young man, the adult, will think or not to think, this is an act of choice which he has to make. It is not a function which is forced upon him or determined or necessitated by his nature in the sense in which the integration of his 
sensations into percepts is automatic. Putting it another way, you have only to open your eyes and you cannot escape seeing objects and entities. That is automatic. But in order to think, you have to do something. You have to generate effort. You have to focus your minds. You have to choose to set the machinery in motion. You have to choose to seek to understand that which is not immediately given, that which is not self-evident, that which is not inescapably there in your immediate sensory experience, but rather that which you must reach by a process of conceptual reasoning. To quote from Galt's speech, quote, man is a being of volitional consciousness. Reason does not work automatically. Thinking is not a mechanical process. The connections of logic are not made by instinct. The function of your stomach, lungs, or heart is automatic. The function of your mind is not. In any hour and issue of your life, you are free to think or to evade that effort. But you are not free to escape from your nature from the fact that reason is your means of survival, so that for you, who are a human being, the question to be or not to be is the question to think or not to think. Close quote. In this choice to think or not to think, to focus one's mind or not to focus it, to assume the responsibility of the conceptual level of consciousness or to evade it. And in this choice alone is man psychologically free. That choice, once made, does not continue to direct man's mind unceasingly thereafter, with no further effort required. Just as the state of full mental focus must be initiated volitionally, so it must be maintained volitionally. The choice to think must be reaffirmed in the face of every new issue and problem. The decision to be in focus yesterday will not compel man to be in focus today. The decision to be in focus about one question will not compel man to be in focus about another. The decision to pursue a certain value does not guarantee that man will exert the mental effort needed to achieve it. In any hour of his life, then, man is free to suspend the function of his consciousness, to abandon effort, and to let his mind drift in willless passivity. Or he is free to maintain only a partial focus, grasping that which comes easily to his understanding and declining to struggle for that which does not. Now consider this concept of focusing the mind. It is a state and an operation which each one of you is able very easily to discern introspectively. You all know what it means to be in a state of kind of vague, floating or dreaming, thinking about nothing, and then suddenly to attend to some particular issue, mentally to attend, to focus, to aim your cognitive faculty, as it were, in a certain direction. To say to yourself now, grasp this, make this intelligible, understand this. A simple example is one that you encounter every morning when you're waking up. You wake up and you're a bit drowsy, and you feel as though your consciousness is rather splintered perhaps for a few seconds or minutes or hours <laughs> and at some point presumably you say in effect well now uh, what do I have to do today and you begin to think over what is ahead of you this day what you have to attend to that's an act that you can catch a very easy kind of act of focusing your mind of making yourself fully conscious. There are many other examples which I shall discuss reflecting the same basic choice to think or not to think, to focus or not to focus. 
But in order to appreciate in a biological context this distinct human faculty, before proceeding with a further description of what the volitional faculty is and how it functions, I want to give it the following brief biological context. A basic characteristic of the actions of living organisms, of all living organisms, as distinguished from inanimate matter, is that the actions of living entities are goal-directed. That is, they are self-regulated action moving toward a certain end or goal. Now, obviously, when we deal with unconscious or more precisely non-conscious organisms like plants, we don't speak of the goal as something which the plant holds since it has no mind but that we, looking at the outside, can see that there is a logic governing all of the actions of the plant or the tree or the shrub. One can see a unifying principle at work, and we see that the principle of life is always an integrated series of complex actions taken in that direction which will promote the growth and the survival of the organism. For example, you all have seen the perhaps instance of a plant beginning to grow in the direction of the sunlight and then perhaps a boulder rolls over part of it and it begins to grow around the boulder as though there is a clear principle directing it and it has a certain highly limited ability to vary its motion or its direction to end up in the same place, that is, in a place where it will be in reach of the sun. Or we know of many experiments where scientists interfere with the normal processes of the growth of a tree, and within certain limits we see that the living organism has a certain flexibility to vary certain of its actions in order to end up with the same result. This is well known in biology, of course. You can observe it internally on the vegetative level of your own bodies. That is, a very complex series of actions go on constantly within your own bodies, all organized in an immensely complex way to add up to one result, namely the preservation of the life of the organism. The action is not random. It's highly structured, it's highly organized, and what you observe is that the life principle whatever we may yet have to discover about it, the life principle possesses as its key characteristic this aspect of goal-directed, self-regulating action. All living organisms, however simple or however complex, exhibit it universally. That's entailed in the very nature of what it means to be alive. Now, observe the transition from a plant to an animal. What you observe as an increasing complexity in the type of self-regulation which becomes possible. On the vegetative level or the plant level, you get an internal chemical, internal structural kind of regulatory activity. But you see a more complex expression of the principle of self-regulated action as soon as you enter the realm of conscious animals. Why? Because we observe that consciousness is the regulator of the action of the organism viewed as a total entity. What would be a simple example of this? Well, something very easy. Your cat or dog is walking across the room and uh, there's a carton in the middle of the living room. It sees it and it walks around it. That's the simplest example of where consciousness is regulating and guiding the action which the animal is taking. The animal, of course, depends for its survival upon its sense of smell, and of course its sense of smell is one aspect of its consciousness. So we see animals guided by their sensations, which obviously carries implicitly in it our recognition that an animal is guided by its form of consciousness. Now, an animal's consciousness is passive in that it can react to external stimuli 
And according to how it reacts, being the passive recipient of messages coming in from the outside, it will, within limits, regulate the action which the animal will take accordingly. Animals are distinguished from plants, of course, by virtue of the fact that they can move, so they're not anchored to one spot, and their consciousness guides them in this process of motion. And so here, when you enter the animal realm, you observe a higher, more complex type of life organization and a more complex kind of self-regulated action. Now, when you deal with man, you deal not only with consciousness, but with a particular form or kind of consciousness to which we give the name mind. Man possesses a mind, a reasoning faculty, a capacity to think, to abstract, to conceptualize. And now you observe with a corresponding increased complexity of life organization, a new kind, a new advance, a still more complex form of self-regulatory action, namely a being who is able to regulate the action of his own consciousness. That is what it means to say that man is a being of volitional consciousness. Man can direct his consciousness. What do I mean when I say that? Well, most of you or many of you probably own pets and that will help you to give a concrete sense of what I'm talking about. A pet hears a sound and it jerks its head in that direction. Animals are entirely dependent upon and tied to the cues in their sensory fields. They don't think up problems to solve. They don't say, what will I think about today? And they certainly don't say, I'd rather not think about that today. It's too upsetting. Their consciousnesses are passive reactors to the stimuli which they receive. But one of the important distinctive attributes of man's consciousness is that man has the power to regulate his own consciousness, to regulate its action, to in effect decide in what direction it will go. Putting it differently, to decide whether or not it will think, whether or not it will turn the conceptual level or focus on at all. The basic act of self-regulation possible to a human consciousness is to direct that consciousness aimed in the direction of being aware, of being optimally conscious, of seeking to understand that with which it is dealing, or to suspend conscious focus, to go out of focus to induce an inner fog. That is the basic self-regulatory option which a man has over his own consciousness. Putting it differently, what man controls is the primary goal. What he directly and volitionally controls is the primary goal or end which his consciousness is to pursue. And there's only one basic choice. Either in any given issue, a consciousness seeks to know, to grasp something, or it fails to, or evades the effort, or evades the responsibility of seeking to grasp. And this is another way of saying that man's basic choice is to think or not to think. Now let me concretize further what specifically this choice is and means. There are three fundamental expressions of the choice to think or not to think. Three different cardinal forms in which that issue presents itself to man. The first and the most general I have already indicated, namely, to focus to seek to understand, or to remain in an internal state of fog, or to induce the state of inner fog. 
That is the basic fundamental choice, to focus or not to focus, to seek always to understand, to seek always to widen the range of one's awareness, to seek mentally to grow, to expand the reach of one's consciousness, or not to bother, or to say it's too much work, or it's too painful, or I don't want to know, it'll be inconvenient, or whatever the case may be. Another form in which this choice, this same choice, presents itself to man, occurs any time he experiences a conflict or a clash between his mind and his emotions, or his reason and his feelings. That is, any time he finds that he should do something because it makes sense, but he doesn't want to, or he wants to do something, or desire something, or fear something, even though he knows it is wrong or irrational to do so. Then the question is, does he remain in mental focus? Does he preserve his conscious knowledge and consequently be guided by that? Or does he suspend his conscious knowledge? Does he render his conscious knowledge inoperative in order to drift under the passive sway of his feeling, emotion, or desire? And that again is the choice to think or not to think. If a man wants to do something which is irrational, he has to turn off his mind, turn off his critical faculty, suspend his consciousness and shrink his awareness down to the fact that he wants it, period. And make himself blind to and unconscious of anything else. Which means he has to go out of focus. He has to cease to think. The third basic form in which the choice to think or not to think presents itself to man is the issue between his consciousness and the consciousness of others, the issue between intellectual sovereignty or dependence. That is, will he seek with his own mind to understand that which is true and when he has formed judgments remain loyal to the best of his own honest understanding until and unless he has reason to revise his judgment? Or will he abdicate the responsibility of independent thinking, of independent judgment, and accept passively and uncritically the views and the judgments of other people instead? These then are the three fundamental forms in which man comes up against the question to think, or not to think. This is the nature of the self-regulatory action which man performs with regard to his own consciousness. This is the nature of the control which one has over one's own consciousness. You see, in a certain sense, one's consciousness or mind is always doing something. Even if only little random thoughts or feelings are flicking through it. Something is happening at all times. Life is always action in some sense. Now, the option or the choice then consists of determining or controlling or directing the goal which the action is to take. Let me give you a simple example. Suppose you come into this classroom tonight and you're sitting and your mind is just floating and popping around from subject to subject. And let's say that it's not thinking about anything in particular. And then you look up and you see that the lecture's about to begin. And you tell yourself in effect, well, now it's time to concentrate and pay attention if I have to understand this lecture. Well, now, in that moment, a choice or it has to be made. You have to, in effect, decide. Now I am going to set my intellectual machinery in a certain direction aimed at a certain goal. Namely, the goal being to understand what Mr. Brandon has to say and to judge it. Now, for most of you, that process occurs so naturally that you're not even aware of it when it happens. And yet there was a moment for each one of you when you had to, in effect, aim your consciousness in the direction of the words I'm now saying, and implicitly give yourself the order, grasp what he is saying. 
Now let's take an imaginary example which will illustrate the three variants of the choice to think or not to think. Suppose I begin to speak and you at a certain point find that in order to understand you have to maintain a very clear mental focus and you cannot doze off and just float for a minute because if you do you're going to lose the train of thought. And suppose you then say, well, it's just too hard, it's too much trouble, it's too much bother, thinking is such a chore, and you let yourself go out of focus. Well, that's one variant of the choice to think or not to think. Let's pick another example. Suppose that you are focused and you are thinking along with me, but at a certain point, a certain connection falls into place in your mind. Suppose you're intelligent and you're thinking ahead of me and at a certain point you realize, well, if I get the direction of where Brandon is going or what one of the implications of what he's saying would be, if indeed the choice to think or not to think is volitional, then that means that on those times when I acted irresponsibly, like a drunken driver without knowing what I was doing, it was my fault. A volitional irresponsibility is involved. Oh God, that's an unpleasant thought. I don't like the implications of that line of thinking he's developing. I better get out of here. Well, you don't physically leave, you just put your mind out of focus. That is an example of the principle of reason versus feelings. What is it that matters most? To grasp whether it's true or false, or to be driven by how you happen to feel about what might be the results of it being true or false, respectively. Suppose that you pass both hurdles. You remain in focus, you're not afraid of using your mind, and you're not afraid of the consequences. But at a certain point, you remember that in college, you were told by your sociology teacher that everybody agrees today that man is responsible for nothing and can help nothing. But Brandon up there, it suddenly occurs to you, is saying, that isn't true. It's not true that uh, man is a helpless pawn of faith or circumstances. But everybody says he is. Why the devil should I have to decide? I better get out of here. And so you go out of focus and cease to hear me. That would be three examples, all dramatizations of the choice to think or not to think. Now, it is very important in understanding the principle of volition and how it works to distinguish this basic choice to focus one's mind and to think from the question of what sort of things one will choose to think about. Because obviously the sort of things one will choose to think about in any day or week or month will depend upon a wide variety of factors, one's interests, one's values, one's context, one's problems, etc. and so forth. They are not chosen as primary acts of free choice, meaning that if on any given day you wake up and you decide to be in full focus, that is what volition directly pertains to, the decision to be in full focus. But, assuming you are in full focus, you don't decide in that primary same way, uh, in a vacuum so to speak, what you will think about, because obviously in any given day you have a context, you have continuous problems, you have a life, you have interests, you have values, etc. and so forth and they will obviously be relevant to what you will choose to think about. Let's give an example. I wake up early this morning and I focus and I habitually ask myself, well, what's the program or the agenda for today? What am I going to be concerned with today? And within a second, what comes into my mind is that I am writing an article for the Objectivist Newsletter and that I must finish it by a certain date 
And I remember that there are certain tricky problems, and when I stopped working yesterday, I was stuck on something. And there are problems I have to solve today and get on with the job. And as I'm getting up and shaving and brushing my teeth, my mind is going to the article when I'll be at my desk in a few minutes and remembering where I left off yesterday and perhaps I'm imagining different ways I could try to express such and such a thought. Well, once I am in focus, it's very natural that I find my mind going particularly, specifically to the subject of that article since that right now is my immediate concern. I don't say to myself in a vacuum, well, today now then, what shall I think about my article or deep sea diving or uh, polo perhaps? or crab fishing, well, that would be absurd, wouldn't it? All of those other choices are not primary choices, they're not, they're not direct, free choices. They obviously depend upon a great many antecedent factors to repeat, your values, your problems, your context, etc. and so forth. Now, there is a question which I am often asked about this choice to think or not to think and which I would like to discuss with you. Students will often ask me some variant of this question. Doesn't a man have to be thinking already in order to choose to think? If you're not thinking already, how do you choose to think? And there's a certain confusion in that question which I want to clarify, and in clarifying it, I think will throw more light on this whole concept of volition. As I have said, the primary choice to think, that is, to focus one's mind, to set it to the purpose of active cognitive integration, must be distinguished from any other category of choice. It must be distinguished from the decision to think about a particular subject, which depends on one's values, interests, knowledge, and context. And again, it must be distinguished from the decision to perform a particular physical action, which again depends on one's values, interests, knowledge, and context. These decisions obviously involve complex causal antecedents of a kind which the choice to focus does not. A man's choice to focus is a primary. It's a psychological primary, a first cause within man's consciousness. The principle that man is a being of volitional consciousness has reference specifically, of course, as I have indicated, to the human form of consciousness, that is, to the conceptual level of awareness. The perceptual level which man shares with animals is automatic. To be aware of the physical concretes of his immediate sensory field, man merely has to be awake, assuming of course a normal brain state. But to engage in an active process of cognitive integration, to abstract, conceptualize, relate, infer, to reason, man must focus his mind. He must set it to the task of active integrating. This level of awareness must be achieved and maintained volitionally. Now here is a very important thought. The act of focusing pertains to the operation of the faculty of consciousness, to its method of functioning, not to its content. I want to repeat that statement. The act of focusing pertains to the operation of the faculty of consciousness, to its method of functioning, not to its content. To understand the process of focusing, I must discuss briefly with you the concept of levels of awareness. A consciousness can function on different levels of awareness. This concept refers to the degree of active cognitive integration in which a mind is engaged. How actively is the mind seeking to grasp everything within its range, to assimilate it, to identify it? What sort of factors will reflect varying levels of consciousness or degrees of clarity or awareness? First of all, one, 
the clarity or the vagueness of the mind's contents. The higher the level of awareness, the clearer the mental contents. The lower the level of, aware of awareness, the vaguer, the more dim, unclear the mental contents. Two, the degree to which the mind's activity involves abstractions or principles versus the degree to which it's concrete bound and is tied only to immediately present concretes. It's a higher level of awareness to think in terms of abstractions and principles than to see only that which is staring you directly in front of your nose. And three, the level of awareness is reflected in the degree to which the relevant wider context is present or absent in the process of thinking. That is, when you are thinking about a given problem, do you hold the full context in which this problem exists? Do you seek to recall and to apply everything relevant that could possibly help you to know how to deal with this? Or do you look at the problem as though you were born one minute before and knew nothing? And you forget all of your past knowledge and all of your past experience and try to deal with the problem as though your brain literally had begun to work only one minute ago. That again will determine the level of awareness, the level of mental advancement on which one functions. Thus you see there are degrees of awareness, degrees of consciousness. The alternative is not simply absolute unconsciousness or optimal consciousness. The choice to focus or to think does not consist of moving from a state of literal unconsciousness to a state of consciousness. This clearly would be impossible. When one is asleep, one cannot suddenly choose to start thinking. To focus is to move from a lower level of consciousness to a higher level. To move from mental passivity to purposeful mental activity. To initiate a process of directed cognitive integration. In a state of passive or relatively passive awareness, a man can apprehend the need to be in full mental focus. His choice is then to evade that knowledge or to exert the effort of raising the level of his awareness. Just as focusing involves expanding the range of one's awareness, so evasion consists of the reverse process, of shrinking the range of one's awareness. Evasion, meaning the blind refusal to think, the rejection of that which you know or could know, evasion takes the form of refusing to raise the level of one's awareness when one knows, clearly or dimly, that one should, or of lowering the level of one's awareness when one knows that one shouldn't. I want to repeat that very important statement. Evasion takes the form of refusing to raise the level of one's awareness when one knows clearly or dimly that one should, or of lowering the level of one's awareness when one knows that one shouldn't. When a man acts and functions with his mind unfocused, we may, in certain contexts, refer to him as unconscious. This is a means of indicating that such a man is existing on a level of awareness inadequate to the requirements of human survival. That is, he is attempting to exist in a state inadequate to the cognition of reality which human survival requires. He is attempting, in effect, to exist on the passive perceptual level that is appropriate to a lower animal. But this is a specialized use of the term unconscious. For example, if you see a person acting without thinking, you might say to him, for heaven's sake, be conscious. Well, you don't mean literally that he's unconscious. What you mean is he's not conscious enough. He's existing on a very vague, diffuse, low level of consciousness, utterly inadequate to the task in which he is engaged. 
speaking literally, of course, when a man is awake and his brain and nervous system are structurally normal, he is conscious, if only passively. This basic level of consciousness is given to him by nature, as it were. Volition pertains to the responsibility of raising this basic level to the active conceptual level which is appropriate to man. This then in very general outline is what the principle that man is a being of volitional consciousness means. Man is a being who must direct his consciousness to an appropriate level, that is, appropriate to the tasks required of reality. That does not happen automatically. Man must control that mental process. Now, when we say that man normally has the power to think or not to think, to exercise this basic choice, this basic type of self-regulatory action, I must emphasize that one always speaks in the context of a normal brain. One always speaks in the context of a normal being. Now, one very small point of clarification that might, otherwise, if I omitted this, be a question for some of you. You might ask two points, but uh, isn't it sometimes harder to think than other times, as for example, when you're tired? Yes, indeed it is. And here we deal with the partly physical factor. Obviously, if you've been up all night, it's harder to concentrate at seven o'clock in the morning if you haven't been to sleep yet than if you had been to sleep for 10 preceding hours. But this is obviously a physical factor and one assumes normal conditions. What you do have the power to know if you have been up for 24 hours is that you are awfully tired, that you are finding it excruciatingly difficult to think clearly, and therefore that this is not the time to make any crucial decisions. That is the form in which you still remain adequately conscious. You remain conscious enough to know what your own state is and that you had best go to bed. Or again, suppose it happens that a person is immensely upset over something very painful or distressing or agitating which has happened. Well, here again, his responsibility consists of knowing that he is in that state. I am not saying that he necessarily has to or will always be able to think as clearly. Some people can to a remarkable extent, however, but I am not saying that he must always or be expected to think as clearly when he is upset as when he is not upset. But he has to be aware of the fact that he is upset. And if he feels himself that agitated and distraught, then in fact he has to say to himself and or to anybody with whom he is dealing, give me a chance to quiet down a little bit and pull myself together and then I will begin to think about this subject or answer you or do whatever is appropriate. He still has to remain aware and can remain aware volitionally of what his own internal state is. And in that sense, that is a form of choosing to think, of recognizing in this case what your own state is and again, of not speaking when one should remain silent and possibly say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. Now then, ladies and gentlemen, to continue our discussion of volition. You will appreciate, of course, that the principle that man is a being of volitional consciousness is a form of free will theory. This, in effect, is a very brief summary of what objectivism means by the concept of free will. And the, those of you who are familiar with the many different historical interpretations which have been given to the concept of free will will appreciate how radically this differs from traditional understandings of what free will means. In the January 1964 issue of the Objectivist Newsletter, I did an article specifically distinguishing the Objectivist theory of free will from traditional historical theories. 
Man's basic choice to repeat lies in his basic self-regulatory power over the function of his consciousness. The choice to focus, to think, or not to think. Man does not have the power as a primary first cause to choose his emotions or desires or to change them at will. His emotions and desires are, of course, the product of his values, and these can be altered only indirectly by rethinking his values and premises and, as a consequence, altering his desires or emotions. Now, this type of psychological freedom does not mean that man is omniscient, it does not mean that man is infallible, it does not mean that man can never make mistakes, it does not mean that man is impervious to any and all external circumstances, which is obviously absurd. There are many factors which can affect our lives, such as wars, economic collapses, which can crucially affect our lives, over which we as individuals may have no power whatsoever. Therefore, I talk specifically about a sphere of psychological freedom, which of course is crucial because given the external circumstances and given the knowledge available to man, it is specifically the degree of his thinking which is going to determine his character and the course which his life will take. Now this view of man's nature stands in sharp opposition to the view that dominates our culture in general and the social sciences in particular, namely the doctrine of psychological determinism. Psychological determinism denies the existence of any element of freedom or volition in man's consciousness. It holds that every action, desire, and thought of man is determined by forces beyond his control. It holds that, in relation to his actions, decisions, values, and conclusions, man is ultimately and essentially passive. That man is merely a reactor to internal and external pressures. That those pressures determine the course of man's actions and the content of his convictions, just as physical forces determine the course of every particle of dust in the universe. It holds that in any given situation or moment, only one choice, in quotes, is psychologically possible to man. The inevitable result of all the antecedent determining forces impinging upon him, just as only one action is possible to the speck of dust. Determinism holds that man has no actual power of choice, no actual freedom or self-responsibility. Man, according to this view, has no more actual volition than a stone. He is merely confronted with more complex alternatives and is manipulated by more complex forces. The determinist concept of mind entails a crucial contradiction, specifically an epistemological contradiction. It is, or rather can be shown to be, upon analysis, a self-refuting or self-invalidating theory. I want now to direct your attention to the nature of this central and insuperable contradiction in the determinist position. A contradiction implicit in any variety of determinism, whether the alleged determining forces be physical, psychological, environmental, or divine. It wouldn't matter whether you hold that man is controlled and determined by the gods, or his genes, or his toilet training, or a socioeconomic environment or background or position. This contradiction is common to all of them. Consider the following. The determinist concept of mind maintains that whether a man thinks or not, whether he takes cognizance of the facts of reality or not, whether he holds facts above his feelings or his feelings above facts, all are determined by forces outside his control. In any given moment or situation, his method of mental functioning is the inevitable product of an endless chain of antecedent forces. He has no choice in the matter. That which a man does declare the advocates of determinism he had to do. That which he believes he had to believe. 
If he focuses his mind, he had to. If he evades the effort of focusing, he had to. If he is guided solely by reason, he had to be. If he is ruled instead by feeling or whim, he had to be. He couldn't help it. No one can help anything. Such is the determinist thesis. But if this were true, if this were true, no knowledge would be possible to man, as I shall show. No theory could claim greater plausibility than any other, including the theory of psychological determinism. Why? It is most essential to understand this issue. First of all, remember that man is neither omniscient nor infallible. This means, A, that he must work to achieve his knowledge, and B, that the mere presence of an idea inside his mind does not prove that the idea is true. Many ideas may enter a man's mind which are false. But if a man believes what he has to believe, if he is not free to test his beliefs against reality and to validate or reject them, if the actions and content of his mind are determined by factors that may or may not have anything to do with reason, logic, and reality, then he can never know if his conclusions are true or false. Knowledge is the correct identification of the facts of reality. And in order for man to know that the contents of his mind do constitute knowledge, in order for him to know that he has identified the facts of reality correctly, he requires a means of testing his conclusions. The means is the process of reasoning, of testing his conclusions against reality and checking for contradictions. It is thus that he validates his conclusions. But this validation is possible only if his capacity to judge is free. That is, non-conditional, given a normal brain state. But if his capacity to judge is not free, there is no way for a man to discriminate between his beliefs and those of a raving lunatic. But then how do the advocates of determinism acquire their knowledge? What is its validation? Determinists are conspicuously silent on this point. If the advocates of determinism insist that their choice to think and their acceptance of reason is conditional, dependent on factors outside their control, which means that they are not free to test their beliefs against the facts of reality, then they cannot claim to know that their theory is true. They can only report that they feel helpless to believe otherwise. Nor can they claim that their theory is highly probable. They can only acknowledge the inner compulsion that forbids them to doubt that it is highly probable. Some advocates of determinism, evidently sensing this epistemological dilemma, have sought to escape it by asserting that, although they are determined to believe what they believe, the factor determining them is logic. But by what means do they know this? Their beliefs are no more subject to their control than a lunatic's. They and the lunatic are equally the pawn of deterministic forces. Both are incapable of judging their judgments. One of the defining characteristics of psychosis is loss of volitional control over rational judgment. But according to determinism, that is man's normal metaphysical state. There is no escape from determinism's epistemological dilemma. A mind that is not free to test and validate its conclusions, a mind whose judgment is not free, can have no way to tell the logical from the illogical, no way to ascertain that which compels and motivates it, no right to claim knowledge of any kind. 
Such a mind is disqualified for such appraisals by its very nature. The very concept of logic is possible only to a volitional consciousness. An automatic consciousness could have no need of it and could not conceive of it. The concepts of logic, thought, and knowledge are not applicable to machines. A machine does not reason. It performs the actions its builder sets it to perform and those actions alone. If it is set to register that 2 plus 2 equals 4, it does so. If it is set to register that 2 plus 2 equals 5, it does so. It has no power to correct the orders and information given it. If self-correctors are built into it, it performs the prescribed acts of self-correction and no others. If the self-correctors are set incorrectly, it cannot correct itself. It cannot make any independent, self-generated contribution to its own performance. If man, who is clearly not set invariably to be right, were merely a super complex machine engineered by his heredity and operated by his environment, pushed, pulled, shaped and molded by his genes, his toilet training, his parental upbringing and his cultural history, then no premise reached by him could claim objectivity or truth, including the premise that man is a machine. If, as staunch determinist such as Baron Holbach states in his work System of Nature, man's, quote, ideas come to him involuntarily, close quote, if man is, quote, wise or foolish, reasonable or irrational, without his will being for anything in these various states, close quote, then by what right does he or any other determinist claim his involuntary ideas as knowledge? A determinist can only announce, destiny forces me to believe, etc. He cannot claim to know anything. Those who expound determinism must either assert that they arrived at their theory by mystical revelation and thus exclude themselves from the realm of reason, or they must assert that they are an exception to the theory they propound and thus exclude their theory from the realm of truth. That knowledge is possible to man cannot be contested without self-contradiction. It is a truth that must be accepted even in the act of seeking to dispute it. Any theory that necessitates the conclusion that man can know nothing is self-invalidating and self-refuting by that very fact. Yet such is the conclusion to which the theory of determinism inescapably leads. Thus, a rationally espoused determinism is a contradiction in terms. In appraising any theory of the nature of man's mind and its operations, it is necessary to consider this. Since the theory is itself a product of man's mind, its claim to truth must be compatible with its own existence and content. Otherwise, the theory is contradictory and nonsensical. For example, if a man were to declare as an alleged fact of reality, man is incapable of knowing any facts, the logical absurdity of his statement would be obvious. The epistemological contradiction of determinism is, in a subtler and more complex way, of the identical order. Determinism is a theory whose claim to truth is incompatible with its own contents. It exhibits what may be termed the fallacy of self-exclusion. It does not matter whether man's mind is alleged to be passively under the sway of the laws of association, or of conditioned reflexes, or of environmental pressures, or of original sin. Any theory of mind that denies man's volitional control over his faculty of judgment collapses under the weight of the same inescapable and insuperable contradiction. Only because man is a being of volitional consciousness, only because he is free to initiate and sustain a reasoning process is knowledge, in contradistinction to irresistible, unchosen beliefs, possible to him. 
Now there is one common confusion which, in the minds of many people, allows them to grant some validity to the thesis of psychological determinism. And that is the confused and entirely mistaken notion that the law of causality requires commitment to psychological determinism. It does not. I recall to your memory our discussion of causality in Lecture 3. The actions of an entity are determined by the nature of the entity that acts. It is the nature of the entity that determines the actions possible to it, and in any given context or situation, it is the nature of the entity which determines what the entity will do. Man's unique biological character, or one of the unique characteristics biologically of man, is precisely this self-regulatory power over his own consciousness which was discussed earlier. This capacity to generate a certain kind of mental action. When we say that man is a being of volitional consciousness, we are recognizing this particular self-regulatory capacity which man possesses and that that is one of the crucial characteristics of the kind of entity man is. Man's nature is such that it confronts him with a choice which he cannot escape, which only he can make. It is not made for him by his environment or his destiny or by any external force, past or present. That is the unique responsibility which nature poses to this one species. A responsibility regarding directing the action of his consciousness. And what I want to draw to your attention, as I discussed in the earlier section of tonight's lecture, what I want you to see in this self-regulatory power of man over his consciousness is an extension of a biological principle which, on lower levels, we can see running through all forms of life, namely, in what respect life always entails self-regulated action. Here, we get a regulation concerning the action of consciousness itself, a regulation which is volitional in nature. Now, many people still think when they think of causality in terms of a highly limited model of causality, and that is the Newtonian mechanistic model. And that is a central cause of confusion in attempting to think about human psychology. Meaning by that the following. They think of the universe as a vast billiard table, as it were, as though everything is only moved by being knocked by something else. Now this concept is utterly inadequate to account for living phenomena in general, let alone for man. Implicit in this notion of causality is a radically different notion of causality than the Greeks advocated or that we discussed in lecture three. The Greeks, such as Aristotle in particular, when they conceived causality, correctly understood it in terms of a relationship between entities and actions. A disastrous confusion in the conceiving of causality emerged in the post-Renaissance period when men began to conceive of causal relations not in terms of relationships between entities and actions, but in terms of relationships between actions and other actions. They saw every action as being only a reaction to something else. They assumed implicitly to begin with that the normal or natural state of entities left to their own devices as it were is rest, is stillness. That motion always reflects 
the impingement of some outside force upon an object or entity which otherwise would be still. And hence, later on, this became known as the billiard ball view of the universe. And when we attempt to use this kind of a model to uh, life in general and to human beings in particular, of course, it is grossly inadequate to explain the facts that we see. You can't even explain the action of a plant with a billiard ball model, let alone the actions of a living consciousness. Aristotle correctly observed that one of the distinguishing characteristics of living organisms as separate from non-living organisms is, as he said, that in living organisms, the source or origin of their motion lies within themselves. If a plant grows, it's not because something outside pushed it. Its principle of motion lies within itself. And here again, we recognize that even before we come to the question of free will or volition or man, that one has to recognize that the mechanistic billiard ball approach to causal explanation is very limited. It has relevance to many aspects of life, but it's by no means synonymous with what is meant by the concept of causality in the abstract or in general. When you say, or as you will almost certainly say to me in the question period tonight, yes, Mr. Brandon, this is all very well, but just the same, what makes one person focus his mind and another person not focus? What you are implicitly thinking of is what sort of force pushed man's mind in the direction of thinking. Or of evading. In other words, you will be thinking that every action is only a reaction and you want to know a reaction to what? To what force, you are, will be asking me, is thinking a reaction? And that's where you have to check your premises. That is the premise that you have to check. I'm glad to see so many heads nodding because this is a very important point of confusion about the whole issue of free will. The choice to focus or not to focus is a causal primary. It does not have causal antecedents in the same way that other choices, such as the choice to go to movie A rather than movie B, obviously have them. This I discussed earlier. It is a primary category characteristic of the human species, a primary power or capacity. And if you are tempted to say, yes, but what made one man think and another man evade? If you find it psychologically or epistemologically or metaphysically unacceptable to hold the view that this was a choice made by him, which is causally irreducible in the sense in which no antecedent force drove him to it, then you can only do so from the implicit premise held consciously and usually not consciously that, to repeat, every mental action must be a reaction to something else. Why? The piece of dogma which you have to challenge in that notion is that nothing can originate action or originate motion. Now, although throughout history there have been many different forms of determinism, a form which is particularly prevalent today is, of course, the variety called environmentalism. Let's very, very briefly, since we're running short on time, say a few words about this issue. This is the claim, environmentalism, that man is primarily the passive product of his background and environment. It is environment, modern psychologists assert, that determines man's character, values, action, and thinking. Man is only a walking recorder into which his parents, teachers, and neighbors dictate what they please. Such parents, teachers, and neighbors themselves being only walking recorders, carrying the dictations of other earlier recorders, and so forth. 
as to where new ideas, concepts, and values come from, this question such theorists leave unanswered. Or sometimes they go so far as to say there are no new ideas. Now the general fallacy in the concept of determinism has already been stated, but let us consider a little more specifically this variety. His environment, the facts of the world around him, offer man material about which to think, but they do not determine the content of his thinking. Your perceptual experiences do not lead you to your conceptual conclusions by some passive deterministic process as though the particular combination of percepts that you had can lead you only in one direction. This demonstrably is false. Perceptions don't have the power to transform themselves into convictions without an intervening mental process which you have to initiate and direct, namely the process of thinking. Man's life and character are determined then not by the things he perceives, but by the thinking he does or fails to do about the things that he perceives. If, for instance, a child is brought up by irrational parents who give him a bewildering, frightening, and contradictory impression of reality, he may decide that all human beings by their nature are incomprehensible and dangerous to him. And if he arrests his thinking at this point, and if in later years he never attempts to think this issue through again, never attempts to question his chronic feeling of anxiety and helplessness, he can spend the rest of his life in a state of embittered paralysis. But such does not have to be his fate. If he continues to struggle with his problem, or as he grows older, if he decides to think about it, to re-examine it, to consider the newer, wider evidence available to him, if, to put the issue more simply, he decides to preserve an acute mental focus, he can discover that he has made an unwarranted generalization, and he can then revise it into a fully reasoned and conscious conviction. Another child in the same circumstances may draw different conclusions. He may decide that all human beings are unreliable and evil, and that he will beat them at their own game. He will act as ruthlessly and dishonestly as possible to hurt them before they hurt him. Again, he can revise this conclusion later in the light of wider evidence if he chooses to think about it, if he chooses to remain in focus. If he doesn't, he will become a scoundrel or a criminal, not because his parents were irrational, but because he defaulted on the responsibility of remaining in focus of forming his convictions in full consciousness and of checking his conclusions against the facts of reality. A third child in the same circumstances may decide that his parents are wrong, that they are unjust and unfair, or at least that they, that they do not act understandably, and that he must not act as they do. He may suffer at home, but keep looking for evidence of better human behavior among relatives or neighbors or in books and movies. Such a child will draw an enormous advantage out of his misfortune, which he will not realize till many, many years later. He will have laid the foundation of an inviolate self-esteem. If an adolescent grows up in a neighborhood where crime flourishes and cynically is accepted as the normal, he can, abdicating the independence of his judgment, allow his character to be shaped in the image of the prevailing values and become a criminal himself. Or, choosing to think, choosing to remain aware, choosing to go on looking at the facts of reality and to make sense out of what he sees, he will come to the realization of the irrationality and humiliating self-degradation of the people who accept a criminal's mode of existence. Of any value offered to him as the right, and any assertion offered to him as the true, a human being is free to ask why. And that why is the threshold that the beliefs of others cannot cross without his consent. But what of the individual who does appear to be the product of his background, the pawn of his conditioning? 
Well, let's take the social worker's favorite example. Let's consider the case of the boy who, brought up in the bad neighborhood, becomes a criminal. What are the internal mental processes that lead this poor chap into a life of crime? Very briefly, the pattern goes like this. In the actions of a boy who allows himself in this manner to be shaped by his environment, an obvious mode of activating him is the desire to swim with the current. What in psychological terms does this expression mean? What does it mean to swim with the current? The boy is living in a neighborhood where crime and hoodlumism is rampant and he swims with the current. Well, how does this happen? To swim with the current proceeds from the desire to escape the effort and responsibility of initiating one's own course of action. In order to choose one's own actions, one has, of course, to choose one's own goals. And to do that, one has to choose one's own values. And to do that, one has to think. One has to be in focus. One has to go on looking and judging. Thinking is the first and the basic responsibility that such a boy rejects. And because he doesn't choose to think and has therefore no long-range goals or standards, he is left at the mercy of the impulses of the immediate moment. He is forced to pursue short-range, immediately available goals and to seek immediately available pleasures. And this leads him, in the logic of his course, to accept whatever values are offered to him by whatever social group happens to surround him. To swim with the current, one has to accept the ocean or the swamp or the rapids or the cesspool or the abyss toward which that particular current is rushing. Having no values or standards of his own, the boy will want to swim. He will want to follow any course of action ready-made for him by others. He will want to belong. If the boys in the neighborhood form a gang at the corner pool room, he will join. If they start robbing people, he will start robbing people. If they begin to murder, he will murder. What moves him? His feelings. His feelings are all he has left once he has abandoned his mind. He does not join the gang by a conscious reason decision. He doesn't think it out and decide it's a logical thing to do, no. He joins because he feels like joining. He does not follow the gang because he thinks they are right. No, he follows because he feels like following. If his mother, for example, objects and tries to argue with him to persuade him to quit the hoodlums, he does not weigh her arguments and conclude that she is wrong. He just doesn't feel like thinking about it one way or the other. If at some point he begins to fear that the gang may be going too far, if he is anxious at the prospect of becoming a murderer, he realizes that the alternative is to break with his friends and be left on his own. He does not weigh the advantages or disadvantages of being left on his own. No, he chooses blindly to stick with the gang because at the prospect of being alone, at the prospect of independence, he feels terror. He may see across the river or just a few blocks away, people who lead a totally different kind of life and boys of his own age who somehow did not become criminals. But this does not raise in his mind the question of whether a better kind of life may be possible to him it does not prompt him to inquire or investigate because he feels terror at the unknown. He feels safe in his surroundings. They are the familiar and the known. If he asks himself what it is that terrifies him about breaking with his background, well, he would answer in effect, ah, uh, I don't know nobody out there and nobody knows me. In logic, this isn't an answer or an explanation. 
because there is nothing objectively terrifying in that statement. But it satisfies him because he feels an overwhelming, unanalyzed dread of loneliness. And feelings are his only absolute, the absolute never to be questioned. And if at the age of 20 he is dragged to jail to await execution for some monstrously bloody and senselessly wanton crime, he will scream that he could not help it and that he never had the chance. Will he scream it because it is true? No. He will scream it because he feels it. In the sense opposite to that which he intends, there is one element of truth in his scream. Given his basic policy of anti-thought, he could not help it, and he never did have a chance. Neither has any other human being who moves through life on that policy. But it is not true that he or any other human being could not help running from the necessity to think and could not help blindly riding on his feelings. On every day of this boy's life and at every crucial turning point, the possibility of thinking about his actions was open to him. The evidence on which to base a change in his policy was available to him, and he evaded it. He didn't care to think. If at every turning point he had thought carefully and conscientiously, and had simply reached the wrong conclusions, he would be more justified in crying that he could not help it. But ladies and gentlemen, it is not helplessly bewildered conscientious thinkers who fill reform schools and murder one another on street corners through an unfortunate error in logic. The policy upon which this boy proceeded is the policy on which many people proceed. He perhaps carried it to more of an extreme or existed in an environment where that policy would prove more disastrous. Not that he never thinks. Oh no, everybody thinks some of the time. His policy is, I'll think when I feel like thinking. It's an unfair charge to say that some people never think at all. Nobody is ever out of focus all the time. When we say a person is out of focus, characteristically, we're talking about a person who whose feelings largely determine whether he's in focus or out of focus, certainly not reality. But thinking is not a luxury in which man indulges if and when his feelings permit it. The relationship is the opposite. Feelings take over and assert control if and when thinking is suspended. And this is the manner in which men can be determined, in quotes, by their environment. If a man chooses not to think, if he chooses to escape from the effort of focus, and the responsibility of judgment, he is left at the mercy of his feelings, of his immediate subconscious reactions, and these will be at the mercy of the outside forces impinging upon him, at the mercy of whoever and whatever is around him. In this state, he is a helpless zombie passively being shaped by his environment, but he did not have to get into that state and he does not have to remain in it. He still has the power to focus, to think, to question, and if he chooses not to, then it is he who has turned himself into the determinist view of man, that is, into an empty mold waiting to be filled, into a willless robot waiting to be taken over by any environment and any conditioners. Most human beings, to conclude, most human beings, as I have said, are not unequivocally opposed to the policy of thinking. It would be more correct to say that thinking for most men is sort of an emergency measure. It's what you try when everything else has failed, which is usually much too late. It's a sort of a last resort. The first resort is to act on your immediate impulses or feelings or habits or advice that somebody gives you. If that proves inadequate to the whole situation or if it mangles you, at some point, some men decide implicitly, well, just for the hell of it, I'll try to think my way out of this situation. 
at which much of the time they find they can't. And small wonder. Can't in the time necessary, that is. They could, but what could have been a task of minutes or weeks becomes a task of agonizing years if it's undertaken at all. because they don't have the knowledge which they should have to help them in this moment, the knowledge that would have come from the thinking they didn't do. The unfortunate state of affairs is that psychologists, when they see this sort of spectacle, should be the first to point out the deadly danger of the policy of men who try to exist with as little thinking as they can get away with. But much of psychology, instead of criticizing this policy, instead of pointing out that it's a sign on the road to disease and disaster, no, instead they say, such is human nature. Man is only peripherally and marginally a rational being. They say that it's far more relevant to say that he's a feeling being, and they point to all of the wrecks in their offices as evidence. But it's not in the therapist's office that you find out what human nature is. And you don't point to neurotics and psychotics as examples of normal human functioning or behavior. This leads us very directly into the lectures of the next several weeks. Next week, Mrs. Brandon will be the guest lecturer, and as you know, she will deal specifically with the psychology of thinking, with the principles of efficient thinking. And in the following two weeks, I will be concerned to show you what the issue of thinking or non-thinking has to do with the issue of mental health. And from there, into the subject of ethics and morality. So, to be continued next week. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall begin by reading a letter. It was written by a young man to his mother. As you listen to it, I'd like you to observe and to evaluate the thinking processes that this letter reflects. Quote, Dear Mother, Today I am feeling better than yesterday. I really don't feel much like writing, but I love to write to you. After all, I can tackle it twice. Yesterday, Sunday, I would have been so happy if you and Louise and I could have gone to the park. One has such a lovely view from Stefan's castle. Actually, it's very lovely in Bergolsley. Louise wrote Bergolsley on her last two letters. I mean to say on the envelopes. No, the couverts which I received. However, I have written Bergolsley in the spot where I put the date. There are also people in Bergolsley who call it Holzleberg. Others talk of a factory. I'm writing on paper. The pen which I'm using is from a factory called Perry and Company. This factory is in England. I assume this. Behind the name of Perry Company, the city of London is inscribed, but not the city. The city of London is in England. I know this from my school days. Then I always liked geography. My last teacher in that subject was Professor August A. He was a man with black eyes. I also like black eyes. There are also blue and gray eyes and other sorts too. I've heard it said that snakes have green eyes. All people have eyes. There are some too who are blind. These blind people are led about by a boy. It must be very terrible not to be able to see. There are people who can't see and in addition can't hear. I know some who hear too much. One can hear too much. There are many sick people in Bergolsley. One of them I like a great deal. He taught me that in Bergolsley there are many kinds. Then there are some who are not here at all. They are all peculiar people." Unquote. Now you will all immediately grasp that this letter is not the product of a rational thinking process. But identify why and how you know this. What did you observe about the letter that led you to this conclusion? What you observed was this. 
that the various thoughts that compose the letter are not linked or logically connected by any central theme. The writer wanders mentally. His ideas ramble without any intelligible progression. Each sentence is connected to the next by some chance association, not by a logical connection. The total is a grab bag of separate, unrelated thoughts. And although each separate sentence is formally grammatical, and does convey a meaning, the sentences lead nowhere, and the total has no meaning. What the letter crucially lacks is the unifying, integrating factor of purpose. The writer of this letter is a catatonic schizophrenic. I was quoting from Eugene Bleuler's famous monograph on schizophrenia, Dementia Praepox. The letter was presented as an example of schizophrenic thinking. A major symptom of schizophrenia is the deterioration of the thinking process. A deterioration that's made manifest in the schizophrenic's inability to hold to a single purpose and to unify and integrate his thoughts around that purpose in a logical progression. Thinking in the literal and rational meaning of the word is a purposeful mental activity, having knowledge of reality as its goal. Whether it be a child's first attempt to grasp the difference between a dog and a cat, or an abstract philosopher's attempt to define the fundamental nature of reality, it's the presence of a purpose that crucially distinguishes a rational process of thought from the lunatic ramblings of a schizophrenic. Wherever there is thought, there is purpose. A purpose setting and directing every step of the thinking activity. But just as a focus must be volitionally set and maintained, so a purpose must be volitionally set and maintained. In order to think, a mind must choose and then hold to its mental goal that is, the problem to be solved or the concept to be grasped. This will not happen automatically. It requires an act of mental decision. It requires self-consciousness, an awareness of what one's mind is doing, and direction and control of what one's mind is doing. Now, certainly most people's minds don't function quite like the schizophrenic who wrote the letter I quoted. But neither are most people purposeful and self-conscious about the activities of their minds. And as a result, the mental processes of people who would consider themselves rational and intelligent are too often frighteningly similar to those of the schizophrenic writer. The difference, as I'll demonstrate, is one of degree. Everyone recognizes that a child isn't born knowing how to talk, to walk, to read, to write, that he must learn how to do these things. But everyone assumes that somehow a child and an adult does automatically know how to think. Everyone assumes that thinking is in effect an instinct, something that one just knows how to do, and that no process of study or learning is required. Well, if you believe this, check your premises. If you were to stop a dozen people at random, give them a problem to think about, and later ask them to report on what their minds had proceeded to do in order to solve the problem, you would discover that they had engaged in quite different kinds of mental activity, but all of them called their mental activity thinking you would discover that when people use the word thinking, they very often use it to name quite different kinds of mental activities, some of which are effective in gaining knowledge, some of which are grossly ineffective. People customarily take their own mental processes as self-evidently valid, as not to be questioned. They don't seek to correct or improve faulty methods of thinking because it doesn't even occur to them to consider their methods of thinking. As a result, inefficient methods, once initiated, harden into habits, 
which are then practiced automatically. And one's thinking processes continue to deteriorate, and one is less and less able to solve problems, less and less able to deal with reality, and to direct one's life intelligently. And those who have never properly learned to think are, of course, always the quickest to conclude that the mind is impotent, that thinking is not the means to acquire knowledge. They do not question the nature of their own mental processes. They question instead the efficacy of reason. Inefficient methods of thinking are the greatest of all destroyers of intelligence. Whatever a man's potential intellectual capacity, his actual ability to deal with problems can be no better than his method of thinking, no better than his method of using that capacity. The greatest brain on earth could not solve the simplest of problems if he approached it by the method of the schizophrenic letter writer. You have all heard the saying, whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. If you look at the manner in which most men run their lives, you will conclude that it's more accurate to say, whom the gods would destroy, they first make stupid. But this stupidity is not the result of a deficient brain. It's a self-made stupidity, a stupidity that is the inexorable result of inefficient thinking processes. A high intellectual capacity is only a potential, which its possessor must learn how to use. Let me give you an illustration. A young man is about to enter college, and he's attempting to decide whether to enroll in College A or College B. He goes to his room for the purpose of thinking this problem over. Now here we'll tune in on his inner mental processes. There's a very good professor with a brilliant reputation at College A, but College B is more convenient to travel to from home. I wonder if Dad will buy me a car. I like the new Thunderbird. The gray and white one I saw was great. Ah, Dad's a tightwad. He said he'd get me a car, but he'll probably change his mind. Carol is going to college, eh, I think. I don't see much of her these days. I wonder who she's been going out with. Oh, yes, the fees at both colleges are the same, so there's really no issue there. I think I'll give Carol a call tonight. Now, I wonder which college has a better selection of courses. That would be important to know. I'd rather like the Powder Blue Thunderbird, too. They say college is much more difficult than high school. But I'll do all right. I've always been a good student. But how the devil am I going to decide which college to attend? At this point, the boy's father enters the room and asks him what he's been doing. The boy answers that he's been thinking very hard about which college to attend, but somehow he can't seem to decide. Now the question is, has this boy been thinking? The connections between his thoughts were certainly more understandable than those of the schizophrenic. But observe the very significant similarities. Here again, there was no logical relationship between one thought and the next. There was no consistently followed purpose dominating and integrating the sequence of thoughts. The mental process was essentially passive. The boy didn't direct the actions of his mind. Rather, he was simply the observer of associations made by his subconscious. If one may compare the mind to a car, then this boy didn't drive the car, he just went along for the ride. Ask yourselves how often you have engaged in a similar mental process and called it thinking. To the extent that you do so, the difference between that boy and you on the one hand and the schizophrenic on the other is that the boy and you can reassert and reestablish control over the function of your mind by choosing to do so. The schizophrenic cannot. What should the boy have done instead? 
Well, in essence, his thinking process should have followed a pattern such as this. Why am I going to college? To train myself for my future profession. Then which college, A or B, can, to the best of my knowledge, best further this end? There are three essential criteria. First, the general academic level of the respective colleges. Second, the caliber of the professors in the field I'll be studying. Third, the comprehensiveness of the courses offered in my field at the respective colleges. It seems that the academic level of the two colleges is the same. Both are regarded as of the top rank. Professor R, who teaches at College A, is said to be a brilliant man in his field, and no one has a reputation equal to his at College B. College B, however, offers almost twice as many courses as College A, which means that I could acquire a wider and firmer education there. I think this outweighs the advantage of studying with Professor R. I think, therefore, that I will attend College B. Now, needless to say, the thinking process I just presented is highly simplified. But it does reflect the essence of the right approach. The establishment of a purpose, the asking and answering of relevant questions, and a deduction from one's answers that is consonant with one's original purpose. Now, if it happened that in comparing the three aspects of colleges A and B, he found them to be equal, the boy would then be free to decide which to attend by another and less fundamental standard, such as perhaps which college was more physically convenient to reach from home or which college Carol was attending. But then he would have to know that he was no longer judging by academic or scholastic criteria, and he would have to know why he was justified in acting on some other standard. I have compared the mind to a car. To continue the metaphor, we call the process of active, purposeful thinking front seat driving, and we call passive, associational thinking back seat driving. Let me explain why. Consider what one does when one is the driver of a car, sitting behind the wheel and heading toward a chosen destination. The front seat driver first must know exactly where he intends to go. Then he must direct the motion of the car toward his chosen goal by the shortest and most efficient route. He must, as he drives, watch constantly for road signs, signs that will tell him that he's proceeding in the right direction. He must constantly be in total control of what's occurring. He must deliberately choose and direct each step of his progression. Now consider in contradistinction to this, what one does when one is the passenger of a car, just along for the ride, when one is a backseat driver. The backseat driver has no purpose in the sense of a destination that he has assumed the responsibility of reaching. He's passive with regard to the final goal of the car. He's simply being carried along and is neither initiating nor influencing the motion and direction of the car. He sits passively, observing whatever scenery the car may happen to pass, ending up wherever the car may happen to stop. The scenery he sees is the scenery that rolls by his window, and he is only its passive contemplator. In the same way, the backseat driver of thought doesn't choose a final goal, a destination, a purpose to his mental activity. He is mentally carried along passively. He doesn't direct the progression of his thought. He merely observes whatever his subconscious feeds him by chance association. And the conclusion or decision, if any, which he finally reaches in his thinking, is determined not by facts, not by logic, but by whatever random ideas, memories, emotions, and images happen to lead him. The first attribute, then, of efficient, rational thinking is that it be purposeful, that it be goal-directed. The thinker must consciously, deliberately choose his purpose, that is, choose the problem to be solved, 
the question to be answered. Now, once that purpose is chosen and is clearly defined, the means of holding to it and never deviating from it is to set oneself sub-purposes, which means to raise and to answer relevant questions. Here again, the analogy of a front seat driver of a car will be useful. The front seat driver heading for a specific destination in Connecticut must know that there are certain signs along the way, signs indicating turns and highways and street names that will tell him that he's moving toward, not away from, his ultimate goal. In the same manner, the front seat driver of thought must know the markers along his mental road. He must know the questions that have to be asked and answered, the sub-problems that must be solved along the way to his ultimate goal. The boy in the second and rational example of thinking which I gave you, first defined his problem to decide between two colleges. Then he defined three sub-problems that had to be solved before he could find the answer. The academic level of the two colleges, the caliber of the professors, and the comprehensiveness of the courses offered. He knew that these were the three questions that had to be asked and answered in order for him to know which college to attend. It is this process of question asking and answering, the setting up of sub-problems, which keeps one's main purpose functioning as a mental directing agent. Either the asking of the right questions will give you the answer, if you already possess the necessary knowledge in your subconscious, or the questions will tell you what you have to find out. You will remember that in the second lecture of this course, Mr. Brandon discussed the nature and function of the subconscious. He explained that the subconscious is the sum of all of one's perceptions, identifications, associations, and conclusions on which the mind is not presently and actively focused. And he described the nature of the relationship between the subconscious storehouse and the presence of a goal or purpose held in the conscious mind as follows. And I quote, It is the goal or purpose a mind has set in any given instance that determines what material out of the total content of the mind's knowledge will be fed to it from the subconscious. For instance, if a man chooses to think about a specific issue in economics to solve the problem of what determines the prices paid for goods, it is the material relevant to that issue that will flow into his conscious awareness. His subconscious will feed him for his consideration such knowledge as he possesses about supply, demand, production, consumption, trade, etc. But if a man does not clearly know what it is that he wants to know, if he does not have a clearly defined purpose, a clearly defined problem to solve, if he decides just to think about economics with some vague generalized aim, the knowledge he requires from his subconscious filing system will not be forthcoming. His mind will wander aimlessly among chance bits of knowledge and random connections. He will find himself unable to concentrate and will soon give up the attempt as futile. Like an electronic computer, the subconscious requires exactitude of the orders it receives, if it is to function efficiently. And if it is given contradictory orders, it will not function at all. The failure to solve a problem is often caused by the absence of a precise, unequivocal definition of the problem one wishes to solve. A purpose in a mind acts in relation to the subconscious as a standard of selection, without which no thought is possible. When a mind abandons purpose, it abandons thinking. And what drifts through it from the subconscious is determined not by logic, but by association." Unquote. Thus, the failure to define an exact purpose in thinking 
makes one's stored knowledge unavailable and useless to the conscious mind. Just as if one had learned nothing in the past and had stored no knowledge whatever. The boy in the first and irrational example of thinking that I gave you, who attempted to decide between the two colleges in a backseat manner, may have had filed away in his subconscious all of the information he required in order to make a rational decision. But because he was backseat driving, that knowledge was not available to him, and his problem was, for all practical purposes, unsolvable. By his method, he might have made a disastrously wrong choice of colleges, deciding on the whim of the moment or by the pressure of a friend, despite the fact that he possessed both the intelligence and the knowledge which could have permitted him to make the right choice. Now consider another and related type of mental process in which many people commonly engage when they think they are thinking. A kind of backseat driving which is sometimes mistaken for a purposeful thought process. Because in this case, the mind is not wandering aimlessly, although its aim is not, in fact, the solution of a problem. A man comes home from his office one evening, and he greets his wife as usual. He vaguely notices that she seems strained, but he pays little attention to it. Then, suddenly, she explodes with anger, and she tells him that today is their anniversary and that he has ignored it completely. Feeling guilty, the man becomes defensive and angry and a bitter quarrel ensues. His wife accuses him of not caring for her, of never having cared for her, while he insists that she's foolish to read any significance into his forgetfulness and that besides he had serious business problems on his mind. The quarrel mounts in intensity and finally, the wife goes to her room in tears. The husband is upset, and he decides to think about the quarrel and its causes. He's determined to understand who is right and who is wrong, and to find a way to resolve the disagreement. What he does is something like this. He pictures first the crowded, stuffy subway he took on his way home. He remembers how tired he was, and that he was looking forward to seeing his wife and to forgetting the day's problems. He mentally recreates his arrival home, then his wife's sudden outburst, then his own feeling of guilt. He rehears mentally the accusations she had leveled against him. He remembers and re-experiences his resulting anger. He repeats in his mind the answers he had given to her accusations and what she had then replied. In this manner, he relives the entire progression of the evening, going over every word, every gesture, every expression, every emotion, up to the exit of his wife from the room. Perhaps an hour passes in this manner, at the end of which he is not one iota closer to understanding who is right and who is wrong, or what can be done to effect a reconciliation. He has been engaged in mental activity, but he has not been thinking. His mind hasn't wandered away to unrelated subjects, but he has not been thinking. He has been passively reviewing and re-experiencing past events and his own past emotions. He has not been thinking, he has been stewing. A review is not a process of thought. Running a silent motion picture in one's mind is not a process of thought. Reliving an emotional experience is not a process of thought. Yet the example I have just given is precisely what many people do when they are supposedly thinking. They run precisely this kind of motion picture in their minds. They feel badly, they worry, they sigh, they pace up and down. And then they conclude that despite their best efforts and hardest thinking, they simply cannot solve their problem. 
Well, what should this man have done instead? What would constitute a process of thinking, of rational mental activity, in a case such as this? First, the man should clearly identify the fact that his problem has two aspects, that two issues are involved, his forgetting of their anniversary and his wife's violent reaction to his forgetting. He might then begin by asking himself if it was right, even considering the pressure of business problems on his mind, to forget their anniversary. He might decide that it wasn't, that objectively his wife did have reason to be offended, that he shouldn't have let his feeling of guilt turn into anger, and that he owes his wife an apology and an explanation. He might then ask himself why his wife had been so quick to assume that he didn't care for her, why she had been so violent in her accusations. Had he given her provocation in the past to make her fear his indifference? Perhaps he decides that he has not been remiss in the past in projecting his feelings for her, that he hasn't given her grounds to be apprehensive about his actual attitude. Perhaps he knows that, as she herself has admitted, she's prone to exaggerate and to be oversensitive. He concludes that she was at fault in drawing the implications she drew from his forgetting. With these conclusions in mind, he can go to his wife, tell her what he has identified, and resolve the quarrel. Now this is, of course, very much foreshortened. There might be a great many more elements for the man to consider. But in essence, this is the rational approach, the rational method of facing such problems. The clarifying of the nature of the problem to be solved, then the asking and answering of the sub-problems that have to be understood in order for the main problem to be solved. A purposeful, rational, step-by-step, -step, logically unified process of thought. In order to maintain any purposeful process of thought, in order to be a front seat driver, it's necessary, of course, to hold one's mind in full focus. To focus means simply to be aware, to be conscious, to perceive, as opposed to a state of daze of mental fog. The act of focusing the mind is the primary mental act. It's the precondition of purposeful thinking. One cannot think while one is mentally half asleep. But it's important to understand that one's alternative is not between a state of full, clear, sharp mental awareness and a fog-like state of complete daze. There are a great many degrees of mental clarity, a great many degrees of focus in between these two states. Many people spend much of their lives in a state of semi-consciousness. They function as though they were seeing reality from underwater, with a veil blurring their perception. Some people, very few, exist in a state of full mental clarity, of a sharp, luminous awareness. But most shift back and forth in states of awareness which are neither of these two. Let me illustrate just a few of the possible levels of focus. At the very bottom of the scale is the state in which one moves through reality in a passive daze, barely perceiving, making decisions, acting, moving, accepting or rejecting ideas, with one's mind and focus turned off in a virtual epistemological coma. A slightly higher level of awareness is that in which one focuses sufficiently to perceive and to be aware, but one makes no effort to pass judgments. The meaning of what one perceives is not identified. One estimates nothing, evaluates nothing, concludes nothing. In such a state, you might, for instance, hear and understand every word that I'm saying tonight but form absolutely no judgment on the validity of what you're hearing. You don't ask if what I'm saying is true or false, right or wrong. You hear, but you do not estimate. You perceive, but you do not judge.
A slightly higher level of focusing is that in which one both grasps and judges, but one makes no new connections, performs no new active thinking. In this state, you might grasp what I'm saying and estimate it, but nothing more. You do not integrate your perceptions and judgments into the rest of your premises. Perhaps some of the points being made here are relevant to problems of yours. But in this state of awareness, your mind won't make the connection. Your mind isn't set to that level of effort. And so potentially valuable knowledge passes you by. Another level is what may be called selective focusing. In this state, one is aware of a splintered reality, a partial reality, a segmentalized reality, but not the whole. Bits and aspects, but never the total of what one is dealing with. In this state, you might focus now and again on one point or another. Your consciousness comes and goes. It sees one issue and then drifts away. And there is no whole, no sum in your mind. Only the memory of isolated sections and parts, disconnected and unintegrated. Full mental clarity means a state in which one perceives, judges, connects, and integrates the full conceptual meaning of every aspect of that with which one is dealing. One grasps, one judges, one looks for new connections, new applications, new integrations. One assumes the responsibility of full consciousness. Let me illustrate what the state of full focus means in the following way. It's the state of a skilled hunter moving through a jungle. The hunter isn't afraid, but he knows that danger exists and that he must be alert for every sign that will give him warning. As he moves, his senses and mind are fully sharp, fully ready and set to perceive. He will immediately hear any unusual sound. He'll immediately perceive any unusual sight that might signal danger. If he hears an odd sound, he asks himself whether it's a rustle of grass or the hiss of a snake. He interprets and judges everything, and he does so as carefully and accurately as possible. If he sees something new and unknown to him, he does not shrug and turn away because understanding requires too much effort. He knows too clearly that his life depends upon his power to understand, that his survival depends upon the efficiency with which he uses his mind. This is the state of full focus. But it should not be reserved for one's excursions into the jungle. You need it now and at this moment, and in all the moments of your life. You need it at work, you need it in your apartment, you need it walking down the street, you need it when you select a political candidate or a career. People do not use their consciousness in the same way at all times. They focus to different extents in different situations and on different subjects. Sometimes they front seat drive, sometimes they back seat drive. You have all met people who appear remarkably intelligent when dealing with one issue and remarkably stupid when dealing with another. You've all met people who are brilliant in their professions, who can deal with abstract ideas easily and efficiently, but whose personal lives consist of one unnecessary catastrophe after another. It is not their intelligence that varies, it's their use of it. If you wish to know whether or not you are always in full focus, if you wish to know the standard against which to measure yourselves, project how you would read a legal contract involving large sums of money and long-range commitments, a contract affecting your entire future. In such a case, you would be like the jungle hunter. You would be in full focus. You would study the meaning and implication of every word and clause and you wouldn't skip the small print merely because it appeared complex and difficult. 
you would know that it is precisely the small print that required your undivided attention. You're a front seat driver to the extent that this is your normal and constant mode of mental functioning. Nothing less will do. To the extent that this is not your mode of mental functioning, you're living at less than your intellectual capacity. You're endangering and undercutting your happiness, your fulfillment, your self-esteem, your life. It is the small print of reality which, unread, is the destroyer of human lives. Now you might wish to ask, but what if I'm bored with a certain subject or conversation or person? What if I'm confronted with something that does not interest me? Is it not then legitimate to go out of focus? Well, translated, the meaning of such a question is, is it not legitimate to make myself unconscious? to dissolve my mind in fog, to become less than an animal. If, for instance, you're trapped into listening to a dull conversation, the solution is not to make the boredom bearable by killing your mind. Focus instead on something else, something which does interest you. But if you must join in the conversation, if it's necessary that you speak, then you have to remain focused on it. Your only alternative is to speak and act without knowing what you're doing. To focus means, in essence, to know what you are doing. To know what you're doing in existence and to know what you're doing in consciousness. If you're studying philosophy at college and you're told that you must take a course in chemistry which doesn't interest you, the solution is not to attend chemistry classes in a day's stupor. Since chemistry interests you less than philosophy, then you rationally and validly will read fewer books on the subject, you'll delve into it less deeply, you'll not attempt to do any original work in it. But this doesn't mean that you skim over the books you do read without being conscious of what you're reading. Your premise can legitimately be that you'll learn less, but you will still have to learn what you are learning you'll still have to know what's being said in class. You will still have to remain conscious. You'll have to be fully as much in focus as when you're studying that which does interest you. What is optional in the life of any man is what he chooses to deal with and to what extent. What is not optional is the mental state in which he deals with whatever concerns him. What is not optional is whether or not he will remain in focus. Are there times when it's proper to give one's mind a rest? Most certainly, if one knows what one is doing. At the end of a busy day, you might come home, fling yourself down on the sofa, empty your mind of any purposeful pursuit, and just float. There's nothing wrong with this provided you know that you are giving yourself a mental rest. You're in danger only if you don't know the difference between this state and a state of purposeful mental work. To be in focus doesn't mean that one must always be in the pursuit of the solution to a problem. If, for instance, you go to a party, you're not there to solve intellectual problems, but you should be fully as much in focus. All that has changed is the object of your focus. A celebration doesn't mean escape from the responsibility of consciousness. It only means the suspension of productive work. Are there people who need to go out of focus, who need to turn off their consciousness in order to celebrate, in order to feel free to enjoy themselves? Yes, there are. But that is a state of neurosis. These are the people who are running from the knowledge that they have nothing to celebrate, that they have no self-esteem, and that only a self-induced mental stupor can anesthetize their self-loathing. The cardinal tool of thinking done in full focus is language. 
To illustrate the indispensable role of words as the means by which man retains and symbolizes his abstractions, I'll ask you to try the following experiment. Consider any conviction of yours which you feel confident of your ability to prove, such as the conviction that murder is immoral. Now, and I'm going to give you a moment to do this here, now try to prove this conviction, to prove it in your own minds, but to do so without using any words whatever. From your expressions, I take it that you've observed it cannot be done. There is no way to form or retain your thoughts in consciousness, no way to order them in a logical progression, no way to front seat drive without the use of language. Without language, man cannot sustain a thinking process. People often do attempt, however, to think without language. The result is that they go out of focus. In the place of words, they substitute emotions, images, and memories. But these are not substitutes for clearly formed, verbalized ideas. The conclusion of a syllogism is not reached by the union of an emotion and a mental picture. When people speak to each other, they normally do not intersperse between their sentences picture sketches and reports on their random emotions. If they did attempt such interspersions, they wouldn't be understood. But most people do not treat their own minds with the respect they grant to the minds of others. They assume that for themselves, any chaotic hodgepodge is good enough. Now, of course, there are people who do speak chaotically and incomprehensibly to others who do mutter inarticulate sounds about their feelings rather than clearly communicate ideas. These are the people who will say, oh, I can't explain it, but I know what I mean. The truth is that such people do not know what they mean. They merely feel what they feel they mean. And very often, using words literally, they don't mean anything at all. A fact which they're spared the discomfort of discovering by never attempting to translate their feelings into words. Of course, it sometimes can happen that a man has a thought for which he isn't immediately able to find the words. The thought is the product of some subconscious integration of ideas. The thought may even be valid. But he does not know what that thought is until he can translate it into words. Knowledge, conceptual knowledge, begins only with the employment of language. Psychologists report that in the process of artistic and scientific creativity, there are many preliminary mental activities that do take place on a subverbal level. And in these activities, various types of imagery usually play a central role. So I don't wish to leave the implication that there's no such thing as subverbal thought. Indeed, not only artists and scientists, but all of us engage in subverbal thought some of the time. But what has to be stressed in this context is that such subverbal processes are at best only one stage, the beginning stage, in the overall process of thought and creativity. A person who is unable to bring his thinking into a verbal, conceptual form is not in control of it and cannot be certain of the validity of any of his conclusions. Language is the acid test of clarity and coherence. Language is the only form in which it's possible to reason explicitly and to subject one's conclusions to the judgment of reason and reality. In order to think, man has to draw abstractions, to form concepts, and to give these concepts identity by means of specific words. As you'll remember from an earlier lecture, abstractions are the identification of that which two or more things have in common. On the perceptual level of awareness, you deal with firm, absolute entities. You perceive things which are what they are. 
in order to deal with reality on the conceptual level, in order to have your thinking correspond to reality, your concepts and the words you use to denote them have to be as firm and absolute as reality itself. They have to mean what they mean. They have to mean specific entities, attributes, events, or relationships perceived in reality. And only those specific entities, attributes, events, or relationships. If the word green denotes the concept of a certain color attribute, which green grass, green leaves, a green dress, a green rug all have in common, then that is what the word green denotes. That is the identity of the concept. And to remain a concept, it can have no other meaning. If you begin to use the word green indiscriminately and haphazardly, to denote a green object today, a red one tomorrow, a soft object next week, a hot one next month, then the word has become an inarticulate sound, denoting nothing. And the corresponding representation in your mind, which should have been a concept, is now merely a patch of mental fog. The law of identity is the link between metaphysics and epistemology, between existence and consciousness. It is the basic axiom of reality which man must follow as a basic rule in all of his thinking. In reality, things possess identity. They are what they are. In thinking, it is man's mind that has to provide his concepts with identity. He cannot do it by whim or by subjectivist preference. He can do it only by making his concepts denote specific aspects of reality. He has to maintain the absolutism of the law of identity in his mind as totally as it is maintained in reality. If he fails to do this, whatever goes on in his mind is no longer awareness, nor thinking, nor reason, nor knowledge. The identity of a concept is its definition. The guardians or destroyers of your mental efficacy, of your intelligence, of your knowledge, of your ability to deal with existence, are the definitions of your concepts and of the words that denote your concepts. When these definitions are absolute in their precision, they are your guardians. The degree of their imprecision, of their vagueness, is the degree to which they become your destroyers. When definitions are precise, they are the tools of thinking. When they are imprecise, they are the impediments, the blocks, the barriers to thought. What is a definition? A definition is a statement that identifies the essential characteristics of the aspect of reality which a concept denotes. A definition names the identity of a concept by naming the essential characteristics of the entity, attribute, event, or relationship which that concept denotes. Well, what do we mean by essential? We mean that which makes a thing what it is and differentiates it from all other things man knows that without which it would not be the kind of thing it is. For example, suppose we define the concept man as a living being who walks on two legs. Well, this is true of man, but it would not be a definition because it would not name the essential characteristics of man. It would not name that which makes him what he is and differentiates him from all other entities. A man may lose his legs or be unable to walk, but he would still remain a man. Suppose we defined man as a featherless biped. This is true of men, but it is also true of plucked chickens. So it would not be a definition. It would not name that which is true only of man. The proper definition of man is a rational animal. Rational means possessing the faculty of reason. Animal means a living organism possessing the power of locomotion. 
Now, why do we choose this as essential to the entity that we denote by the concept man? Because without these two characteristics, animality and the faculty of reason, the entity in question would not be a man. If an entity is not an animal but an inanimate object, it is not a man. If an entity is an animal, it may be a man, but it may also be a dog, a bird, or a fish. Now, if we name the characteristic animal and add to it the characteristic rational, that constitutes a full definition because the capacity to reason belongs only to man and differentiates him from all other animals. Concepts denoting the primary material of human knowledge, that is, sensations or sense data, are defined by what's called ostensive definitions. That is, by pointing to the appropriate objects and saying, I mean this. To know or to communicate what I mean by green, I would have to point to several green patches and say this. But higher concepts require a long chain of precise definitions in order to be reduced or brought back or connected to their base in perceptual reality. For example, the concept justice denotes a certain kind of moral principle, and a moral principle denotes a certain kind of estimate, and an estimate denotes a certain kind of choice in the mind of a certain kind of entity, namely man. It was Aristotle who identified the rules by which one formulates definitions of concepts that are not ostensibly defined. In order to formulate a correct definition, a definition that identifies the essentials of a particular class of entities, one must include that class into a wider class and differentiate it from all the other members of that wider class. For instance, when we define man, we did so by including the class of entities who are men into the wider class of animals. And we differentiate men from all other animals by the characteristic that only men possess, the capacity to reason. The two aspects of the process of formulating a definition are called genus and differentia. Genus means the wider or general class in which we include the entities to be defined. Differentia means the characteristic which differentiates these entities from all the other entities included in the genus. The Aristotelian rule and the rule of definitions is a definition must consist of a genus and a differentia. Observe what would happen if you didn't follow this rule. If you omitted the genus and defined man as simply as something that possesses the capacity to reason, you haven't stated what man is. You've named only one of his attributes. Or if you omit the differentia and define man only as an animal, you haven't separated him from all other animals. You will remember from an earlier lecture that the process of abstraction consists of two parts, isolation and integration, or separating and uniting. The same principle applies to the process of formulating definitions. To define a concept, we integrate it into a genus and isolate it by means of a differentia. We unite it with a wider class and separate it by means of its particular characteristic. In this manner, the filing system of one's subconscious is kept in order, and one's mind knows exactly where to find the meaning of any word or concept it uses. It looks for the meaning of the word man in the category labeled animals, and finds the definition pertaining only to man. In this manner, Every concept in one's mind has a specific identity, a specific meaning, and is not confused with any other concept. 
But you must remember that the structure of man's knowledge and of his concepts is hierarchical, and so is the structure of his definitions. The precision of any particular definition depends on the precision with which one has defined the concepts it uses. For instance, the precision of the definition, man is a rational animal, depends on the precision with which one has defined the concepts of animal and rational. All concepts and all definitions have to be filed and cross-filed in one's mind. They have to be identified and integrated. And this process has to be kept up, widened, refined, expanded, with the growth and expansion of one's knowledge. Let me give you an example. When a child first grasps the difference between living beings and inanimate objects, his own first definition of man would be, in effect, a thing that moves and make noises. This would distinguish men from the things that don't move or make noises, from things that are inert, inanimate. And, please note this, it would be a correct, true, valid definition in the context of the child's knowledge. At this stage, the child hasn't yet grasped the difference between men and other animals. You may observe that children need quite a long process of learning before they fully grasp this difference. As the child's knowledge grows, he'll expand his definition of man to a thing that moves, makes noises, walks on two legs, and has no fur, as distinguished from dogs or cats. Again, in the context of his knowledge, this is a perfectly valid definition. He'll need a long time before the definition, a rational animal, becomes meaningful to him. But, and please note this, when he reaches that stage, he will not find that he has to reverse or contradict his earlier definitions. They were not false, they were true of reality. And now he doesn't have to discard the knowledge they identified. He merely incorporates that knowledge into a definition which includes a much wider knowledge. When he now defines man as a rational animal, this definition implies the facts that man moves, makes noises, walks on two legs, and has no fur. All these facts are still true of man, but in the context of an adult's knowledge, these facts are not sufficient to distinguish the concept man from all his other concepts. They are no longer the essential facts. They can no longer serve as a definition. This example illustrates the process by which man gains knowledge and by which he keeps his mental files in rational order, as well as the role of definitions in this process. It's a process by which man enlarges the scope of his capacity to differentiate, to discriminate among all the aspects of reality that confront his awareness. In forming or in accepting a new concept, he must always formulate a definition which distinguishes this concept from all his other concepts. Thus he learns to think and to perceive in terms of essentials, in terms of precise, specific differentiations. He learns to endow his concepts with specific meanings, that is, with specific identities. And he keeps his knowledge, his conclusions, his convictions free of any contradiction. Don't make the mistake at this point of deciding that definitions are therefore subjective or relative. Definitions do depend on the total context of a man's knowledge, but the definition which is objectively correct at any stage of his development is the definition that embraces the context of all the knowledge available to him at that time and in that respect. For example, a child's definition of man doesn't clash with our adult definition. It's merely more generalized, less specific, and so is the state of the child's knowledge, and so are the issues with which he deals. But if an adult decided to claim as valid 
the definition of man as a thing that moves and makes noises, ignoring all the rest of his own knowledge, ignoring all the knowledge available for him to learn, that would be a false subjective definition. Nothing is more disastrous than the kind of conclusions men reach and the kind of actions they attempt when their concepts are devoid of firm, absolute, precise definitions and their knowledge therefore is non-integrated. If you understand what chaos would occur within your consciousness, if you were vague about the meaning and the application of a single concept such as green, you can easily imagine what would happen inside a mind that tries to draw abstractions from abstractions, to integrate concepts into wider concepts, with no precise definitions, no clear understanding of what it is that any of his concepts denote. You can easily imagine what will happen when such a mind tries to function on the level of the higher, more complex abstractions, such as love, poetry, electron, individualism, with gaps in meaning all along his mental chain, with vague approximations and undefined notions, with chaos built on chaos, and fog abstracted from fog. It is on this level and for these reasons that you'll see husbands who declare that love consists of forgiving their most contemptible actions. Aestheticians who declare that poetry consists of sounds without rhyme, rhythm, or meaning. Scientists who declare that electrons have free will. Conservatives who propose to draft everybody into compulsory labor and confiscate everybody's property for the purpose of preserving individualism. If you want to bring order into your mental files and efficiency into your methods of thinking, begin by formulating precise definitions for the concepts you use. You of course won't be able to do it all at once, but if whenever you're considering a problem, you make it a rule to start by defining at least every key concept involved, you'll be astonished to what extent it will clarify your thinking and how much easier the task of defining will progressively become. But remember that to define is to differentiate. Remember that a definition must consist of essentials, which means that it must distinguish a particular concept from all the other concepts in your mind. There are many specific and helpful rules to observe in the process of formulating correct definitions, but these rules are extensions and elaborations implied in the basic Aristotelian rule of genus and differentia. Such further rules should be studied in order to achieve full precision in one's method of thinking after one is thoroughly familiar with the basic rule. Tonight I shall discuss only one of these further rules because it's a crucially important corollary of the basic rule and because its breach represents a disastrously widespread error. It is known as the rule of fundamentality. It states that a definition must include the essential and fundamental characteristic of the thing being defined. Fundamental in this context means that which is a primary characteristic, not a secondary consequence. That which is a cause, not an effect. For example, if we define man as a being who possesses the capacity to study algebra, that would be a false definition, a breach of the rule of fundamentality. It's true that man is the only being who possesses the capacity to study algebra, but that capacity isn't a primary. It's merely one of the consequences of a fundamental capacity, of the capacity to reason, which has many other consequences. It's the primary, the fundamental characteristic, the capacity to reason, that is essential to man and distinguishes him from all other living beings, not any secondary consequence of that characteristic. In formulating a definition, then, one cannot pick some attribute at random 
one must look for the fundamental characteristic. One must consider all the known aspects that distinguish this particular entity from all other entities, and then select that characteristic which is the cause of these aspects. Let me give you some examples of what would happen if one ignored the rule of fundamentality. One could then define man as the animal who can weave baskets, or the animal who can read French, or the animal who uses electric coffee pots, or the animal who likes movies. All these characteristics belong only to men. Lower animals don't possess them. But all these characteristics are non-essentials, and therefore all such definitions are false. These examples show the error of picking some random attribute as the differentia of a definition. Now let me give you some examples of the same kind of error, that is, ignoring the rule of fundamentality, in picking some random attribute as the genus of a, de of a definition. One could then say that a skyscraper, an oak tree, a telegraph pole, and a man over six feet tall are entities of the same kind, of the same genus, because all of them are tall. Or one could say that men, chickens, tables, and chairs are entities of the same kind, the same genus, because all of them have legs. The breach of the rule of fundamentality, the error best described as definition by non-essentials, is perhaps the most disastrous of all the errors men can make in their definitions. For instance, certain modern sociologists and psychologists will define man as the animal with a sense of humor. Well, a sense of humor is blatantly a consequence of the fact that man possesses a mind. And more specifically, it's a consequence of certain special premises in his mind. But if a sense of humor is taken as an essential and fundamental characteristic of man, then one wouldn't have too much difficulty in arguing that a hyena is a man, because a hyena laughs. And one could also argue that men are hyenas. Such a claim is perhaps not too far from the intention of people who will define man in this manner. Or consider the definition of truth that's given by some members of the logical positivist school of philosophy and is propounded by them in some of our leading universities. Truth is that which is publicly verifiable. Now, it's certainly the case that that which is true can be verified publicly. But this is only a secondary, non-essential consequence of the fundamental fact that truth is that which corresponds to reality. If a statement is true, then the public who perceive the same reality, or any part of the public, or any individual, will be able to verify whether that statement does or does not correspond to reality, if they choose to verify it. But it isn't their verification, nor their sanction, that will make the statement true. It's the statement's correspondence to reality and the standard by which one judges this correspondence is not any action of the public, but logic. You hear examples of such definitions by non-essentials constantly today, only you may not recognize them. For example, it was a strategy of the communists, especially prevalent in the 1930s, to brand anyone who opposed them as a fascist. Fascism is, of course, the name of a particular form of political statism. In fact, it's a species of socialism. Historically, it's true that fascists and communists were often in opposition to each other, like rival gangs fighting for the same territory. But opposition to communism is scarcely the essential meaning of fascism, any more than opposition to fascism is the essential meaning of communism. But by inculcating in the public mind the notion that the meaning of fascism was opposition to communism, the communists were able to make this definition by non-essentials 
one of their most famous intimidating smears. Later, this technique was taken over by many liberals, so that now many of them strive to inculcate the notion that the meaning of fascism is opposition to welfare statism. Now, if you want to understand the essence of this kind of thinking, the essence of the method involved, I'll give you an example of it in its purest form. I'll read a passage from a book entitled Language and Thought in Schizophrenia. This is a collection of papers presented at a meeting of the American Psychiatric Association, published by the University of California Press. This particular passage is from a paper entitled On Specific Laws of Logic in Schizophrenia by E. Fondomaris. Quote, a schizophrenic patient of the insane asylum of the University of Bonn believed that Jesus, cigar boxes, and sex were identical. How did he arrive at that strange belief? Investigation revealed that the missing link for the connection between Jesus, cigar box, and sex was supplied by the idea of being encircled. In the opinion of this patient, the head of Jesus, as of a saint, is encircled by a halo, the package of cigars by the tax band, and the woman by the sex glance of the man. Apparently, our patient had the feeling that a saint, cigar package, and sexual life were identical. That is, the feelings which he experienced when he spoke of a saint, cigar package, or sex life were the same. The difference between normal and schizophrenic thinking seems to be that whereas for a normal person, the particular of being encircled is only one of many accidentals, for the schizophrenic patient, it is the quality expressing essence." Unquote. I think this makes graphically clear the meaning of definitions by non-essentials and why one should eliminate them from one's thinking. But this quotation mentions another crucial aspect of inefficient thinking, a mental habit responsible for a great many intellectual disasters. That is, the substitution of emotions for thought, the failure to distinguish thought from emotions, facts from feelings the treating of emotions as tools of cognition, as sources of knowledge. Observe the doctor's explanation of the cause of the schizophrenic's conclusions, and I quote again. Apparently, our patient had the feeling that a saint, cigar package, and sexual life were identical. That is, the feelings which he experienced when he spoke of a saint, cigar package, or sex life were the same. Unquote. Obviously, the sole standard by which the schizophrenic judged truth, reality, identity, logic, definitions, knowledge, every aspect of awareness, was his feelings. If he felt that the three objects were the same, they were the same to him. The attribute he picked to prove his belief, the attribute of encirclement, was not the result of thinking, but of rationalization. To rationalize means to pick some random explanation to justify one's feelings and stick to it regardless of reason, logic, evidence, or argument. In fact, whenever you hear a person stubbornly maintain some preposterous argument, in spite of any evidence to the contrary, you are observing a person who has suspended thought and is asserting the nonsense in order to justify some feeling, which is the actual cause of his belief. A sane person doesn't suspend his thinking as frequently or as thoroughly as a schizophrenic. Nevertheless, remember that whenever and to whatever extent you allow yourself to believe that it's true because I feel it's true, you are acting on the epistemological principles of schizophrenia at that time and to that extent. A schizophrenic can't change his methods of thinking. You can.
It's terribly important to distinguish very clearly in every issue what you think and what you feel, and to be on guard against any mixture of the two. This doesn't mean that you have to repress your feelings. It means only that you have to know which is a feeling and which is a rational judgment of fact. And whenever the judgment of your mind clashes with your feelings, it's the judgment of your mind, not your feelings, that you must accept as your tool of cognition, as your guide to reality. For instance, if you decide to take a certain action, because you've concluded for rational reasons that that action is right, and you find that it gives you pleasure, that's the proper relationship between thought and emotion. But if you decide that an action is right exclusively because it gives you pleasure, then you're reversing cause and effect. You're taking an emotion as a tool of perception. You're assuming that your emotion proves the action to be objectively right. The focus on one's feelings as one's primary concern is one of the crucial distorters of thought. And let me give you an example of how you might take emotions as tools of cognition without even being fully aware that that is what you're doing. Suppose you're reading a novel in which the hero seems to be an individualist and you have been starved for such a novel. In the first chapter, the hero turns down a very good job rather than conform to the ideas of others. You feel a strong emotion, an emotion of admiration and of pleasure. And this emotion, quite validly, is important to you. It's the kind of emotion you rationally do want to feel. Well, at this point, you can do one of two things. You can continue to perceive, to see what the book is about, to judge what you're reading. Or you can lose yourself in the pleasure you feel. Focus only on it. Look only for ways to maintain it, ignoring and evading any evidence that might contradict it. If you do this second, you might do it without a conscious decision. It might happen as the result of a habit of thinking, a method of perception by which over a long period of time, you have granted top priority to what you feel. Then as you continue to read the novel, the hero is shown establishing a socialistic cooperative, which he says will once and for all solve the problem of jobs for everyone. Well, if your mind is functioning rationally, you will perceive that you've made a mistake. That is, that whatever this book is preaching, it isn't individualism. But if you're focused on maintaining your emotion at any price, then you'll start to rationalize it by any means possible. You'll tell yourself that the hero really believes in his ideal, and this makes him an individualist. Or that he's fighting for his idea, so that he's still a hero, etc., etc., etc. And you can read the whole book this way, reading into it what you want to find, explaining away what doesn't fit your desires, blinding yourself, destroying your perception for the sake of your emotion. A year later, you might read the same book again in a different mood and ask yourself in helpless amazement, why did I think what I thought? Another mental habit that can block the efficiency of your thinking is the failure to integrate your ideas the habit of treating your convictions on different subjects as if they had no relation to one another, as if each subject were enclosed in a separate square and suspended in a vacuum. People are able to hold the countless number of contradictory opinions which they do hold only by a failure of integration, by refusing to consider the relationship of one idea to another. For instance, if a man decides in the field of economics that free enterprise is the best system and in the field of morality that one should be an altruist, he can do so only by a failure of integration. If you believe that you could never love a person who is worthless, but that you should be loved unconditionally, regardless of what you do or are, that is a failure of integration. 
if you hold that force is immoral, but you pick your neighbor's pocket. That is a failure of integration. If you believe that human beings must deal with each other rationally, but the only explanation you offer a child for your order is that you order it, that is a failure of integration. There is a particular form of the failure to integrate, which we call context dropping. For instance, if I have a quarrel with a friend and we agree to discuss it the next evening, and on the next evening she comes in and cheerfully suggests that we go to a movie, not mentioning the quarrel, she has forgotten or evaded the context, the unsolved problem that still exists between us, and she acts as if the quarrel had never taken place. Mr. Brandon tells a story about one of his patients who during a psychological interview came to understand certain key causes of his problems. He was very excited and happy and he left at the end of the hour vowing that he was certain the back of his problem was broken and that he now had tremendous things to think about. And he said he'd give a full report on his thinking the following week. Next session, next week, he entered the office looking forlorn, indifferent, dejected. How are you, Mr. Brandon asked. The patient sighed, oh, I guess I'm all right. Well, said Mr. Brandon, tell me what you've been thinking about this week. The patient looked at Mr. Brandon blankly. Gazing into space, he answered offhandedly, Oh, nothing much. Why do you ask? What's new with you? This is context drop. There are still other forms of blocking the efficiency of one's thinking. And let me illustrate an important one through an example I've never forgotten. A number of years ago, when President Truman was considering the nationalization of the steel industry because of union difficulties, I talked with a man who was very much in favor of the move. I discussed with him the immorality and the economic impracticality of such an action. I cited the principles of individual rights and property rights. I cited the evils of government intervention into economics to prove my case and I convinced him. He said that he understood my arguments clearly and that he agreed with them. The next week, he came and asked me why the government should not nationalize the coal industry. What this illustrates is the failure to think in principles. The attempt simply to stare at concrete facts, to understand them and to evaluate them without reference to any abstract principles. The mind that does this is what we call concrete bound. A man with a concrete bound mind considers particular issues, forgetting any theories he might know, attempting to solve problems without any principle to serve as a standard. Theories to him are only an intellectual chess game, something one plays with and talks about but doesn't apply to reality and doesn't use in one's thinking when one tries to solve a problem. This is the man who does not see the forest for the trees. The other side of this same coin and of this same error is the man who doesn't see the trees for the forest. That is, the man who holds nothing in his head but floating abstractions that is abstractions which he's unable to concretize, which he believes without any idea of what they would actually mean in reality. An example of this kind of thinking is a meeting at which a political candidate declares that he stands for a balanced budget, decreased taxes, and increased government spending, and his audience bursts into applause. No one who understood concretely what these abstractions meant could possibly applaud. A man who holds floating abstractions understands words not in terms of what they denote, but in terms of what they connote. Words connote things to him. They call up pleasant or unpleasant emotions, associations, memories. They suggest, they do not denote. 
his abstractions float in space, untied to meanings, to facts, to reality. The mind that is concrete bound and the mind that uses floating abstractions seem to be opposites. One is an unthinking Babbitt, the other an abstract ivory tower intellectual. But in fact, both hold the same basic premise. Both believe that there is no connection between facts and ideas, between reality and thought. And there will not be much difference in the disastrous errors of both their methods of thinking. Ladies and gentlemen, the issues that I have discussed tonight represent only some of the first steps in what is actually a new science, the science of efficient thinking. This is part of a wider discipline to which we have given the name psychoepistemology. Psychoepistemology is the study of the mental operations that characterize a man's method of dealing with reality. I have given you only a few significant leads along the road to the improvement and correction of one's thinking methods. You can readily understand that no matter how much you might learn in these 20 lectures, no matter what new knowledge you might acquire, your ability to use it, to take advantage of it, to apply it to the actual issues of your daily life can be no better than the efficiency of your thinking processes. If I could accomplish only one goal tonight, I should like at least to make you aware that there is a problem here urgently requiring your attention. I should like to make you self-conscious of your mental processes. I should like to start you on the most important task of all, to think about thinking. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight and next week, I shall be discussing a psychological issue of the most profound importance. It is an issue which I can, in this course, treat only very, very briefly. An issue which I treat at several times the present length in my course on basic principles of objectivist psychology. And I refer to the psychology of self-esteem, to its role in human life, its significance in understanding human motivation, and its relevance to mental health. Now, that man has a need of self-esteem is implicitly recognized by virtually everyone. That is, Almost anyone knows implicitly rather than explicitly that what one thinks of oneself, how one evaluates oneself, is an issue of the most immense importance psychologically. That to have a good opinion of oneself is an issue of extreme importance to men and that men will evade to tremendous lengths anything which would affect or shatter their good opinion of themselves. Yet, no one has ever asked the question, what is self-esteem and why does man need it? Is it really a need? If it is, why? What is the nature of the need? Why is this issue so important to man? Why should it matter to man so much what he thinks of himself? Now, to demonstrate that self-esteem is a genuine psychological need, one must demonstrate that it is required for man's survival and well-being for man, because that is what a basic need means. One must show that in some way the issue of self-esteem is tied very directly to man's survival and well-being, that is, to his efficacious continuation of the life process. The needs of any given organism are determined by the specific nature of the organism in question. And if we are to see that self-esteem is a need of man, we must 
look to the question of what are the facts of man's nature which could give rise to a need of self-esteem. The answer lies in remembering and applying in this context three crucially important facts about man's nature. The first of these is that man is a rational being. That is, a being whose distinctive mode of coping with reality is his conceptual faculty. Man is a being able to conceptualize. The second of these points, closely allied to the first, is that reason is man's basic means of survival. The third is that man is a being of volitional consciousness. What are the implications of these facts for our present concern? Well, consider the following. First and most basically, man's survival, insofar as it depends on his action, depends on the correct use of his mind on the correct use of his consciousness, on the proper exercise of his rational faculty. To live, man must think. His life depends on it. But to think is an act of choice. No animal faces this problem. An animal's only problem is, is the physical environment suited to him or is it not? If it is suited to him, the animal lives. If not, the animal perishes. But, provided the animal lives in a physically compatible environment, the animal is guided by its pleasure pain mechanism and by its senses automatically to pursue the course which will protect its life. An animal cannot act against its own senses or fail to use them. But man can act against or defy or fail to use his mind. Thus, for man, the problem of survival is primarily psychoepistemological. Remember that by psychoepistemology we refer to the science which studies how man uses his consciousness, the cognitive operations that characterize a man's method of using his consciousness. And when I say that the problem of survival for man is psychoepistemological, what this means is that man's survival most crucially depends upon him functioning by the correct psychoepistemological method of functioning. There are three fundamental psychoepistemological alternatives that man faces, more basic than any others. The first of these may be called or summarized the alternative of consciousness versus unconsciousness. What do I mean by that? I mean that the most fundamental psychoepistemological choice is will a man function on the principle of seeking constantly to be aware, to be aware of that with which he is dealing? Will he function on the principle of always seeking to expand the range of his awareness? to expand the range of his consciousness, to exercise his rational faculty to the utmost, or will he succumb to a lethargic mental passivity and seek to get by on as little mental effort as possible, spending the better part of his time in a sort of psychoepistemological coma, in a mental fog, without direction or mental purpose or effort being exerted. The second fundamental psychoepistemological alternative is reason versus feelings, by which I mean, will a man always be guided by the utmost conscientious, disciplined exercise of his rational understanding, or will he suspend his rational faculty and drift instead at the mercy of his feelings, letting his feelings decide for him whether it's true or false or right or wrong or what he will or will not do. Third, 
the issue of intellectual sovereignty versus intellectual dependence. Meaning, will a man always rely ultimately upon his independent judgment? Will he accept the responsibility of exercising independent judgment? Or will he instead again suspend his consciousness and pass on to others the responsibility of judging and knowing reality and attempt in effect to exist as a parasite on their consciousness, letting them decree and guide him in matters of truth or falsehood, right or wrong. Now, it's important for you to notice that all these three alternatives really entail one basic issue, namely to think or not to think. These three alternatives are what in fact the choice to think or not to think actually means. Such are the basic facts which you need to understand and to remind yourself of in order to understand the nature of man's need of self-esteem. Very early in his development, man discovers that he has to make choices, that in dealing with reality he constantly has to choose, shall I do this or shall I do that? If he makes the right choice, he will succeed. If he makes the wrong choice, he will fail, he will suffer pain, he can even die. His life and happiness depend on him being right. He has to choose constantly, he has to make decisions constantly, and the extent to which he chooses right, other things being equal, will be the extent of his success and happiness. If he chooses wrong, Instead, the consequence is pain, frustration, failure, defeat, destruction. Therefore, clearly, man has a survival need to be right. Does this mean that man has to be omniscient? No. Does this mean that man should demand infallibility of himself? No. Clearly, this is impossible. What does man require? He requires the knowledge that he is right in his method of making his choices and decisions. Meaning, he requires the security of knowing that the method behind his choices and decisions. The mental processes which give rise to his choices and decisions are right, are reliable. Man's competence to deal with the facts of reality depends on the rightness of his mental operations in dealing with reality. That is, his competence to deal with the facts of reality depends on the rightness of the psychoepistemological principles that his mental operations characteristically exhibit. Does he characteristically function on the principle of seeking constantly to expand his knowledge and understanding? Does he characteristically function on the principle that his rational judgment must never be subordinated or sacrificed to a feeling, to either a wish or a fear? Does he characteristically function on the principle that he will accept and regard as knowledge only that which he genuinely understands with his own mind? These are the issues upon which the psychoepistemological rightness of his mental operations basically depends. These are the mental operations that proceed and lie behind his choices and his decisions to the extent to which he's rational, and thus give him maximum advantages in the struggle for survival, make him maximally or optimally fit or competent in dealing with the facts of reality. But the rightness of his psychoepistemology 
the rightness of the mental operations that characterize his method of dealing with the facts of reality are not automatic. Man must achieve the right psychopistemology. It represents a volitional achievement. And therefore, man faces a question that confronts no other living species. He faces the question, have I made myself into the kind of entity that is fit for survival, adequate to deal with reality? Am I competent to live? Am I efficacious? Have I achieved the psychological state that my life and well-being requires? Am I right for existence? That is, am I able to live and worthy of living? Am I able to live and worthy of living? That is the basic question that man faces. Because the state of being able or competent to live is not automatically guaranteed to him, except as a potentiality which he must actualize, man confronts the question, am I able to live? And because the state of being competent to live must be achieved by him volitionally, man confronts the question, am I worthy of living? Have I done that which my life requires? His need of the certainty that he is able to live and worthy of living is man's need of self-esteem. Why is self-esteem, that is, the conviction that one is able to live and worthy of living, a basic psychological need? It is because efficacy is a matter of life and death to man. His life depends on his ability to deal with reality, to know what to do. It is in the nature of a consciousness that the collapse of its efficacy is the ultimate horror, a horror no other catastrophe could match. Man's deepest fear is not of dying, but of being unfit to live. In order to act, man needs the conviction that he knows what he's doing, that he's able to act, competent to judge, competent to decide. Moreover, since life consists of pursuing values, he requires the conviction that he is worthy to enjoy values. In order to pursue values, man must value the beneficiary, namely himself. A being who damned himself as totally and irrevocably worthless would have no incentive and no will to pursue values. He would be unable to answer the question, what for? Yet the ability to answer that question is for man a matter of life and death. The issue of worthiness and the issue of efficacy are inseparable. One cannot feel inefficacious but worthy, or evil but efficacious. The sense of worth proceeds from the knowledge that one has made oneself able to live, that one has done what one knows to be right. Self-esteem is the certainty of the efficacy of one's consciousness and the worthiness of one's person. The task of a rational morality, among other things, is to offer man an integrated code of values which will teach him that he makes himself worthy to live by making himself able to live. That is, that by exercising his rational faculty, by exercising his mind, he at once makes himself competent to deal with reality and makes himself worthy of enjoying life. And one of the most evil consequences of conventional mystical morality is precisely that it gives a man a contradictory code of ethics which places the requirements of efficacy and the requirements of worthiness in opposition to each other. So that to the extent to which you use your mind, are productive and are concerned with life on earth, that is, to the extent to which you make yourself efficacious, you're morally unworthy by conventional mystical ethics. The extent to which you relinquish your mind and act on faith and self-sacrifice, and thereby are declared to be virtuous, the extent to which you make yourself worthy, you make yourself incapable of dealing with reality. This in philosophy is the deadly split between the moral and the practical. 
which the altruist ethics forces upon man by offering him a code of values which cannot be practiced, which cannot be lived on earth, which leads only to suffering and self-destruction. One of the purposes, therefore, of a rational code of ethics, of a pro-life code of ethics, is precisely to show man how he makes himself worthy to live by making himself able to live, by making himself into a being competent to deal with reality successfully. Self-esteem, as I have said, is the certainty of the efficacy of one's consciousness and the worthiness of one's person. And the ultimate expression of the failure to achieve it is the passive psychotic, staring vacantly into space, lost in an unnameable dread, unable to act or to function, needing to be cared for and fed by a keeper, frozen by a self-pronounced verdict of worthlessness, paralyzed and imprisoned by the most lethal of contradictions, a consciousness turned against itself in doubt, in guilt, in terror. How does the child first encounter the issue of self-esteem? The child's first awareness of the issue of self-esteem is not in terms of the issue of life and death, but rather of pleasure and pain. That is, the question, do I know how to deal with the facts of reality, do I know how to choose right, presents itself in terms of the issue of pain or pleasure. Do I know how to succeed? Do I know how to make myself happy? Do I know how to avoid pain? Do I know how to avoid suffering? But every young child very early in the early years of life begins to come up against the question of his own efficacy or helplessness. Which means the question, am I able to achieve my values? Or am I impotent in the face of reality? The child's first self-generated pleasure in life is the pleasure of achieving efficacy as it learns to move its body, to gain control over its limbs, to stand, to walk, to manipulate objects, and observe the universal delight that children exhibit in this process in the very early ages of turning themselves into efficacious beings. At this level, significantly, there is no split between the able and the worthy. The pleasure and the pride which the young child takes in the first steps of growing efficacy are experienced as an indivisible unit inside his mind and emotions. As the child develops, as he passes into the conceptual level of consciousness, he comes up against the fact that to think, to function on the conceptual level, requires an effort. And so he comes up against the basic alternative referred to earlier, the alternative of consciousness versus unconsciousness, or consciousness versus non-effort. Shall he exert his mind or not bother? Subsequently, he comes up against the alternative, reason versus feelings, wishes or fears. He knows that something is right, but he has an emotion pulling him to do the opposite. Does he go by his mind or does he go by his feelings? The child doesn't know, of course, and indeed most adults don't know it consciously, that only rationality can lead to self-esteem. But he doesn't need that particular discovery in order to be rational. Because no one can escape knowing that one should be rational, meaning that one should be conscious, that one must know what one is doing, that contradictions do not exist, and that one must not indulge oneself in contradictions. What self-esteem requires in simplest terms is rationality, by which I mean one, commitment to full understanding as one's highest value, meaning commitment to the principle of constant mental growth, of awareness, of seeking always to expand the range of one's awareness. Two, commitment to the principle that nothing can be higher or more important than the facts of reality, that there is nothing to which the facts of reality or one's perception of the facts of reality or one's judgment of the facts of reality may be sacrificed. Three, the conviction that all of one's convictions, values and actions 
must be validated and justified by a process of thought, a process of reason. Four, full acceptance of the responsibility of judging, of looking at reality and judging, true or false, right or wrong. Five, commitment to the principle of always acting in accordance with one's best rational understanding, of living up to one's convictions, of accepting the principle that one acts on that which one's mind tells one is right. And from the foregoing, you can appreciate, again, the disastrousness of a anti-life, anti-man code of ethics, which is so incompatible with the requirements of man's life on earth, that the only way to be moral is to turn yourself into a being absolutely unfit for life on earth. And the only way to be practical is to stand damned morally. I refer you to a, an article which I wrote some time ago for further details on this subject, an article which was originally printed in the Objectivist newsletter and then reprinted as a pamphlet. The article is entitled Mental Health Versus Mysticism and Self-Sacrifice. And in this article, I'm specifically concerned to show why the ethics of mysticism and altruism are incompatible with mental health and self-esteem. Now, what I want to draw to your attention is that the fundamental issue of self-esteem is psycho-epistemological. That the basic issue of self-confidence is psycho-epistemological. That the basic issue of moral rectitude is psycho-epistemological. When I say that self-esteem is the conviction that you are right in your method of dealing with reality, I want to stress again, I am not talking of omniscience nor infallibility. I'm talking about the fundamental principles that characterize your method of choosing and decision-making, which processes lie behind all of your actions. It's the conviction that you're right in principle, not that you'll be concretely right in every particular choice you make. What do I mean by being right in principle? For example, and most basically, not the conviction that you will never make a mistake, but the conviction that you will never act without trying your best to know what makes sense, without trying to know what is true and right that you will never act on the principle of, I don't need knowledge, I don't have to know what I'm doing, I can just act blindly. Again, not the conviction that you will never err or miscalculate, but the conviction that whether you are right or in some cases wrong, you will act on the best of your rational understanding and you won't smother it in order to indulge some irrational emotion. That is what I mean by being right in the basic principle by which one functions. To summarize what I have said, self-esteem, the conviction of one's efficacy and worthiness, is man's deepest psychological need. In briefest essence, the basis of this need may be summarized as follows. Reason is man's basic means of survival, and the exercise of his rational faculty is volitional. Since reality confronts him with constant alternatives, man must choose his goals and actions. His life and happiness depend on his making the right choices, that is, choices which are consonant with the facts of reality and with the requirements of his own nature. Man cannot demand omniscience or infallibility of himself, but he does require the conviction that his method of choosing and making decisions, that is, his characteristic manner of using his consciousness, is right, right in principle, appropriate to reality. An organism whose consciousness functioned automatically would face no such problem. It could not question the validity of the mental operations which lie behind its actions. 
But to man, who is a being of volitional consciousness, this question is of life and death concern. Man is the one living species who is able to reject, sabotage, and betray his means of survival, his mind. Man is free to exercise his rational faculty or to suspend it, to act in accordance with his best, clearest, and most conscientious judgment, or to act against it, moved by blind feelings, to preserve his intellectual independence and integrity, or to surrender in parasitical fear to the authority of others. Thus, man is the one species who must, by volitional effort, make himself into an entity that is able to live and worthy of living. His need of self-esteem is his need to know that he has succeeded at this task. To think or not to think, to focus his conceptual faculty or to inactivate it is a man's basic act of choice. The one acts solely and directly within man's volitional power. An unbreached determination to use one's mind to the fullest of one's ability, an unbreached refusal ever to place any other consideration above one's perception of reality, is the only rational criterion of virtue, the only justifiable standard of moral perfection, and the only possible basis of authentic self-esteem. This, in briefest essence, summarizes the major points made so far. If you want to concretize and to see very clearly what these abstractions mean, why you cannot do better than to look at Miss Rand's fictional characters, because you will see dramatized very, very clearly the principles I have been discussing. The enormous self-esteem which her heroes and heroines exhibit is very directly and very clearly a consequence of their basic method of mental functioning. It's very interesting that although the concept of psychoepistemology was only coined by us several years ago, what's fascinating is the extent to which that theme is very much in evidence both in The Fountainhead and in Atlas Shrugged. When Rourke is struggling early in The Fountainhead to grasp the basic principle that differentiates himself from the Dean, he's in fact struggling toward what is in fact a psychoepistemological concept, the first-hander versus the second-hander. As I pointed out in a recent article on psychoepistemology, the basic conflict in The Fountainhead is between two psychoepistemologies, the independent mind versus the dependent mind. And, as I said in the same article on psychopistemology, this is brought out still more explicitly in Atlas Shrugged. It's very interesting, if you want to give yourself an assignment, to reread Atlas Shrugged strictly from the point of view of psychology in general and psychopistemology in particular. And many of you may be amazed to realize in how many ways the basic issue of good and evil is set up in what you will recognize as psychoepistemological terms, namely, the way the heroes and the heroines function mentally and the way the villains do. James Taggart is a beautiful example. There are any number of references to the internal corruption of his mental processes, the evasions, the blank outs, the constant anti-effort. It's very significant how James Taggart is first introduced into the story. Do you remember? Don't bother me, don't bother me, don't bother me, said James Taggart. That's very, very significant, psychologically. And in contradistinction, pro-effort, a tremendous commitment to the use of their minds, a commitment to rationality, a commitment to intellectual purposefulness, is, of course, the trademark of the heroes in Atlas Shrugged. Think of Reardon, in whom this issue is dramatized to the fullest extent. Think of what you are being told in Chapter 2 about Reardon's past and his development. Think about the scene which I referred to in that same psychopistemological article when Reardon learns about the passage of the Equalization of Opportunity Bill. Think of what Galt means when he tells you in Galt's speech, the noblest act you've ever performed is the act of your mind grasping that two and two make four. 
What's that for the psychophistemological issue? You would benefit a great deal, to repeat, if you would take a look at Atlas Shrugged from the point of view of these issues. And I think you will see many new things in the book which perhaps you haven't noticed on preceding readings that will be reciprocally illuminating. These lectures will make the book offer you new things you hadn't noticed before, and in turn the book will cast additional illumination on these lectures. Now then, it needs hardly to be said that the great majority of men do not function consistently as rational beings and do not achieve full self-esteem. Now, the alternative is not, as you know, exhausted between the man who is consistently rational and the man who is consistently irrational. Both are minorities in any culture. The great majority of men are rational some of the time and irrational some of the time, have some self-esteem and a good deal of guilt and self-doubt. James Taggart on the one hand and Galt on the other both represent minorities. Indeed, even the James Taggart has to be rational some of the time. Perhaps the only examples of consistent irrationality are to be found either in insane asylums or in graveyards. The reasons why man needs self-esteem dictate the standard by which self-esteem is to be gauged and the necessary conditions of its attainment. To the extent that a man fails to attain it, the consequence is a feeling of anxiety, insecurity, self-doubt, the sense of being unfit for reality, inadequate to existence. Anxiety is a psychological alarm signal, warning of danger to the organism, pathological anxiety, neurotic anxiety, that seemingly causeless fear of which so many people complain and from which they suffer at least some of the time in their lives. In varying degrees of intensity, the experience of such anxiety is the fate of most human beings. Most men never identify the importance of reason to their existence. They do not judge themselves by the standard of devotion to rationality, and they are not aware of the issue of self-esteem in the terms in which I have been discussing it. They are aware only of a desperate desire to feel confident and in control and to feel that they are good, good in some basic way which they cannot name. But the cause of that formless fear and guilt which haunts their lives is a failure which is psychopistemological, a failure in the proper use of their consciousness, a default on the responsibility of reason. The anxiety they experience is part of the price they pay for that default. And here we speak of the great mass of people, not all of whom are grossly neurotic, not all of whom are institutionalized, just the people perhaps who are over-reliant on sleeping pills, who run out to too many occasions because they can't bear to be alone, who long to be emotional dependents or to be dependent upon, or who run from one meaningless sexual affair to another, or who choose any one of a dozens of possible neurotic pseudo-escape routes by which they try to smother an anxiety they cannot ever entirely escape. Since self-esteem is the fundamental need of man's consciousness, since it is a need that cannot be bypassed, men who fail to achieve self-esteem or who fail to a significant degree strive to fake self-esteem, to evade their lack of self-esteem and to seek protection from their own state of inner dread behind the barricade of a phony self-esteem, a pseudo self-esteem as I call it. What do I mean by the concept of pseudo self-esteem? To begin with a definition, pseudo self-esteem, an irrational pretense at self-value is a neurotic device to diminish anxiety and provide a spurious sense of security. To assage a man's need of authentic self-esteem, 
while allowing the real causes of its lack to be evaded. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to understand a man's basic motivation, if you wish to understand the root of the values and goals that direct a man's behavior, the most fundamental question you have to know the answer to is, what is the nature and degree of his self-esteem or lack of it? Or putting it another way, what is the nature and degree of his self-esteem or of his pseudo-self-esteem? Because this holds the key to his motivation. A man can seek to maintain his pretense of self-esteem by two basic means. One, he can evade and repress ideas and feelings that could affect his self-appraisal adversely. That is, he can simply try to blank out anything which would suggest that there's anything wrong with him and therefore hurt his self-esteem. And secondly, and very significantly for understanding neurotic motivation, he can seek to derive his sense of efficacy and worth from something other than rationality. That is, he can seek to derive his sense of efficacy and worth from some alternative value or virtue, which he experiences as less demanding or more easily attainable, such as doing one's duty or being stoical or altruistic or financially successful or sexually attractive. And this complex process of self-deception on which the neurotic builds his life holds the key to his motivation, to his values and to his goals, as I shall show you. To continue our discussion, one of the most, perhaps the most, basic distinction or differentiation between the psychology of a man of authentic self-esteem and the psychology of a man of pseudo-self-esteem is the following. In the psychology of a man of authentic self-esteem, there is no clash between his perception of reality on the one hand and the preservation of his self-esteem on the other hand. Since he bases his self-esteem on his perception of reality and on the fact that he holds no value or consideration above reality. But to the man of pseudo self-esteem, reality to some extent appears as a threat, as an enemy. He feels in effect that it's reality or his self-esteem. Why? Because his pretense at self-esteem is necessarily purchased at the cost of evasions, of self-deception, of things he refuses to see, of some areas of blindness. And this is why a man who may be perfectly rational and lucid in one area that doesn't happen to touch or to threaten his pseudo self-esteem can be flagrantly irrational, evasive, defensive, and even stupid in another area which is threatening to his self-appraisal. One of the characteristics of a neurotic to the extent to which he is so, to the extent to which he lacks self-esteem, is that uh, in effect when he comes up against any fact or any perception or any issue which is a potential threat to his pseudo self-esteem, he counters in effect by making himself unconscious, by evading. And in so doing, he perpetuates the very process of psychoepistemological self-sabotaging which got him into trouble psychologically in the first place. And in this difference between the healthy man and the man of pseudo self-esteem, one can see one interesting index to mental health and illness. A man is psychologically healthy to the extent that there is no clash in him between perceiving reality and preserving his self-esteem. The degree to which such a clash exists is the degree of his mental illness. Now, while evasion and repression are psychopistemologically essential and basic to provide a neurotic with his illusion of self-esteem, that is only part of the process of self 
deception in which he engages, only part of the process of self-fraud. The other part may be observed in the sort of values and goals he chooses as a means of achieving his sense of personal worth. What does he tie his self-esteem to? In the process of choosing values, ladies and gentlemen, there is a fundamental difference in principle between the motivation of a man of self-esteem and of pseudo-self-esteem. An individual who develops healthily derives his cardinal pleasure, his cardinal pleasure and his pride from the work of his mind and from the achievements which the work of his mind makes possible. Feeling confident of his ability to deal with the facts of reality, he will want a challenging, effortful, creative existence. Creativeness will be his highest love on whatever his level of intelligence. Feeling confident of his own value, he will be drawn to and attracted by self-esteem in others. What he will desire most in human relationships is the opportunity to feel admiration. He will want to find men and achievements he can respect. In the sphere both of his work and of human relationships, his base and motor is a firm sense of confidence, of efficacy, and as a consequence, a love for existence, a love for the fact of being alive. Now, how does this compare or rather contrast with the man of pseudo self-esteem? The man without authentic self-esteem or without it to a significant extent. That man's base and motor is not confidence, but fear. Not to live, but to escape his fear of life. This is his fundamental goal. Not creativeness, but safety is his ruling desire. And what he seeks from others is not the chance to experience admiration. No, what he seeks from others is an escape from moral values, an escape from moral judgment, a promise to be forgiven, to be accepted, to be taken care of, to be taken care of metaphysically, to be comforted and protected in a terrifying universe. It's to such a man that the biblical quotation judge not that you be not judged, is the one moral rule he is enthusiastically willing to follow. Now, a man's self-esteem or pseudo-self-esteem determines his abstract values, not the specific goals he will seek. Because his specific goals can proceed from a lot of different factors, such as a man's intelligence, his knowledge, his premises, his personal context. For instance, a man of high self-esteem will desire intellectually challenging work, but whether he chooses to enter business or science or art depends on narrower, less fundamental considerations. And similarly, a man of pseudo self-esteem will desire that others protect him from reality, but a variety of factors will determine whether he feels more at home among the country club set or the academic set or the underworld set. And here we can see another interesting principle Another very important principle that differentiates mental health from mental illness. This time a principle observable in the sphere of motivation. A man of self-esteem is motivated by a love of self and of existence. A man of pseudo-self-esteem, to the extent of his lack of authentic self-esteem, is motivated by the fear that he is unfit for existence. The issue here then is motivation by confidence versus motivation by terror. A man is psychologically healthy to the extent that he functions on the principle of motivation by confidence. The degree of his motivation by fear is the degree of his mental illness. And now we come to a very important aspect of the psychology of the man of pseudo self-esteem. And that is that such a man in choosing his values is motivated primarily not by the desire to afford himself a positive enjoyment of existence but rather to defend himself against anxiety against painful feelings of inadequacy self-doubt and guilt so it may be said that he lives negatively or defensively an analogy will help to make this principle clear 
Say, if a man's life is in physical danger, for example, suppose he suffers from some major disease, why then his primary concern in such an emergency situation is obviously not with the pursuit of enjoyment, but with the removal of the danger, that is, with regaining his health, with re-establishing the context in which the pursuit of enjoyment will again be possible and appropriate. But to the man devoid of self-esteem, life is in effect a chronic emergency. He is always in danger psychologically. He never reaches normality, he never feels free for the enjoyment of life, because his method of combating the danger consists not of dealing with it rationally, not of working to remove it, but of seeking to persuade himself that it does not exist, that there is no danger. Since facts are facts and are not to be wiped out by self-made blindness, he doesn't succeed. But most of his evasions, repressions, and self-defeating actions are aimed at this goal. Fear is the ruling element in this man's psychology. Fear rules him psychoepistemologically and fear rules him motivationally. Psychoepistemologically, fear acts to undercut the clarity of his perception, to distort his judgments, to restrict his cognitive ambition, and to drive him into ever-increasing evasions. Fear rules him motivationally in that it subverts his normal value development, sabotages his proper growth, and leads him toward goals that promise to support his pretense at efficacy, driving him to passive conformity or hostile aggressiveness or autistic withdrawal, to any path, to any escape route that will protect his pseudo self-esteem against a stern, unknown and unforgiving reality. I have coined the name to characterize the values which a person adopts as devices to protect himself from anxiety. I call them defense values. And I mean by a defense value, one motivated by fear and aimed at supporting a pseudo self-esteem. A defense value is one motivated by fear and aimed at supporting a pseudo self-esteem. It is experienced in effect as a means of survival, as a substitute for rationality. It is an anti-anxiety device. Now, not all defense values are irrational intrinsically. What can be irrational about them is only the reason why this person chose them. For example, productive work is a rational value, but escaping into work as a means of evading one's flaws, shortcomings, and conflicts is not rational. Often, however, defense values are irrational in both respects. They're irrational in themselves and irrational in the motive for adopting them, as, for example, in the case of a man who seeks to escape anxiety and fake a sense of efficacy by acquiring power over others. Some months ago, writing on the issue of pseudo-self-esteem in the Objectivist newsletter, I projected a dramatized case history to show how a pseudo self-esteem might develop. And uh, I couldn't do better extemporaneously than to remind you of the portrait which I devised to illustrate this particular case. It's not based upon a single patient, it's actually a composite from my own past clinical experience. But I want to quote this because it's the simplest way to dramatize for you how defense values and pseudo self-esteem develop. How they become, in effect, the building blocks of one's soul. Quote, Consider the case of a person who, as a child, is characteristically antipathetic to exerting mental effort, who rebels against the responsibility of thinking, who resents the necessity of judgment, who prefers an undemanding state of mental fog, and drifts at the mercy of unexamined emotions. Whenever feelings of inadequacy or anxiety penetrate his chronic lethargy, warning him of the danger of his course, he seeks to evade them as best he can. He clings to the guidance and authority of those around him in order to obtain a sense of security and protection. 
As a result of his policy of unquestioning obedience, his parents praise him as a good boy. At school, his work is mediocre, and he feels an unadmitted resentment against the brighter boys in his class. He is pleased whenever they show signs of unruliness and are chastised by the teacher. This proves, he feels, that they are not good boys and that, notwithstanding his intellectual weakness, he is their moral superior. He enjoys going to church where he is informed that it is not the head that matters but the heart and that the meek shall inherit the earth. As he grows to adulthood, he is seldom conscious of the steps by which he selects his values and goals. But, moving like a somnambulist under the direction of subconscious orders, he is guided through all his crucial decisions by his unacknowledged sense of impotence, his fear of independence, his longing for safety, and his antipathy to thought. These lead him unerringly to choose friends of undistinguished intelligence, to accept a job in his uncle's hardware store, to join the same political party as his father, and to marry the girl next door whom he has known all his life. Whenever he feels vaguely guilty over his inertia, or whenever his wife reproaches him for his lack of ambition and nags him to demand a raise, he responds by summoning the thought that he is a decent citizen, a good provider, a devoted faithful husband, a God-fearing man, and that he has done all the things one is supposed to do. Whenever he feels a surge of envy or hostility toward those men around him who have made more of their lives than he has, he tells himself that his cardinal virtue is humility, and that people are at fault in not recognizing this and giving him the respect he deserves. It is thus that he makes his existence tolerable psychologically. At the hardware store, he performs the routine tasks he has been taught, initiating nothing, learning nothing, thinking nothing. But occasionally he dreams of the higher income and enhanced prestige he will enjoy when his uncle dies and leaves him the business. If the moral implications of his wish rise to trouble him, he promptly unfocuses his mind and thus eludes them. However, when the longed for event finally happens, he does not experience the elation he had imagined. A day after his uncle's funeral, he awakens in the middle of the night, his heart pounding frantically in a state of acute dread. He does not know how to account for it. He knows only that he feels overwhelmed by a sense of impending disaster. The evasion and self-deception which have been habitual since childhood now forbid him to know the meaning of his anxiety. For years he had been shrinking his perception and the dimensions of the world with which he had to deal in order to avoid coming face to face with his moral and psychological default and to escape any potential threat to his precarious inner security. He has crawled through his life, accepting, nodding, agreeing, obeying, seeking to bypass the effort and responsibility of thought by making humility his means of survival, seeking to establish for himself a world in which this would be possible. But now reality has demolished the walls of that world he has been thrown into a situation where intellectual responsibility will be demanded of him, where he will have to exercise judgment. Two thoughts have collided within him. I've got to know what to do, and I can't. In response to this collision, the chronic fear he had always evaded explodes into terror the terror of the knowledge that his defense values are now inadequate to protect him and that there is no longer any place to run. Just as a rational, psychologically healthy man bases his self-esteem on the use of his mind and gains an ever-increasing sense of control over his existence by choosing values that demand constant intellectual growth, so this man based his pseudo-self-esteem on his humility 
counting on others to solve the problem of his survival, and shows values appropriate to this manner of existence, values intended to reassure him of the validity and safety of his course. The terror he feels when he assumes ownership of the hardware store is the terror of a man suddenly divested of his means of survival, who must act and function in reality without weapons. Close quote. One of the significant characteristics of defense values is that they are usually held very compulsively. That is, men will hang on to them, defying reason, defying logic, clinging to them as a life preserver in the stormy sea. They feel as though they're hanging over an abyss and all that's protecting them is their defense values. Let them go and they collapse into the abyss of fully knowing the extent to which they lack self-esteem, the extent of their psychological and moral failure. And to escape the agony of this state, men will pay just about any price. They will defy logic, they will sacrifice their practical self-interest, sometimes they will even forfeit their lives. I've said they will pay just about any price. Well, with rare exceptions, any price except the one that could save them. They will not acknowledge the fraudulence of their defenses and work to achieve an authentic self-esteem. There is an almost unlimited variety in the possible defense values which men can adopt. Most of them, however, fall into one broad category. They are values generally held in high regard by the culture or subculture in which a person lives. There are many examples of defense values, and I will give you just a little sprinkling, as it were. Think of the man who is obsessed with being popular, who feels driven to win the approval of every person he meets, who clings to the image of himself as a likable guy, who in effect regards his appealing personality as his means of survival as the proof of his personal worth. Think of the woman who has no sense of personal identity and who seeks to lose her inner emptiness in the role of a sacrificial martyr for her children, demanding in exchange only that her children adore her, that their adoration fill the vacuum of the ego she doesn't possess. Or think of the man who never forms independent judgments about anything, but who seeks to compensate by making himself authoritatively knowledgeable concerning other men's opinions about everything. Of course, in school today, we are all taught or encouraged to do this. The man who works at being aggressively masculine, whose other concerns are entirely subordinated to his role as a woman chaser and who derives less pleasure from the act of sex than from the act of reporting his adventures to the boys in the locker room. Think of, and there are a great many examples of this today, the man who feels guilt over having inherited a fortune, who has no idea of what to do with it and proceeds frantically to give it away, clinging to the ideal of altruism and to the vision of himself as a humanitarian, keeping his pseudo self-esteem afloat by the belief that charity is a moral substitute for competence and courage. The person who has always been afraid of life and who tells himself that the reason is his superior sensitivity, and who chooses his clothes, his furniture, his books, and his bodily posture by the standard of what will make him appear idealistic. Yes, the examples are almost endless. Among defense values, of course, many are to be found in religion. Obedience to some religious injunction is often made the basis of pseudo-self-esteem. Faith in God, asceticism, systematic self-abnegation, adherence to religious rituals are among the commoner devices employed to allay anxiety and purchase a sense of worthiness. One loses oneself in the rituals or the obedience that one shares with one's fellows. Still another variant is the person who bases his pseudo-self-esteem upon his aspirations, 
who tells himself that what he does in reality or doesn't do, that doesn't count. That's not the real me. What's the real me? It's my intentions, my inarticulate dreams, my longings, my aspirations. He bases his pseudo self-esteem upon being an aspirer. If you ask him, well, why can't you uh, do anything about this in your actual life and reality? He shrugs and says, well, what can you do it? It's the system, it's circumstances, it's human infirmity. I never had the chance, I never got the break. Now, in the case of Bob, I took the basic pattern of a man's life from the early formation of defense values to the breakdown in anxiety attack. Now, defense values and pseudo self-esteem don't always or necessarily break down in so violent or dramatic a form. Often, the process is quieter, but no less devastating. The process of psychological erosion and disintegration is more insidious. The person involved is not brought to any moment, to any single moment of unmistakable crisis. No, it doesn't happen that way. Rather, his energy is slowly drained. He finds himself becoming increasingly more subject to depression, to fatigue, perhaps to a variety of physical complaints. His pretense at self-value becomes progressively more frayed and worn as his life peters out in a kind of empty, meaningless, desolate misery. Without climaxes, without explosions, with just a quiet, lethargic wonder as to what had gone wrong where. Just an increasing sense of spiritual tiredness and grayness. That is perhaps the commonest pattern of all. No evasion, no defense values, no strategy of self-deception can ever provide a man with a substitute for authentic self-esteem. The sense of efficacy and virtue men long for cannot be purchased by any of the self-frauds they perpetrate. Man needs the conviction that he is right for reality, right in principle, and only an unbreached rationality can achieve it. He can adopt any of the standard devices. He can spend half his life on his knees praying. He can make endless contributions to charity. He can offer sacrifice after sacrifice. He can become the biggest woman chaser who ever lived or abstain entirely. And all he's going to achieve at best is a moment's self-forgetfulness or a partial anesthetizing of the anxiety, a diminution of the feeling of dread, but whatever illusion of relief, whatever temporary amelioration of guilt, whatever quieting of despair he may reach, he is not going to know, he is not going to achieve self-esteem. The tragedy of most men's lives come from their attempts to escape this fact. Most men, as I said earlier, don't think about any of these issues in conscious conceptual terms. They just live and they cut a corner here and they cut a corner there and they evade here and they blank out there and they follow the line of least resistance here. It's a process of gradual attrition, of giving up one's life piece by piece, not imagining that all of those evasions and betrayals will ever add up, but they do add up. They do add up. There's a bookkeeper, as it were, inside every human mind that keeps an infallible record of every act of moral treason, of every evasion, of every attempt to place an I wish above and it is. 
And if you don't know it, on the conscious level, you know it through your emotions. Through the damned, unpleasant nature of too many of one's emotions. There is, in effect, an accumulated score being kept. Because every time that you, for good or for ill, let me hasten to add, every time that a man exerts the effort of thinking and grasps something new, he adds to the capital of his self-confidence. Every time he acts on his best rational understanding and resists any emotional pressure, he adds to his sense of efficacy and worth. And by the same logic and for the same reasons, any time that he acts against it, he chips away at his self-esteem. Now, there is one pattern of attempting to escape the problem of self-esteem, which is immensely prevalent. It's one particular variety of pseudo-self-esteem, one broad category of defense values, which are so important psychologically and culturally that they deserve a separate lecture. The issue deserves a separate lecture. And that is the broad category which includes all those people who try in one form or another to solve the problem of self-esteem, not through the rational exercise of their minds, but rather through their relationships to other people. All the people who try to derive their sense of self-value from their human relationships, most commonly from the approval of others. All those whose pseudo-self-esteem is tied in one form or another to satisfying the values, the terms, the conditions, the judgments of others. I'm speaking, of course, of the phenomenon to which I have given the name social metaphysics. Many of you will be familiar with this term, but in any event, I won't go into a definition of it and why I call a phenomenon social metaphysics until next week. But one point I do want to make now. Social metaphysics is only one type of character neurosis. It's by far the commonest, and it includes more people than any other single type. But since students often ask me whether or not all defense values are social metaphysical in nature, I want to say no, they are not. The mere fact that you have failed to achieve healthy self-esteem doesn't necessarily mean that you will seek it from your relationships with others. This is really the commonest anti-anxiety device which is adopted, and one which has immense cultural importance today. And because of its widespread nature, and because of its social and cultural importance, as I said, I want to give a whole lecture over to the subject. And therefore, next week, I shall be concerned with specifically the psychology of those whose self-esteem is tied to their relationships with other human beings. And so, to be continued. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening's lecture is very much a continuation of last week's lecture. Last week, I discussed in brief outline the nature of self-esteem, why self-esteem is a fundamental psychological need of man, what conditions are necessary for the attainment of self-esteem, and how self-esteem is commonly betrayed. In discussing man's need of self-esteem, I drew your attention to the fact that the root of that need lies in the fact that man is a being of volitional consciousness. Now then, the fact that man is a being of volitional consciousness and the fact that his life depends upon the exercise of his mind, upon his reason, imposes upon man a solemn responsibility. The fact to repeat that man is a rational being, a being whose basic means of survival is his mind, and the fact that man is a being of volitional consciousness, 
imposes upon man a solemn responsibility, one which many men revolt against and seek to escape. What is the nature of this responsibility? Since man's rational faculty does not function automatically, man must first of all choose to initiate a reasoning process. He must choose to check and test his conclusions by constant observation and by a rigorous process of logic. And he must choose to be guided by his rational judgment. Since his consciousness is not infallible, he can make an error at any step of the way. If he leaves the error uncorrected and acts on it, he will be acting against the facts of reality and suffering and self-destruction will be the result. Alone, facing the universe, relying exclusively upon his own mind, man has to be crucially concerned that he use his mind properly that he exercise his rational powers to the utmost, that he know what he is doing when he acts, that he knows what he is doing and why when he chooses the values he chooses, because should he choose wrong and act wrong, to repeat, suffering and self-destruction will be the result. Now, there are two ways in essence that a man can respond to these facts and to the responsibility they entail. A man can accept and welcome them, or he can resent and dread them. The first response leads to the achievement of self-esteem. The second, to neurosis, to anxiety, to inferiority complex. A psychologically healthy man is one who accepts the responsibility entailed in being a volitional being, who accepts the responsibility of thought, who accepts the responsibility of choice, who accepts and welcomes the responsibility of passing judgments. And that includes passing judgment on the issue of values, on the values and goals by which he is to live that are going to guide his actions and his life. Now, it's possible for man, and indeed many men do, to revolt against the responsibility inherent in their own nature, to seek escape from the responsibility of volition, to evade the effort of thought, to prefer a state of mental fog, and to drift at the mercy of blind feelings. It's possible, in a word, to a greater or lesser extent, to rebel against the necessity of judging reality and of judging it independently with one's own mind. To the extent to which one rebels against this responsibility, one defaults on the process of proper human growth, one sabotages one's own intellectual development, one doesn't grow intellectually as one should, and to this extent one sabotages the efficacy of one's mind. And the consequence of this is to sentence oneself to the mounting terror of feeling that one is inadequate to and unfit for existence. To the extent to which a person rebels against the responsibility of thinking, and to the extent to which he seeks to solve the problem by relying on the consciousness of others instead, to that extent he sabotages his own intellectual and psychological growth, he sabotages his intellectual development, and he declares himself in effect a second-rate citizen metaphysically. That is, he accepts the fact early in life that he is not to come into first-hand contact with reality, so to speak, that he is not going to think and judge and choose on his own. This is too much trouble. The risks are too great if he fails. And so instead he will look to others to provide for him the guidance which his own thinking should have provided instead. This state, of course, is not reached in a day, a week, or a month. 
It is the cumulative result of a long succession of defaults, evasions, and irrationalities. A long succession of failures to use one's mind properly. Confronted with the choice to initiate the mental effort needed to pursue knowledge, to focus his mind to think or not to bother, the irrationalist characteristically chooses not to bother, particularly if crucial issues are at stake. Why particularly if crucial issues are at stake? Because the risk is that much more terrifying. Because he does not want his life or happiness to depend upon anything so fragile as he sees it, as his own mind. Confronted with the choice to stand by the judgment of his mind or to act on feelings, wishes or fears, which he knows to be irrational, he characteristically sticks by his feelings and defies his mind in validating its judgment. For example, he indulges wishes which he knows to be irrational. He gives in to fears which he knows to be irrational. And doing so again and again, he builds up in his mind this kind of precedent. In any clash within me between my mind or my rational judgment and the strong feeling, it's my mind that goes. That, in effect, is the operating premise which after a while becomes implicit. And this, of course, in turn, undermines enormously any self-esteem that he might possess because he knows that there is a fundamental corruption built into the mechanism, built into the fundamental psychoepistemological policy of the mechanism. Confronted with the choice between his own understanding and the assertions of others, he characteristically abandons his own understanding, finding it safer to pass the responsibility of judgment to others. This is one of the most widespread forms in which men can attempt to revolt against the requirements of their own nature. However, there is no escape from reality. There is no escape from man's nature and from the manner of survival that his nature requires. Every living species that possesses awareness can survive only by the guidance of its consciousness. That is the role and the function of consciousness in a living organism. Man can survive only by the guidance of his kind of consciousness, a consciousness that has to function volitionally, that has to focus, perceive, draw abstractions, gain knowledge, pass judgments, form values, decide what are the right goals to pursue in order to survive and to procure his well-being. If a man rejects this responsibility, if he decides that thinking is too much effort, that the perception of reality is not his concern, why then if he wants to survive, he can survive only by means of the perceptions and the judgments of others. If he does not choose to judge reality himself, the only choice open to him is to follow blindly the judgments of others. He does not know what to do, but he does know that knowledge is required to make decisions in face of the countless alternatives that confront him every day of his life. He knows that he has nothing to guide him inside his mind but the chaotic jumble of random notions, snatches of unformulated impressions, bits of unintegrated ideas, pieces of unpursued thoughts, whirling and swimming in the fog of his one constant emotion, namely anxiety. He knows that he does not know how to live, but others seem to know it. Others have survived and are surviving around him. So the only way to survive, he feels, is to follow their lead and to live by their knowledge. They know, and they will spare him the risk and the effort. They know, somehow, they possess control of that mysterious, unknowable reality. He does not have to know or to perceive the world as it is and assume the responsibility of judgment, so he feels. Instead, he can look at people, watch what they do, guess what they see, get attuned to their manner of thinking and develop a skill for a special sight, the world as perceived by others. Thus, he is led to shape his soul in the image of a parasite inconceivable in any other living species. 
not a parasite of body, but a parasite of consciousness. Now, what I wish to emphasize is the following. What this type of person seeks is not material support. Oh, some men of this type are financial moochers, but they are comparatively a minority. And the state of being a material parasite is only the consequence of a deeper mental cause anyway. No, this type seeks a consciousness other than his own to replace the mind he has chosen to discard. He is begging humanity at large to take care of him on a level far deeper than financial, to tell him how to live. This means to set his goals, to choose his values, to prescribe his actions, never to leave him alone at the mercy of his own unreliable mind. He may be willing to work, to obey, and even to think within a limited square, if others will assume responsibility for his ultimate direction. Now, to understand his psychology, let us contrast it very briefly with that of a man of authentic, healthy self-esteem. A man of self-esteem and sovereign consciousness deals with reality, with nature, with an objective universe of facts. He holds his mind as his tool of survival and he develops his ability to think. But the man who has abandoned his mind lives not in a universe of facts, but in a universe of people. People, not facts, are his reality. People, not reason, are his tool of survival. It is with them that he has to deal. It is on them that his consciousness must focus. It is them who he must understand, or please, or placate, or deceive, or maneuver, or manipulate, or obey. It is his success at this task that becomes the gauge of his fitness to exist, of his competence to live. Having alienated himself from objective reality, he has no other standard of truth, no other standard of rightness or personal worth. To grasp and successfully to satisfy the expectations, the conditions, demands, terms, values of others is experienced by him as his deepest, most urgent need. The approval of others is his only form of assurance that he is right that he is doing well. The temporary diminution of his anxiety that their approval offers him is his substitute for self-esteem. Thus, taking you again to the concept of last week's lecture, we can say in a very broad way that this man, early in life, ties his pseudo-self-esteem to his ability not to deal with the objective facts of reality but to satisfy the terms, expectations, values, frame of reference of others. Now, men can hold this attitude, this policy, to varying degrees. It can dominate their personality or psychology, or it can be present only to a comparatively small extent. Yes, this form of neurosis can exist in men in various degrees of intensity and various degrees of destructiveness. It exists in the majority of people to some extent. The name which I have given to this particular phenomenon is social metaphysics. Why social metaphysics? I mean this designation to be taken literally. Well, remember, a metaphysics is a view of the nature of reality. One's metaphysics is one's view of the nature of reality. To the man I have been describing, reality is people. In his mind, in his thinking, in the automatic connections of his mind, people occupy the place which, in the mind of a rational man, is occupied by reality. 
Just as a rational man bases his self-esteem on his ability to deal with objective reality, so this man bases his self-value on his ability to deal with people. What do I mean when I say that in this man's mind people occupy the place which in the mind of a rational person is occupied by reality? Well, to understand what that means, consider the following. Try to project exactly what we mean when we talk about reality being present in our mind. Ordinarily, we don't think of reality as such in our daily actions. We take it for granted. The concept has become built into our minds as an automatic frame of reference and standard of judgment. So that if, for example, to give a simple example, I asked you, what color is the ceiling of this room? you would automatically almost look up to see it. You would look to the facts of reality. And in such a case, you couldn't imagine what else one could possibly look to or refer to. But if I asked you a more abstract question, such as, for what purpose should man live? Many people would find that the first thought to leap into their mind would not be the question, what in reason is the purpose for which man should live, but rather, what do people think it is? What have I heard said it is? This is social metaphysics. Now, if I asked you what did you do this morning and suggested that you take a public poll in order to find out what you did do, you would consider my suggestion absurd. Yet there is no difference in principle between that question and the question for what moral purpose should man live. Both questions refer to reality and there is nothing else to refer to. There is of course an important difference between these two questions. The second is more abstract than the first. It is in the realm of abstractions that a social metaphysician suspends his judgment. He is willing and able to perceive the immediately given the concrete and the simplest familiar abstractions, and for the most part to trust his judgment on that level. But it is on the level of higher abstractions, and most particularly on the level of value judgments, that his mind goes blank. And instead of reality, all he thinks of is the consciousness of others, their beliefs, their views, their sense of things, in order to learn the truth. Social metaphysics, then, may be defined and summarized as follows. Social metaphysics is the psychological syndrome. A syndrome means, of course, a collection of symptoms characterizing a specific illness. Social metaphysics is the psychological syndrome that characterizes an individual who holds the consciousnesses of other men, not objective reality, as his ultimate psycho-epistemological frame of reference. To repeat, social metaphysics is the psychological syndrome that characterizes an individual who holds the consciousnesses of other men, not objective reality, as his ultimate psycho-epistemological frame of reference. Perhaps the worst form of self-degradation and the worst punishment that social metaphysicians endure is their contempt for their own judgment. A man of sovereign consciousness places nothing higher than reality and no judgment of reality higher than his own. He does not accept an idea as true or valid unless he recognizes it to be so by his own rational understanding. If a social metaphysician judges an idea to be true, the fact that he used his own judgment tends to invalidate the idea. Any conviction he forms lacks conviction for him because it is his own. Any idea advanced by others tends to be extra convincing because it is not his. He feels implicitly that others have a wisdom superior to his own, granted to them by the fact that they are non-himself. He may not always give in to them, but his emotions will always pull him secretly to acknowledge their superiority. 
His own mind to him is not an instrument of certainty, but of self-doubt and mistrust. He feels, who am I to know? Who am I to judge? How can I tell? His attitude amounts to, how can I live my life by the guidance of nothing but so precarious, so puny, so feeble, so uncertain, so unreliable a thing as my mind? If one discusses the importance of reason with a social metaphysician, he frequently will ask, whose reason? And will proceed to complain that experts disagree in every field, so how can one tell what is reasonable? It will never occur to a man of independent judgment, to a man of sovereign consciousness, to ask such a question as, whose reason? And it never occurs to a social metaphysician that the answer is, one's own. Social metaphysicians attach an abnormal emotional significance to the opinions of others, much beyond any practical consideration, beyond any reason they can name, without reason, as a primary. The dislike or disagreement of others has the immediate effect of shaking their judgment, whether they actually give in to others or not. Many a social metaphysician has described to me the following phenomenon. He goes to a party, in the course of a conversation at a party, he expresses some ideas which meet with violent opposition, and in the course of his argument, he feels himself coming apart at the scene psychopistemologically. He forgets all the facts, arguments, and proofs which he knew to support his own position an hour earlier. He's literally paralyzed in the vice of fear, and he feels he cannot think. He cannot remember facts which he knew perfectly well. Why? What can cause this kind of psychological this kind of psychopistemological paralysis, something which matters far more to him, because it is an issue of values, something that matters far more to him than the truth or falsehood of the issues involved. Others disagree. Others are frowning or looking angry or indignant or contemptuous or are ridiculing or are expressing opposition in one form or another. That fact liquefies him psychologically. I remember a particular young man who suffered from a rather severe case of social metaphysics attending college and he would get into arguments sometimes with his professor or professors and he would put forth some view then the professor or the class would express some opposition he wouldn't the young man wouldn't lose the conviction that his position was true he wouldn't even, in this particular case, lose the memory of the reasons to support his conviction. Only he would find the following emotional shift occurring. He would have a sense that the ideas involved exist at some infinite distance from him. That they're of no importance one way or the other. That his knowledge that his position is true or right is of no importance, no emotional significance one way or the other. It all feels far away, infinitely far away. And what's up close is only the fear of his classmates and the professor's opposition or disapproval. Truth doesn't matter to him any longer, nor facts, nor reality, nor his own convictions. What matters is only the fact that others don't think it's true. Afterwards, he walks out of the classroom feeling a wave of self-contempt, feeling like a traitor, with justice. In order to understand the peculiar nature of social metaphysics, I have to emphasize once again that the kind of dependence which I am discussing is not primarily a material dependence. It's not an issue of financial support. That can sometimes be involved for individual people, but that's not what the fundamental problem is. The fundamental problem is a person who has either never acquired or relinquished the concept of an objective reality apart from the beliefs, the views, the ideas, the notions of other people. He doesn't have in his mind a clear concept of reality as apart from the consensus of his particular significant others, as it were. I wrote an article in the Objectivist Newsletter some time ago dealing with one aspect of the psychology of social metaphysics in which I told an anecdote, an experience which happened to me around seven or eight years ago. 
which I'd like to repeat for you here because it's very relevant by way of illuminating the nature of the social metaphysician's alienation from reality. The incident really is something of a horror story in a very quiet way. Briefly, it's this. A young man came to see me at the suggestion of a mutual acquaintance who thought that objectivism might help the young man with his personal and professional problems. After I had answered a number of questions concerning the objectivist philosophy, the young man looked at me nervously, and then he said, and this is a verbatim quote, it's not the sort of thing one forgets, but if I accept these ideas, my friends will kill me. They won't let me live. No one will let you live. Do you mean, I ask, that you expect your friends to murder you? No, of course not, he answered. Do you expect them to lock you in a room and starve you to death? No. Well, then what do you mean? I mean, they won't let me live. I was unable to obtain any other answer from him or any explanation. He kept repeating, they won't let me live, as if it were a self-evident fact, an axiom understood by everybody and taken for granted. Our mutual acquaintance who had brought him was dumbfounded and kept asking, what on earth do you mean? The young man seemed unable to explain. He left and I never heard from him again. I knew what he meant, but one seldom hears it stated quite that openly. The incident involving this young man focuses with unusual clarity the peculiar nature of the social metaphysician's dependence and fear. The, the dependence is deeper than any practical or tangible consideration. The material forms of parasitism and exploitation that some men practice are merely one of its consequences. The basic dependence is psychoepistemological, a parasitism of cognition, of judgment, of values, a wish to function within a context established by others, to live by the guidance of rules for which one does not bear ultimate intellectual responsibility. To repeat, a parasitism of consciousness. Since the social metaphysician's pseudo-self-esteem rests on his ability to deal with the world as perceived by others, his fear of disapproval or condemnation is the fear of being pronounced inadequate to reality, unfit for existence, devoid of personal worth, a verdict which he hears whenever he is rejected. The meaning of the boy's statement, they won't let me live, is they won't keep me alive, they won't take care of me, they'll withdraw their approval. I'll be abandoned in an unknowable reality. The non-venal, non-practical nature of the social metaphysician's dependence is illustrated in the following example. Now, this example was based upon a person who I know myself, but it's a phenomenon which is so common that uh, there are many, many duplicates in small variations of this psychology, and I rather suspect that many of you will know from your own experience the kind of type of person I'm talking about. I'm thinking of a social metaphysician who is a multimillionaire and who is obsessively concerned with the issue of what everyone thinks of him, even his office boy. He feels driven to win the office boy's approval or liking. He watches eagerly for any signs of a personal response and any indication of the boy's indifference or dislike makes him feel depressed or anxious. He finds himself being compulsively charming in order to win the boy's admiration. Now, this man certainly has nothing practical to gain from the boy's favor, neither money, nor advice, nor prestige, nor business advantage. In any practical business sense, the boy is his inferior. Yet the multimillionaire feels that he must win the boy's affection. What significance then does the boy have for him. It is not the office boy as an actual person that he seeks to placate or charm, but rather the office boy as a symbol of other people, of any other people, 
of mankind at large. The implicit thought behind his compulsion is not this office boy is a potential provider who will take care of me and guide me, but rather I am acceptable to other people. People who are non-me approve of me. They regard me as a good human being. It is this kind of subservience, this kind of dependence, which is responsible for the profound sense of humiliation which most social metaphysicians endure to a greater or lesser extent. A kind of sense of living under blackmail, of constantly having to placate or appease that nameless others. And here, this sense of humiliation, this fear, this crawling kind of dependence gives rise to a very significant social phenomenon. It leads to very, very evil consequences socially, to many, but I want to focus on one, and that is that it is this kind of fear which lies at the root of the process by which men can surrender the world to evil. Not a practical fear, that must be emphasized. Not a practical fear, not the response to a tangible threat. Something absolutely non-practical on the deepest level. One of the commonest devices by which the social metaphysician conceals from himself the nature of his own fear and cowardice is to tell himself when he surrenders or capitulates to views or people who he doesn't respect that he's being practical, that he's acting out of practical considerations. I wrote an article dealing with this phenomenon, as I say some time ago in the newsletter, called Social Metaphysical Fear. And to illustrate how this process worked, I gave a few case examples which were based upon individual cases known by me which are very suggestive because many other closely related types exist which you will all recognize. I want to quote a bit from myself because these cases are really archetypical. I want you to observe the following in these cases. What these cases illustrate is the manner in which men, prompted by a degrading fear they dare not acknowledge and so cannot overcome, invent non-existent dangers or grossly exaggerate minor ones betray their own minds, sell out whatever authentic rationality they possess, and contribute to the spread of values inimical to their own, and acquire a vested interest in believing that men are unavoidably evil, that human existence is evil, that the good has no chance on earth. The first case is that of a professor of philosophy who is an atheist. He knows that the arguments for the existence of God are thoroughly indefensible. He regards the notion of a supernatural being as irrational and destructive. He despises mysticism and considers himself an advocate of reason. But he evades the issue of atheism versus theism in his books and lectures, refuses to commit himself on the subject publicly, and every Sunday attends church with his parents and relatives. He does not tell himself that his motive is fear, that he is terrified to stand alone against his family, friends, and colleagues, that violent arguments of any kind make him panicky, and that he desperately wants to feel accepted. No, this is not what he tells himself. Instead, he tells himself that if he were to acknowledge his atheism, his career would be ruined, evading the fact that many professors are known atheists and their careers are unaffected by it. He tells himself that he is reluctant to cause pain to his elderly parents who are devoutly religious and who would be dismayed by his lack of faith, evading the fact that he is not obliged to convert his parents, merely to state his own convictions, and that a man who takes ideas seriously does not sacrifice his own judgments, which he knows to be rational, in order to placate people whose beliefs he knows to be irrational. His rationalizations serve to shield him from a full recognition of his treason. But because it cannot be blanked out entirely, he is condemned to struggle against secret feelings of self-contempt, and he retaliates by cursing the malevolence of the system and of reality. 
since he cannot have his treason and his self-esteem too. Consider the case of a successful playwright who selects some important theme as the subject of a play, a theme requiring and deserving a serious dramatic presentation, who then realizes that his viewpoint will antagonize a great many people. He decides, therefore, to write the play as a comedy, making good-natured fun of the things he regards as evil, counting on his humor to prevent anyone from taking his view seriously and being offended or antagonized. He does not tell himself that he dreads to be regarded as unfashionable. Instead, he tells himself that serious plays dealing with controversial ideas are non-commercial and dismisses the many exceptions as freaks requiring no explanation. But he cannot entirely elude the knowledge that he has sold out the motive that prompted his desire to write the play in the first place. So he retaliates against his discomforting sense of moral uncleanliness by cursing the stupidity and the bad taste of the masses. Consider the case of a scientist who despises the obscurantist jargon that is rampant in his profession and the postulates underlying that jargon, who is rationally convinced that the theories of many of his most highly regarded colleagues are wrong. But he twists his brain to adopt that jargon in his own writings, dilutes his criticisms in every possible way, and strives to smuggle his own ideas into the minds of his readers in such a manner that no one will notice the extent of his departure from established belief. He does not tell himself that he is afraid of being ridiculed as an outsider or that he abjectly hungers for the esteem of men he regards as pretentious incompetence. Instead, he tells himself that he is playing it smart, that when he becomes famous, he will be the term setter and that the practical way to become famous, to become a successful innovator, is to make himself indistinguishable from everyone else. But he cannot entirely drown the knowledge that this was not the view of science with which he started, and that the youth who had been himself would find it strange to be told that devotion to truth is served by catering to falsehood. So he retaliates by cursing the malevolence of a universe in which the concept of a fashionable innovator is a contradiction in terms. Consider finally the all too common case of the businessman who recognizes that capitalism is the only rational and just social system. He knows the intelligence, independence, and dedication which industrial production requires. He knows that he earns his profits, he loves his work and is secretly proud of it. But he apologizes for his success publicly contributes financially to intellectual organizations explicitly devoted to his destruction, accepts the government's expropriation of his wealth and infringement of his rights without moral protest, and begs mankind at large to forgive him for the sin of possessing ability. He does not tell himself that he is afraid to challenge the prevailing value system which damns his way of life as ignoble, selfish, and materialistic even though that value system has never made sense to him. He does not tell himself that he cannot bear to feel alienated from all those who support that value system. He does not tell himself that the responsibility of passing independent judgments in the realm of morality fills him with dread. Instead, he tells himself that his policy is motivated solely by the desire to protect his business interests that it is good sense not to antagonize government officials, that it is shrewd public relations to finance intellectuals of the statist persuasion so that they will see that he is a nice guy, that it is bad business to court unpopularity. His secret fear takes the form of imagining that the masses are unthinking brutes, that they are the ultimate masters of reality, they can kill him and take over his property whenever they wish, so they must be placated, they must be told that he works only to serve them. He must restrain them by assuring them that theirs is the right superseding all other rights. This, he tells himself, is hard-headed realism. But he cannot entirely escape the disquieting awareness somewhere within him that his appeasement is not prompted by the motives he names, that his practicality and cynicism are protective affectations masking something worse. 
So he retaliates by cursing human irrationality and the malevolence of a world which demands that he be concerned with moral issues one way or the other. Such is the manner in which men deliver the world to evil. In all such cases and countless others, hiding behind the pretense that their fear is of some practical, tangible threat, what is being concealed is the fact that what is really at stake is the issue of standing intellectually alone, of being sovereign in the sphere of value judgments, of pronouncing moral judgments on the fundamental issues of human existence and of building one's life on those judgments. That is what the social metaphysician is terrified of and that is the responsibility from which his whole life represents an attempted escape. Now to continue our discussion of the psychology of social metaphysics. From my foregoing unfortunately too brief analysis of social metaphysics, the picture which will almost inevitably appear in your mind to stand for the social metaphysician will be someone, let us say, like Peter Keating in The Fountainhead, the organization man, the conformist, to use modern language. However, as I want to show you in the next little while, this is only the most easily recognizable type of social metaphysician. There are many other types which are quite different and sometimes harder to diagnose. But first, let's briefly discuss the simplest, most obvious kind of social metaphysician, the kind, as I say, symbolized by a character like Peter Keating in The Fountainhead. I use him because obviously it's a character whom you all know. Now, Keating is quite explicitly on the premise of who am I to think? Who am I to make value judgments? Keating is not especially interested with what is or is not true, nor with what is good or bad. What then is important to him? What people believe to be truth and reality? What people believe to be good and bad? All of Keating's actions rest on and are explicable only in terms of the premise that his survival depends not on his ability to grasp the actual facts of reality and to act accordingly, but rather his survival depends on his ability to grasp and adjust to other people's views of reality, other people's beliefs about reality. I am as you desire me, such is Keating's premise. Always be what people want you to be, he tells Rourke. Then you've got them where you want them. <laughs> now, Keating differs from other social metaphysicians of his type only in that he is more self-conscious about his motives than most of them are. But he deludes himself in the belief that he fakes his person for others merely in order to gain practical advantages. For in fact, there is no real person beneath the fake. There is only a shapeless fear. Peter Keating is utterly selfless. And one of the most brilliant points in the Fountainhead is the illustration that Keating is what selflessness, but allegedly noble ideal, actually means. If it's good to have no ego, Keating has none. If it's good to be selfless, Keating is as selfless as any mystical saint. He hasn't a desire or a value or a goal to call his own, truly. Keating's standard of self-appraisal is the view others hold of him. His pseudo-self-esteem is based on such smiles of approval, such applause, such recognition as he does receive. And to the extent that he doesn't receive it, he feels tense, nervous, anxious. Observe that if others think Keating great, this does not literally make him feel that he is great, 
No pseudo self-esteem can accomplish that, but it does make him feel relatively more secure. A security expressed in the feeling, I'm getting away with it. But his very success leads him to still more intense potential anxiety. The dread of being found out. The dread of having his inner emptiness, his essential fraudulence, revealed. And this is why the Cosmo Slotnik competition precipitates an anxiety attack in him. Remember the context at this point in the story. Keating is on his way up as an apparently brilliant young architect. He enters the foremost architectural competition in the country and proceeds to feel stark terror that he will lose. Let me quote a brief passage from the Fountainhead. Quote, this was fear. This was what one feels in a nightmare, thought Peter Keating. Only then one awakens when it becomes unbearable. But he could neither awaken nor bear it any longer. It had been growing for days, for weeks, and now it had caught him. This lewd, unspeakable dread of defeat. He would lose the competition, he was certain that he would lose it, and the certainty grew as each day of waiting passed. He could not work, he jerked when people spoke to him. He had not slept for nights. He tried not to notice the faces of the people he passed, but he had to notice. He had always looked at people, and people looked at him as they always did. He wanted to shout at them and tell them to turn away, to leave him alone. They were staring at him, he thought, because he was to fail, and they knew it. Close quote. Why is Keating so frightened? He tells himself that his fear is only for the practical consequences. But his career does not actually hang in the balance of this competition. It would not really be a disgrace if he didn't win, not the kind of disgrace Keating is projecting. Keating's terror, in fact, is metaphysical, not immediate and practical. His whole life has lived over an abyss, the abyss of being found out. Any failure, he feels, can give him away. Any rejection will unmask his essential emptiness. What is it that really terrifies him? Other people's condemnation? No, his agreement with them. Keating does have his better moments, his moments of sovereign perception and judgment, such as are evidenced in his appreciation of Rourke. But these moments are his exceptions. He invariably betrays them in action because they clash with the social value system which he dares not challenge and to which he is enslaved. It is not that sovereign moments are impossible to him or to his type, but that social metaphysics forbids him to remain loyal to such moments and to make them the rule of his existence. Now, not all members of his type are necessarily as socially aggressive as Peter Keating. They may not, as he does, aspire to rise to the tops of their professions. They may just want to be an officer at their golf club or lead the ladies' knitting circle or be accepted into the ladies' knitting circle or be the first fellow in the gang to knife a schoolmate. <laughs> what is the essential of this type. It is the desperate need to conform to the values of a specific culture or subculture and to be accepted by the representatives of that culture or subculture. That is the foundation of their neurotic self-appraisal. Today, as you know, it has become very fashionable to denounce this type of conformity. Today, indeed, only a non-conformist would dare not to denounce conformity. The psychological profession has been very ardent in these denunciations. The meaning of most of it, however, is only that one group of Peter Keatings is sore at another group of Peter Keatings for conforming to something other than what the first group would like them to conform to. Now, I said that this type of obvious conformist is only the most obvious type of social metaphysician. What other routes can social metaphysics take? In order to understand, I have to remind you of a very important issue covered in last week's lecture. You will remember my discussion of this, that when a person betrays the rational requirements of self-esteem, he forms a pseudo-self-esteem or struggles to form it. That is, some irrational alternative standard, a standard other than rationality, that is, which, by living up to it, 
he imagines that he will be able to enjoy a sense of positive self-value. So, let us say, he bases his pseudo self-esteem on being stoical, or quote, doing the right thing, or doing one's duty, or what have you. Now, let's consider the psychology of the social metaphysician. The social metaphysician, early in life, abandons the responsibility of independent judgment, and initially, he ties his self-esteem, his pseudo self-esteem, directly to the approval of others and his ability to live up to their expectations, etc. and so forth. However, even this neurotic standard still involves a struggle at which it's possible to fail. After all, not everybody is a successful conformist. Many people are not. And all people who struggle feel that they are not. They always feel somebody else is really in. The social metaphysician knows a special kind of agonizing loneliness, which he is alone to know, no matter how popular he may be. Now then, suppose that the social metaphysician defaults on the responsibility of rationality, forms a pseudo self-esteem tied to the approval of others, but comes to feel inadequate to the task of acquiring that approval. In other words, what if he feels that he cannot live up to the standards or the expectations or the values of others? What if this new neurotic standard also is frightening to him or he feels very insecure in his ability successfully to gain the approval of others? Why then he has to form or is driven to form a secondary pseudo self-esteem to protect him against his failure with regard to the first level of pseudo self-esteem. In other words, first he has a feeling of inferiority or inadequacy because he's inadequate to reality. He tries to deal with that by gaining the approval of others and he makes that the standard by which he'll judge himself. But suppose he feels that that is a standard at which he is inept also, to which he is inadequate also. Why now then, dropping lower, dropping lower still in self-valuation, he needs now to form a secondary line of defense values, as it were, to protect him against his failure to be a successful conformist. And so you get other varieties of social metaphysics, of which one of the most socially significant is a man such as Ellsworth Toohey, the man who goes after power. Now, Ellsworth Toohey is not a conformist in the superficial sense that Keating is. Of course, he is a conformist in a deeper sense that he's not really challenging the fundamental moral values of his culture, but he's, he's cashing in on them, on their corruption. But he doesn't take the obvious path that Keating takes. Tui is a man with less authentic self-confidence than poor Peter Keating has. Tui is a man who, in effect, shares Peter Keating's fear of other people but he doesn't have Peter Keating's confidence that he too he could succeed, as it were, in the free market of social metaphysical competition. He doesn't feel that he could make it by the conventional route within his particular culture. And now I talk about the psychology of the power luster of the dictator in general, whether it be James Taggart or Adolf Hitler or Stalin or Khrushchev or people closer to home still. We deal now with an interesting species of social metaphysician. That is, the social metaphysician who is afraid of people who desperately wants their approval and their sanction, and who hates people for the fact of his own fear of them. Who feels a profound hostility, a profound hatred of people over the fact of his own humiliating fear of them his own sense of inadequacy with regard to their standards. And now we get a new direction. 
a kind of man motivated by hatred, by hostility, by destructiveness, seeking to, at the one hand, to punish, to avenge himself against, and simultaneously to harness and control those others out there of whom he is so afraid and who control that supernatural unknowable, namely reality. And so you get the Tui, a Taggart, a Hitler, a Stalin, or a Khrushchev. There's a marvelous line describing the psychology of a dictator in Galt's speech. Galt states, they, other people, are his only means of perception. And like a blind man who depends on the sight of a dog, he feels he must leash them in order to live. And that's a marvelous characterization of the psychology of the dictator or the power seeker. This is the person who feels helpless in reality, feels helpless in the position of seeking, in effect, voluntary help or approval from others, and who in order to feel secure needs to control those other consciousnesses which he dreads. Because if he can force them to obey him, if they can be coerced to act as though his ideas were true, why that for all practical purposes will make them true, since there's no such thing as an objective reality anyway. As an example of what I mean, ask yourself what is going on in the mind of the dictator who stands up on the balcony, beaming down at a spontaneous demonstration in his honor, which he knows perfectly well his own underlings arranged. And yet his enjoyment of the occasion is un undeniable. And you wonder, well, What's the nature of his pleasure when he knows how it all came about? That is only an evidence of the distance from reality of this type of social metaphysician, of how unreal is the universe in which he lives. That if they can be compelled to fake a reality for him, that's as close to reality as he will ever get. One other quotation from Galt's speech, quote, just as the mystic is a parasite in matter who expropriates the wealth created by others, just as he is a parasite in spirit who plunders the ideas created by others, so he falls below the level of a lunatic who creates his own distortion of reality to the level of a parasite of lunacy who seeks a distortion created by others." Close quote. And in that sense, the power luster is marvelously described as a parasite of lunacy who seeks a distortion created by others, who is willing to have those others coerced, who is cheerfully willing to have articles praising him, eulogies praising him, songs and hymns written to him, prepared at gunpoint, and still he smiles and basks in it, and this gives him his sense of efficacy. He is able to control those other consciousnesses and thus to gain some sense of security. some diminution of his chronic dread. And if you understand this profound alienation from reality which characterizes his type, you can realize how comparatively healthy and wholesome is a man such as Peter Keating. <laughs> By comparison, what he wants is so simple and wholesome. Now there is still another variety of social metaphysician. He doesn't work at it. He doesn't try to earn it honestly or semi-honestly like Peter Keating. He doesn't strive to earn it by charm or faking charm or faking ability. He doesn't go after power. This type very often does very little at all, in fact. And this is his claim to virtue, that he is too good for this world. And now we come to another variety. Again, rationalizing his failure to succeed on the terms prescribed by others, feeling that the world is controlled by others, but feeling inadequate to that world, he announces in effect that life on earth is too harsh, too crude, too materialistic. His acquaintances must love and respect him not for what he does, doing is so vulgar, <laughs> but for what he is. What is he? 
That is something not to be defined or communicated. If you love me, you will know. <laughs> he is a composite of dream, aspiration, and ineffable longing. He rationalizes his failure to win social approval and esteem by the declaration that no one is fine enough to appreciate the real him. Whatever he does in reality, that's not the real him. Such a type may often prefer to be alone, and so in order that he may better dream of how he would be loved and admired if only people could know what he was really like deep, deep down inside. So this man isn't necessarily an organization man. He doesn't go to parties. He doesn't tell jokes. He doesn't try to be entertaining. He doesn't try to sleep with girls. He doesn't want to make himself out to be a big shot. He's content very often just to sit alone and to fantasy that he's got the million dollars and that every woman faints when she sees him or some other variety of daydream in which he resides. And he perhaps has very few social relationships whatsoever and no concern with the world of facts whatsoever. His is a different kind of alienation from the real world, but it's an alienation nonetheless. The ultimate expression of this type of cutting loose can be observed in the religionist who can cut loose from the human race altogether and who gets his sense of social metaphysical virtue from imagining that God is looking down on him, is perceiving the true nobility of his soul, which men here are too blind and too corrupt to care about. And God is smiling and lovingly offering him protection, even though everyone here on earth is too mean to. In effect, it's God who he's trying to impress, as it were, or he's imagining that this is where he's popular. He's not popular at the country club, he couldn't make it, he couldn't get in. He's popular with God instead. This is what I mean by developing a secondary line of defense values, a secondary line of secondary type of pseudo self-esteem when the first primary social metaphysical form of pseudo self-esteem collapses. Still another variety of social metaphysician is the individual whose self-expression consists of shopping among the various subcultures available in order to decide which bandwagon to climb on, rather than accepting the first one offered. This is, for example, the adolescent who proudly, scornfully, and self-consciously rejects the value system of his respectable and conventional parents and makes himself a slave to the value system of Greenwich Village instead. Here is still another variety where this type is more in the category of a conformist, only he is simply shopping with regard to what particular value system within the given culture he will conform to. For example, the son who defiantly leaves home to join the anarchist movement because his father has suggested to him that perhaps it is time to start earning a living now that he, the son, is approaching 40. <laughs> Such an individual has no concept of independence whatever. He doesn't originate any of his own goals in any meaningful sense of that term. But he imagines himself to be self-reliant because he rejects one group in favor of conformity to another and watches out of the corner of his eye to make sure that all the other groups have noticed and are suitably impressed by the fact that he is not conforming to them. Then there is the, what I call the independent social metaphysician. This is a type psychologically akin to the psychology of the dictator, but perhaps less ambitious. This is the professional rebel, the professional antagonist, the man who is against everything and for nothing. This is the man who has no positive values of his own, but who is simply against. This is the type that, for example, will insult you on sight, lest you dare to imagine that he desires your approval. He desires nobody approval, he'll hasten to tell you. He doesn't want people to love him. He much prefers indeed that they hate him. He scorns money, marriage, jobs, baths, and haircuts, typically. This type is so uncertain of winning anyone's approval, so profoundly insecure, that he cannot bear to suffer the anxiety of waiting to see how people will react to him. He's got to insult and abuse them first. This will prove to himself that he doesn't give a damn 
And it's this that he wishes everyone clearly to understand, that he doesn't care at all what they think of him. And here again, we deal with a type of person who has no concept of objective reality, who in effect moves in a world where there's other people's whims and his whims. And his concept of independence is expressed through the notion that he'll assert his whims rather than other people's whims. Whatever other people say, he'll say the opposite. I remember once uh, giving a lecture at, uh, I believe it was CCNY several years ago. I was giving a lecture on uh, objectivism and during the question period, a young man in the back row put up his hand and he asked me the following question. He wanted to know what was the objectivist position on wearing ties. <laughs> and uh, he evidently believed that I couldn't be very much of an individualist since I appeared at the university lecture wearing a suit and a tie. And he wanted to know whether or not this represented some sort of concession <laughs> of conformism. Well, you see, if a person is backed into a position where his only concept of self-assertiveness or of independence is to be found in not wearing a tie, he's in rather bad shape. <laughs> Which may be sad, but what I asked him is why did he want to announce it publicly? Rebelliousness alone is not a proof of independence. By itself and out of context, it is a proof of nothing. The person who is merely against without being for is motivated only by hatred and by terror. He is merely a reactor to others and is as much their slave as the most abject of conformists. Only the pursuit of positive values can constitute evidence of independence. Motivation by fear and hate is not intellectual sovereignty. Remember that the fact that a man is not in step with society doesn't yet tell you anything worth knowing until you know why. After all, John Galt and Coffee Migs are both, in a manner of speaking, outside of society. Neither of them is an organization man. But they're outside of society in somewhat different directions. You can be outside of society because you are better or because you are worse, because you are higher or because you are lower, because you have superior values or because you cannot even live up to the conventional values. Now, these merely represent some of the commonest, easiest to find varieties of social metaphysics. And I want to emphasize that this is not meant as an ironclad classification. In other words, you can find an individual who will have attributes from several of these types. These are abstractions which represent the essence of various social metaphysical attitudes, but the given person can combine traits, as I say, from several of these different classifications. I want to talk finally about what I call the good social metaphysician. Well, what is the good social metaphysician? This is the person who, first of all, has preserved some significant extent of intellectual independence, although a limited independence, because he is still a social metaphysician. He is not on the premise of exclusive reliance upon his own mind, certainly not in issues of basic values, but who is not merely a passive parasitical follower. In other words, a person who may be hardworking, who may be productive, who may be conscientious, who may achieve and produce things of genuine merit or importance, and who may struggle very unhappily against his own social metaphysical fear and dependence, which he doesn't understand. In other words, he can be aware of his humiliating fear of others, his humiliating concern with their approval. He may struggle desperately and conscientiously against it. He may give in to it very little. He may try to earn 
any appreciation or admiration which anybody gives him, he may be very much opposed to and uh, inimical to the idea of getting an unearned or unwarranted admiration or appreciation from others, who does try to win their esteem at least by producing something of real value or being a person of real value at least in some respects. Nonetheless, such a person is committed to a policy of dependence within the sphere of basic values. He is not questioning the fundamental values that guide his life. He is on the premise, implicitly of course, that these are to be provided and prescribed by others. And not identifying this policy, he is not in a position to change his social metaphysical psychology since it can only be changed by independent thinking fundamentally on the issue of values and who can struggle very miserably for many years against his humiliating state and this as I say represents the better type of shall I say semi honest or semi decent person who would not be going after the unearned in any of the obvious ways in the foregoing examples, evidence, or exemplified in the foregoing examples of, let us say, Keating or Tui or the other types that we discussed. Now, when we turn to the state of modern psychology, we observe a very remarkable thing, and that is that the great majority of psychological theorists regard the state which I describe as social metaphysics in effect as man's normal condition. They don't of course have the term social metaphysics which I originated, but I mean that state of relationship to reality and other men is in their view not a disease but a description of human nature. They would say in effect, well of course self-esteem depends on whether one is loved or not loved by others. On what else could it possibly depend? Of course our sense of personal worth is a function of our human relationships. What else could it be a function of? And this view, with minor unimportant differences, can be found in Freud, it can be found in Karen Horney, it can be found in Harry Stack Sullivan, it can be found in Eric Fromm, it can be found in the great majority of the psychologists who have expressed a viewpoint on this subject one way or the other. Let me remind you, for example, of Freud's concept of the id, the ego, and the superego, which is so central to the theory of psychoanalysis. The id, according to Freud, represents your inherited instinctual impulses or drives, your amoral, illogical wishes. Then your is your ego, which roughly approximates the concept of an organ whose function it is to perceive reality, and your superego, the repository of your moral judgments or your moral values, which are what? Well, moral injunctions absorb from parents or teachers or their surrogates. You absorb all notions of morality or right or wrong from the authorities in your childhood, specifically the parents. And then Freud more or less sees uh, man's psychological life is a battlefield between the superego, the ego, and the id, or a battlefield that might be described between the I wish, the id, the it is, the ego, and the they say, the superego. And of course, very significantly, the weakest contestant in this battle is, guess who? Of course, as you all know, it's man's ego, that poor, frail, little reasoning organ which is there to remind man as best it can, now and again, when it can, that after all, there is reality out there, and one should attempt some sort of rapprochement or meeting ground or deal between your ego and your superego, its conflicting claims, and let us throw a bone to objective reality too, when and as we can, which, as Freud tells us, is not too often. Perhaps the most extreme presentation of social metaphysics as a theory of human nature is in the very influential writings of the psychiatrist Harry Stack Sullivan. 
claims that man is motivated primarily by only two motives. One, the desire for the satisfaction of his bodily or physical needs, and two, the desire for what he calls security, which consists of avoiding the disapproval of anyone to whom one attaches importance. These are the two basic motives, satisfaction of your bodily needs and avoiding the disapproval of anyone to whom you attach importance, the significant others, to use the famous phrase. Now, why must man avoid the disapproval of those significant others? You might be naive enough or rational enough to ask Sullivan. And the answer is ultimately because it is they who will take care of him and provide him with the satisfaction of those physical needs. Sullivan speaks of the self as a, quote, organization of successful tricks, mostly linguistic, by which we conciliate others and get as much satisfaction as we can. If one would read modern psychological textbooks, one would have the overwhelming impression that love and not reason is man's basic tool of survival. And of course, the, aside from the fact that this theory is wrong, it's disastrous practically when you consider that the great majority of the people who seek the help of a psychotherapist are social metaphysicians. Not all, but the great majority. And to be advised and, gu and guided by a person who in effect shares their ultimate frame of reference, imposes rather strict limitations on the extent of the help he can offer, one can safely say. Now, we must ungraciously ask ourselves, if only for a moment, why would modern psychology, why would modern psychology view man in this manner? And the answer we may wish to say must lie at least in part in the fact that since the majority of men are social metaphysicians to a greater or lesser extent, that is the kind of person who the psychologist and the psychotherapist meets presumably more than any other. Is this a satisfactory answer? Well, it can be, because it leads us to a rather obvious next question. When the psychologist or the psychiatrist is observing this phenomenon, he's got to pass judgment, healthy or unhealthy. Is this uh, the way human nature is actually constituted, or is this a disease? Well, what obvious factor will be very relevant in how he answers that question? Clearly, whether or not he regards the patient's basic social metaphysical frame of reference as something very strange to him indeed, something flagrantly out of step with reality, or whether it's a condition with which he feels very much at home. Whether in effect he feels, yes, that is the way things are. And if he can see the kind of phenomena which I have been discussing here and regard this as within the sphere of the normal, it's difficult to think how this could come about if not because it felt normal to him. Because a man of sovereign consciousness would have great difficulty in even understanding the social metaphysicist's frame of reference. It would be quite a feat of abstraction even to arrive at an understanding of that perspective on reality. If the psychotherapist's heart just goes out to it the first time he encounters and never bothers him to ask, is this really the way things are or is this perhaps part of the illness? I leave it to you what explanation there can be if not that he's too familiar by introspection with the disease which he's being hired to cure. If we look back over this evening's lecture and over last week's lecture, we can observe variations on a very important theme. There is a very important statement in Galt's speech about which one could write a book or indeed several books. And Galt's speech for that matter is filled with very, very profound and significant statements whose meaning is indicated only in a very general way, but where there's a tremendous amount of very worthwhile work for other people to do on considering the implications of many of the observations and the principles observed or laid down here. And one of the most important psychologically is Galt's statement to the effect that all the root of all the human evils and ills which people exhibit is men's desire to escape from the responsibility of a volitional consciousness. This is one of the most truly pregnant and significant observations in the speech, certainly within the sphere of psychology. 
the extent to which the root of all evil, psychologically so to speak, and morally, is the desire to escape from the responsibility of a volitional consciousness. And we can see in how many ways this operates in our discussion last week and again tonight. It's always the quest, always the attempt to escape the responsibility of thought, to escape the responsibility of judgment, to escape the fact that one is not infallible, that one has to initiate the effort of, of thought and then check one's conclusions and check again and then commit oneself to one's actions and suffer the consequences if one is wrong. It's always the escape, the effort to escape all of this, to try to exist as something other than a human being, to try to exist as something other than man, and perhaps the worst horror which the social metaphysician endures is the secret feeling that perhaps he has succeeded in making himself something other than man. Ladies and gentlemen, in the past 15 lectures I have analyzed one sphere of human activity after another to demonstrate that man must hold reason as his only guide to action in every aspect of his life. Contrary to the claims of the mystic and neo-mystic philosophers that man cannot live by reason, it is only by reason that man can live if he is to live as man. Whatever concession such philosophers may make on other issues of human existence, there is no issue on which all the forces of the anti-mind contingents have been focused with such violent intensity no issue they have so fiercely held close to the power of reason as the issue of sex. In no other issue have they succeeded so thoroughly. It is almost universally accepted that sex and reason are two separate or incompatible realms, that man's sexual life bears no relation to his intellect, that his sexual activity is independent of his thinking and impervious to logic, that his mind is impotent in the sphere of his sexual desires. It is not necessary to argue that sex is crucially important to human beings. We all know it, both by introspection and by our observation of others. We know that no other subject is of so intense a concern to people. We know that they think about sex, they dream about sex, they write novels about sex, they respond eagerly to any advertisements that offer them books, plays, movies, or scandal exposés about sex, they have nervous breakdowns over sex, they wreck their lives over sex, sometimes they even commit murders over sex. Everybody knows it, but nobody has explained why. What is the role of sex in man's life? The answer given by ancient sages, by modern philosophers, or by any man on the street is the same, whether stated in poetic metaphors, in medical language, or in crude vulgarity. They all declare, in effect, that the issue of sex is a self-evident, irreducible primary, requiring no explanation. Or they believe they have explained it by declaring that sex is an instinct, or that such is human nature. Such, of course, is human nature, but the question is, what is it in human nature that causes man's intense concern with sex? That is the question I shall discuss tonight. In spite of our modern culture's alleged enlightenment and scientific sophistication, the modern man's view of sex, like his code of morality, is in essence the same primordial view that infiltrated Western civilization from the mystic cults of the Orient. Metaphysically, that view regards man's nature as consisting of two opposite antagonistic elements of soul and body, with the soul representing some higher, nobler dimension and the body representing man's lower animal nature which belongs to this earth. Man's values according to this dichotomy pertain to his soul and are not merely unrelated to but opposed to the actions and the needs of his body. Man's body and any pleasure he may seek on earth are base and evil by nature. Therefore, man's virtue consists of renouncing any form of material concern or sensual enjoyment such as wealth, luxury, production, trade, sex. Sex has always been the focal point of every mystic's attack on man and on existence. Since sex is the most intense form of pleasure that man can experience, it was damned as the most sinful. 
It was damned as brutal, impure, unclean, evil by its very nature. Chastity, virginity, abstinence were held as virtues, the triumph of the soul over the body. Plato was the transmission belt who carried this view from the oriental mysticism of the Orphics into Western civilization and immortalized it in the concept that bears his name, Platonic love. According to Plato, real love is a pure, selfless emotion of the spirit, untainted by any trace of selfish, physical, sexual desire. And sexual desire is an animal instinct of man's body unrelated to the values of his spirit. Plato's dichotomy was accepted by St. Paul, by Augustine, and by all the philosophers of Christianity. In Christian culture, it became the concept of two different kinds of love called sacred and profane, with sacredness pertaining to the spirit and profanity to the body. With the evolution of Christianity across the centuries, this view of sex was somewhat modified. While the early Christian philosophers damned sex as such and regarded all sexual pleasure as sinful and evil, some of the later ones adopted a kind of metaphysical compromise. They held that sex is not sinful if sanctioned by marriage and if its primary purpose is procreation. Married people were told, in effect, that the sin of experiencing physical pleasure would be forgiven to them if and only if their primary motive was procreation and pleasure was only an incidental, unsought, unavoidable byproduct. This was the philosopher's reluctant concession to men's lower nature. Since very few men are able to be continent, they said, and since procreation is necessary for the continued existence of the human race, and the continued existence of the human race is necessary in order to supply God with a plentiful quantity of worshippers, sexual pleasure had to be tolerated in marriage as a necessary evil. Marriage was described as a medicine for immorality. Some Christian philosophers claimed that if Adam and Eve had not fallen from grace and had remained in the Garden of Eden, they would have engaged in sexual intercourse, but it would have been an activity absolutely devoid of any sensual enjoyment, an activity undertaken solely for the purpose of cold, calculated reproduction. Not being damned, they would have had that virtuous advantage. One of the consequences of man's damnation is that he has lost the possibility of a sexual act that would achieve procreation without bringing him any pleasure. Note this particular point. It is pleasure that made sex sinful. It is pleasure that the religionists damned as evil. Now, what was the opposition offered to that view of sex? In the history of the post-Renaissance philosophy, the only opposition to that view of the spiritualists who claim that sex is evil is the view of the materialists who claim that sex is meaningless. The materialists, the modern neo-mystics, who assert that man is a mindless automaton made of meat with conditioned reflexes, the alleged champions of sex who proclaim their desire to set men free of taboos and inhibitions, defend sex in effect in the following manner. It's not true that sex is evil because it's a brute animal function. Since man is nothing but a brute animal, it's not wrong for him to engage in a brute animal function. Why shouldn't he? All his functions are brute animal functions. The only wrong is to pretend that they're anything else. Ladies and gentlemen, is this an opposition to the mystic's doctrines or merely a deeper and uglier acceptance of the metaphysics held by the mystics, of their metaphysical view of man? the other and brassier side of the same coin. If the mystics of spirit declare that man is a swine who might have a chance to acquire some value after death, the protest of the mystics of muscle consists of declaring, sure I'm a swine, but I belong in the muck and I don't propose to bother about any values. There are many men who think that they are rebelling against a mystical religious upbringing by embarking upon a course of mindless sexual promiscuity. They think that this demonstrates their freedom from mysticism. In fact, they have conceded the mystic's basic premise, that sex is an activity devoid of any meaning, of any spiritual or psychological significance, that is, of any values. Such are the two alternatives that men have been offered, a choice between the spiritualists and the materialists, between those who believe in values without pleasure and those who believe in pleasure without values. 
The spiritualists preach that man must pursue moral values, but must not expect any pleasure from them. The materialists preach that man may pursue pleasure, but must not pretend that it involves any moral values. Both accept the fundamental premise that pleasure and values have no relation to each other. In one version or another, the Orphic, Platonic, medieval view of sex still dominates our culture. Let me quote some excerpts from medieval literature written in the late part of the 19th century by doctors who should have known better on the role of sex in human life. A 19th century surgeon writes, quote, I should say that the majority of women, happily for society, are not very much troubled with sexual feeling of any kind. To maintain the contrary, to maintain that women do find sexual pleasure, is a vile aspersion. Another 19th century medical work refers to doctors who were troubled by the fact that, in certain cases, they observed unequivocal physical indications that women were not altogether indifferent to sex. Quote, Physical signs of a woman's sexual responsiveness may be observed, but this only happens in lascivious women, or such as live luxuriously. Close quote. A famous 19th century German scientific authority writes, quote, It is an altogether false idea that a young woman has just as strong an impulse to the opposite sex as a young man. The appearance of the sexual side in the love of a young girl is pathological. Close quote. Here is a quotation from a man who is alleged to hold advanced views on sex and to be opposed to the traditional derogation of sexual activity, Sigmund Freud. Quote, Anyone who subjects himself to serious self-examination will indubitably find that at the bottom of his heart, he too regards the sex act as something degrading, which soils and contaminates not only the body. Close quote. No matter what part of these ideas modern men may have rejected, no matter how confidently men assert that they do not believe in the soul-body dichotomy, one consequence of the Orphic's doctrine still stands unchallenged, dominating our modern culture as a monument to a very ancient evil, almost as a dark primordial temple still claiming human sacrifices in the form of lives wrecked by frustration, bewilderment, and guilt. The belief accepted by the majority of men that sex is primarily a physical function. There are many different versions of this belief and many different estimates. Not all those who hold it share the extreme materialist appraisal, which may be called brute animalism. Some people hold that sex is an animal function, but that there's nothing wrong in being an animal. In fact, it's natural or wholesome or even beautiful. Such views range from the glass of water school that regards sex as a natural physical function fulfilling a physical need of no greater significance than drinking a glass of water when one is thirsty, to the animal glamour school that regards the primitive, the instinctual, the earthy as romantic, passionate and colorful in opposition to the intellectual and the civilized which it regards as cold, effete and dull. The school whose view of sex is best exemplified by Hollywood versions of the South Sea natives or by current Italian movies about barefoot peasant girls. There are people who try to allow some place or influence to romantic love in the issue of sex in some undefined manner, which amounts to the belief that sex is physical but that a good man combines it somehow with spiritual emotions of love while a man who is less good does not but indulges in physical promiscuity unrelated to his mind or values or emotions. These various attitudes differ not in their metaphysical view of sex, but only in their estimates. They range in effect from the belief that sex belongs in the gutter to the belief which transfers it to the jungle, then transfers it to the bathroom, then transfers it to the bedroom of a vine-covered cottage. But the place from which sex is barred by their united front is the study. That man's mind, reason, and logic have no connection whatever with his sex life is the absolute they all hold in common. Reason they hold is an alien to sex, either an impotent alien defeated by the power of irrational passion, or a destructive alien whose cold hand kills the joy that only a mindless body can experience. As one modern writer puts it, quote, the amorous choice is not a rational act and one may rightly feel suspicious that where choice is rational, there is probably no love, close quote. Or writes another, quote, the moment one is able to say because, one is no longer under the spell, close quote. 
Now, as we shall proceed to examine the issue, let me state at the outset that, speaking metaphorically, a man's sex life is determined precisely by the hours he has spent or failed to spend in his study, by which I mean by the thinking he has done or has failed to do. Like any other activity, only if possible more so than any other activity, a man's sex life is determined by his premises, held consciously or subconsciously. And the grim joke on the mystics of both schools is that of all the aspects of man's life, sex is the most philosophical, though not in the way that they would project it. Sex is the sum, the expression, and often the nemesis of the kind of philosophy a man has chosen to accept. It is the one realm where premises most inexorably will out. To quote Francisco d'Anconia, tell me what a man finds sexually attractive and I will tell you his entire philosophy of life. Show me the woman he sleeps with and I will tell you his valuation of himself. This is what I propose to demonstrate and to explain. Now, let us start by examining the question, is sex primarily a physical function? Obviously, the capacity to experience sexual pleasure is physical in the sense that man's body possesses the appropriate nerves and organs, which are the necessary tools of that experience. But this is not the point at issue. The point is whether man's sexual apparatus is an autonomous machine that runs itself by its own will, or whether it is a tool, a machine run by man's mind, and if this lasts, then how, in what manner? The physicalistic view holds that sex is a purely physical phenomenon, a biological function that acts independently of a man's philosophy, of his moral values or his intellectual pursuits. According to this view, sex is merely the need of the experience of a physical pleasure that involves nothing but physical stimulation. A man's sexual desires, preferences and practices are determined by his body and bear no relation to his ideas or the rest of his character. If this were true, then the first unanswerable problem would be, what is the nature of the need for a partner? Why does one want to sleep with somebody? Why does one prefer heterosexual intercourse to autoeroticism or masturbation? It cannot be argued that this preference is caused by differences in physical sensations, because if we consider nothing but the physical stimulation given nerve endings, it is surely possible to duplicate to a high degree the literal nervous messages sent along the nervous system. It is not one's body that would know the difference. A few years ago, I had a male patient who held the Don Juan attitude towards sex. He insisted that sex had no particular spiritual meaning in his life, that it was simply a matter of physical release, and, as far as he was concerned, any available woman would do for that purpose. He insisted that the issue had no wider psychological significance and that nothing could be inferred from his, about his character from the nature of his particular sexual choices. I said to him, suppose that you were provided with a life-size rubber doll constructed as an exact replica of a woman so that your senses would not be aware of any perceptible difference. Would you give up sleeping with women and content yourself with obtaining your physical satisfaction from this doll for the rest of your life? He drew back and answered, God, no. So I asked, why not? He answered, because in sex you want a partner. Well, I asked him why this doll would not do for a partner since it would resemble a woman in every way. He answered, yes, but in sex you want a consciousness, not just an inanimate body. It's interesting, I said. You want a consciousness and simultaneously you maintain that this is merely an issue of physical release. What does your body know or care about a consciousness? What difference would that make to your nerve cells? Your mind knows the difference, but your mind, by your theory, plays no part in your sexual activity. At this point, he conceded that more was involved than he had hitherto acknowledged. When you are considering the validity of any theory, remember an elementary rule of scientific epistemology. To be valid, a theory must incorporate all and contradict none of the evidence relevant to the subject under consideration. And there are a great many phenomena that cannot be incorporated or explained by a physicalistic theory of sex. The first is the desire for a partner. The second is the preference exhibited by every human being for one kind of partner over another. There is no man who does not possess some sort of sexual standard. The standards may be very crude and primitive, they may embrace a very wide, seemingly indiscriminate range, but every man draws the line somewhere. 
There is no man of whom it is not true that there is some woman he would prefer not to. Once we observe the universal phenomenon of sexual preferences, once we know that a man derives an intense pleasure from sleeping with one person, but not from sleeping with another, we know that the key to the difference lies in the spiritual or psychological realm, that is, in man's consciousness, not in his body. Because the physical motions involved are the same, and the stimulation of nerve cells are the same, regardless of partner. If one sexual relationship produces boredom or shame, and another the purest, most intense kind of pleasure, the difference lies in the realm of human psychology, not in the realm of physiology. Now, as in most issues, there exists a middle-of-the-road kind of theory of sex, the semi-physical theory, which holds that sex is not an autonomously physical issue of the body, that man's consciousness and values are involved, but that such values pertain only to the body and that one's preferences are directed by one's standards of physical beauty alone, proving, therefore, that the body is one's only concern in sex and that moral or intellectual issues or values are irrelevant. The example usually given to illustrate this theory is an experience shared by most men at one time or another of the following kind. Walking down the street, a man sees a very beautiful woman. Knowing nothing about her, with no thought and no time to think of her character, he feels an immediate sexual desire. To the best of his conscious introspective knowledge, her beautiful body was the only source and inspiration of his desires. The question to ask in such a case is, suppose the man approached her, became acquainted and discovered that she is a vicious murderess just released from jail, or a woman who can barely connect two sensible phrases, would his sexual desire remain unchanged? Any semi-competent introspector would admit that his desire would vanish. I doubt whether there is a man or a woman who has not had an actual experience of this same category. The experience of feeling a romantic sexual attraction to a good-looking member of the opposite sex, which vanished on closer acquaintance when one became disappointed in that person's character or intelligence. The good looks did not change, but the attraction vanished. Who hasn't had the experience, for example, of coming to a party, seeing across the room a good-looking member of the opposite sex, feeling a spark of interest, walking over to this person, and then the person opens his or her mouth, and one's feeling vanished. The question to ask in all such cases is, what is the meaning of man's response to physical beauty? Observe that people differ in their standards of beauty and in the kind of type they find physically attractive. One's response to a person's physical appearance depends on the kind of qualities of character that that appearance suggests to us. The suggestion may be valid or accidental. It may be the result of observation or of chance association. But in either case, it is character that one perceives or imagines oneself to be perceiving when one feels attracted to a certain type of physical experience. Human beings form their estimates of romantic values early in life, usually in their teens. Qualities of character are hard to define and to identify then or later. But the values of physical appearance are the easiest to perceive and to appraise. Since most people do not identify their standard of moral values and do not know consciously what character traits they value or why, their romantic estimates remain on the primitive associational level of adolescence. But whenever a man responds to a woman's physical beauty, what he is seeing is the abstraction woman. And what his subconscious is doing is endowing that abstraction with the particular qualities of character, the particular values he seeks in a woman. He seeks them only by means of his own undefined, unidentified emotional response, which he should but may never identify in conscious terms. Whenever you are attracted to a girl's pretty face, it is not villainy that you expect to find in that girl. Ask yourself what it is that you do expect to find, and you may get a clue to your actual romantic standards. As further proof of the fact that the romantic appeal of physical beauty is symbolic rather than actual, observe the fact that many women who possess a perfect physical beauty but lack character, whose personality is flat, lifeless, and distinguished, do not arouse masculine desire and are considered to lack sex appeal. On the other hand, women who are much less beautiful and sometimes actually homely often possess an enormous sex appeal. Consider the meaning of the concept of sex appeal. 
Few people realize that the concept is a blatant denial of the physicalistic view of sex or of the view which attributes sexual attraction to physical appearance. Sex appeal means a special quality of character, an attribute of personality. Most people say that it is an undefinable quality, an undefinable something. But most people say that about any complex emotion. Physical beauty as such is a human value, but it is far from being the crucial or the determining value in sexual attraction. Now observe another point. If a man were to make a declaration of platonic love to a woman, if he were to tell her that he adores her emotionally, but that she does not arouse any sexual desire in him, she would not believe his love, and she would feel profoundly hurt, offended, insulted. The same would be true of a man if he heard a similar declaration from a woman. Very few people are willing to accept the idea that romantic love can be divorced from any element of sexual desire, yet these same people are willing to believe that sexual desire can exist without any element of love or spiritual evaluation. Sexual desire and sexual emotion are determined by a person's premises, just like any other human desire or emotion. The body cannot desire. Only you can desire. And just as any other mental evaluation that produces an emotion can produce physical consequences in your body, as, for instance, an evaluation of danger can make your heart beat faster and can increase the supply of adrenaline, so certain kinds of mental evaluations can produce a feeling of sexual desire, but that feeling is no more generated by the body than any other emotion is generated by the body. Your body is only your tool. Your consciousness is the generator of the values and purposes for which you choose to employ that tool. Before we proceed to discuss the specific values involved in the issue of sex, let me remind you of the metaphysical meaning of pleasure in human life. Pleasure is man's emotional response to that which achieves, supports, or furthers his values. Suffering is his emotional response to that which threatens, injures, or destroys them. Since success in achieving his values is the basic metaphysical necessity of man's survival, the experience of pleasure is the emotional proof and confirmation of his ability to deal with existence, which means of his fitness to exist. Thus, pleasure and self-esteem are interacting corollaries in man's consciousness. Self-esteem, the confident sense of one's own ability to deal with existence, is in itself the most profound pleasure a man can experience and the root of all the others. Every experience of pleasure, major or minor, carries with it a sense of one's own efficacy, of success in achieving the desired or desirable, of success in dealing with reality. An expression or reaffirmation of self-esteem, or to state it more precisely, a sense of efficacy is the form of inner awareness which gives man the emotional reality of his own self-esteem. Action and values are inseparable corollaries in man's life. Values to be gained or kept require action. Action is motivated, consciously or subconsciously, by the purpose of achieving or preserving a value. In relation to his values, man's actions fall into two basic categories, production and consumption. The actions he takes to achieve a value and the actions he takes to use it. The simplest example is the process of attaining food. First, man plants and grows a harvest of wheat and transforms that wheat into bread, which is a series of actions taken to produce a value. Then he eats the bread, which is the action of consuming the value. This is the basic pattern of his activity in relation to values, no matter how complex the actions and values involve. There is a hierarchical relationship among all of man's values. That is, the value which is the end of one action becomes the means for the achievement of another wider value. As for instance, the consumption of bread is the end or goal of the activity of farming. But that consumption is the means of achieving a wider value, one survival. Ultimately, all of man's activity, both production and consumption, has two basic final goals, two values which are not means to further him, but are ends in themselves. The maintenance of his life and its enjoyment. This basic pattern of man's actions and existence has a corresponding pattern of actions within his consciousness. The activity of his consciousness also falls into two basic categories, two functions which constitute the production and the consumption of values, namely thought and emotion. In terms of consciousness, thinking is the activity of perceiving, identifying, and choosing values. 
emotion is the activity of using them, of experiencing their meaning in relation to oneself. For instance, thinking is required to gain the knowledge, choose the standard, and identify the value of art. The emotion of pleasure which one experiences when one views a great work of art is one's use, that is, one's consumption, of the value made possible by one's thinking. A man who never chose to rise above the value level of a brute would not experience that pleasure. The fundamental principle in both realms of man's activity, in existence and in consciousness, is that all activity of production must result in a corresponding activity of consumption. Any significant discrepancy between these two activities leads to frustration and suffering. Since man is an integrated unit, and since all of his values and actions are interrelated, both functions of his consciousness, thought and emotion, are involved in all of his activities. He experiences emotional pleasure in the process of productive work, and his thinking is involved in any act of consuming. There can be no totally emotionless production or totally mindless consumption. The difference between these two activities, then, is a difference in the focus of his concern. In productive activity, his concern is centered on his work. In consumption activity, his concern is centered on himself, on his own enjoyment. Production is the process of achieving a future value. Consumption is the enjoyment of a value already achieved. Now, in regard to man's simpler, short-range values, the relationship between the activity of production and the activity of consumption is simple and direct, such as the growing and eating of food or the making and wearing of clothes. But in regard to his wider, more intellectual, more abstract values, man has a problem. What is the form of consumption commensurate with the achievement of his great, crucial, long-range values? Psychologically, the pleasure of production is an emotional state accompanying a process of action and reality. But the pleasure of consumption is a positive emotional state, a state existing only inside his own consciousness, with no corresponding action or expression in reality. Where his minor values are concerned, a passive state of rest and satisfied contemplation is an appropriate and sufficient acknowledgement of a minor achievement. But in regard to his major values, in regard to achievements of crucial importance, man feels an intense desire to express his emotional consumption, his victory, his success, his happiness, in action. This desire comes from the need to give an objective form to his happiness, to bring it into reality, not to let it remain a private, subjective state, but to make it objectively real. All of you know the experience of saying or feeling, I'm so happy I don't know what to do about it, or I'm so happy I wish I could do something about it. This desire for action comes from the need to balance production and consumption, to bring one's consumption up to a level commensurate with the importance of the value achieved. Since values and action are so crucially interrelated, a value achieved by action and in objective reality demands consumption in action and in objective reality. A great achievement rewarded by nothing but the state of one's own inner consciousness is a frustration. It is in the metaphysical nature of a consciousness, any consciousness, to seek to express its efficacy, its power, its values outside in existence, in reality. This need, the need to objectify one's enjoyment, is filled, is answered by the concept of celebration. What is a celebration? A celebration is an action undertaken, not as a means to an end, but as an end in itself. Not for the purpose of achieving a value in the future, but for the purpose of giving an objective expression to the enjoyment of a value achieved in the past, most often, but not necessarily in the immediate past. A wedding is a celebration. A birthday party is a celebration. A party in honor of the achievements of a distinguished guest is a celebration. The 4th of July is a national celebration. That typically American holiday, Thanksgiving Day, captures the essence of the celebration. A holiday to celebrate the successful completion of a harvest. Every celebration is an act objectifying the pleasure of consumption after the successful production of a major value. Now I will remind you that man is a being of self-made soul, that of all the values he has to achieve by his own effort, the greatest and most crucial one is himself. 
but the achievement which makes all his other achievements possible is the creating of his own moral character, the achievement of the values proper to a rational being in his own person. This is the hardest and in its perfect state the rarest of all of man's productive achievements, and as such it requires the greatest kind of consumption pleasure and the most intense form of enjoyment and celebration of it. A celebration which a man would desire the more passionately, the greater the value he has made of himself. What form of consumption pleasure and of celebration is open to man to objectify the value of his own person? That consumption pleasure is love, its celebration is sex. That is, the values of character, the values man achieves in his own person, are the most important values to any man, consciously or subconsciously, no matter what moral standard he has accepted, because they determine all his other values and control his emotional responses. One cannot appraise anything as of value without knowing of value to whom. That which a man values in a human being determines what he will value in all realms and aspects of existence. The pleasure that a man derives from human values consists in essence of two emotions, pride and admiration. The pleasure of pride is his emotional response, his consumption, in answer to his own achievements and to the values he has created in his own character. The pleasure of admiration is his emotional response, his consumption, in answer to the achievements of others and to the values others have created in their own character. Romantic love is the highest union of these two emotions, the greatest emotional tribute that man can offer to himself and to the person he loves. It is an expression of his own pride and of his admiration for the loved one. It is an emotion that declares in effect, I, who am a great value, recognize the greatness which is you. It has been said that romantic love involves one's whole soul. This is true in a much more solemn manner than those who say it usually realize. Romantic love is the self-assertion of one's self-esteem, the emotional means of giving objective reality to one's own value. It is a declaration that one has achieved the capacity to value and to be valued, that one is able to admire and worthy of being admired. This is the meaning of Rourke's statement, before one can say I love you, one must be able to say the I. Since virtually no man is totally devoid of some part or remnant of authentic self-esteem, this is the cause of the universal desire for romantic love. It is the desire to objectify the value of one's own person. But since most men's value premises are a mass of semi-conscious evasions and contradictions, so is the course, the errors, and the tragedies of their love life. One falls in love with the person who embodies the same values of character that one esteems in oneself. Not the superficial values, not such nonsense as a sense of humor or she's fun to be with, not any common tastes in dance bands, automobiles, or restaurants, and not any values to which one may choose to pay lip service, but the most essential and metaphysical values of one's actual view of existence. It is one's view of existence that determines one's self-esteem one's sense of efficacy in dealing with reality. It is that view which determines one's estimate of oneself and of others. One falls in love with the person who appraises existence by the same standard and sees it in the same terms. Emotionally, one experiences it as a feeling that says in effect, she or he faces life as I do. No, one does not fall in love by conscious, rational calculation. It is the lightning calculator of one's subconscious emotional mechanism that does the calculating and makes one respond when one meets the person who is one's actual soulmate in this deepest metaphysical sense. Not the mate of whatever pretenses one might hold about oneself, but the mate of one's actual soul. In a rational person, there is no conflict between his conscious convictions and his subconscious values, and he falls in love with the person who represents his conscious values. In a neurotic, it is his subconscious values that direct this choice. In both cases, however, as with all other emotions, it is still one's mind that ultimately determines one's values. The thinking one has done or has failed to do. The consumption pleasure of romantic love is that it makes man experience emotionally the objectivity of his own value and the confirmation of his view of existence. 
So crucial a pleasure requires action to express it. It requires a form of celebration. That form of celebration is sex. The values celebrated in sex are the value of oneself and the value of existence. To a person of full self-esteem, it is a celebration of his own pride and his own efficacy in dealing with the benevolent universe. That is, a universe where man can achieve his values and his happiness by the efficacy of his own effort. What is the unique nature of sexual enjoyment? First, it is the most intense of all human pleasures. There are other pleasures that can last longer across time, but none that is comparable in strength and intensity. Second, it is a pleasure not of the body alone or of the mind alone, but of the person, of the total entity. The pleasure of eating or of swimming is essentially physical, it is a pleasure of the body. The enjoyment of productive work or of witnessing an artistic performance is intellectual, it is a pleasure of the mind. But sexual enjoyment is a pleasure of both. It unites man's mind and body, it integrates sensations, emotions, values and thought. It offers man the most intense form of experiencing his own total being, of experiencing his deepest and most intimate sense of his own self. The sex act invokes and necessitates the most profound and sweeping physical and spiritual involvement. Everyone knows this introspectively, including the man who, feeling guilty over the act or over his specific choice of partner, retreats into emotionless impersonality the moment afterward and dismisses the experience as meaningless, physiological, and devoid of any value, significance, whatever. The intensity of any emotion that man experiences is determined by the importance of the values involved. Since sex involves the most cardinal of all human values, it is sex that gives man the most intense pleasure, and it is the subject of sex that arouses the most intense human passions. I have said that in the hierarchical relationship of human values, most values serve as means to further ends, and that the two ultimate ends are the maintenance of man's life and its enjoyment. It isn't sex in the union of self-esteem, of efficacy, and enjoyment that man experiences the reality of this fact, the ultimate meaning of his life and his effort. It is in sex that man experiences the fact of being an end in himself and the feeling that the purpose of life is his own enjoyment. It is in sex that he escapes from any malevolent feeling of life's futility, drudgery, and senseless servitude to incomprehensible ends, which most people experience too often. Sex is the highest form of selfishness in the noblest sense of that word. And this is the reason why all mystics damn sex and why they have to destroy sexual enjoyment in order to destroy man. To damn man's right to pleasure is to damn his self-esteem. To damn his self-esteem is to damn his soul, his essence, and his life. Such is the nature of the mystic's morality. All the ugliness, corruptions, and perversions of sex which the mystics love to denounce are caused at root by a man's acceptance of any part of the mystic's morality. Again, to quote Francisco d'Anconia, quote, only the man who extols the purity of a love devoid of desire is capable of the depravity of a desire devoid of love, close quote. To a rational man, meaning of this connection, to a healthy man, to a man possessing self-esteem, sex is an expression, an effect of his self-esteem. To an irrational man, it is an attempt to reverse cause and effect and to acquire an illusion of self-esteem through his sexual experience. A rational man's attitude in effect is, I am good and life is good, therefore I am loved and I am able to experience pleasure. An irrational man's attitude in essence is, if I am able to experience pleasure and if someone will love me, that will prove that I am not worthless and that life is not a state of agonizing terror. For the man who possesses self-esteem, the sex act is the expression of his own sense of efficacy, of his sense of self-value, of his will to live. For the man who lacks self-esteem, the sex act is a desperate reaching for the illusion of an efficacy he does not possess. It is the attempt to reverse the law of cause and effect, and by performing the act of a celebration to induce the feeling that he has something to celebrate that he has achieved the state of fitness for life and that life is a value to him. The majority of those who lack self-esteem or lack it to a significant degree are still physically capable of performing the sex act, though often incompetently, infrequently, and with far from full enjoyment. 
but such enjoyment as they do achieve is most commonly of the literal moment only. What they feel afterwards, sometimes consciously in words, sometimes as only a numb sensation, is a sense of futility, of frustration, of sadness, of disgust, of shame, of guilt. To such men, sex is a narcotic, a momentary sensation in which to drown their inadequacy and their fear of life. To the man of self-esteem, the enjoyment of sex is an end in itself. What he seeks as his final goal is that literal experience of pleasure, the pleasure he has earned by the values of his character and wishes to experience for its own sake, for the immediate enjoyment of his body and consciousness. But to the man who lacks self-esteem, pleasure is not an end in itself. In the most literal sense of the word, it is not pleasure that he seeks. Sex to him is not an end in itself, but an erotic means to an end. What is his motive and goal in sex? To persuade himself, by means of the response of his partner, that he is worthy of being desired. To persuade himself, by means of any physical sensation of pleasure he can achieve, that he is worthy of experiencing pleasure. To persuade himself that he is masculine. To persuade himself that he is virile. To persuade himself that he is as capable of seducing a woman as any of his friends. To persuade himself that life is not a danger and a threat, that he too is fit to exist, that he is not a helpless alien in a universe where fulfillment is impossible to him. If it is a woman, to persuade herself by means of a man's desire for her that she is objectively worthy of being desired, to persuade herself that she is worthy of experiencing enjoyment, to persuade herself that she is as healthy and normal as any other woman, to persuade herself that she is feminine, to persuade the man to go on caring for and protecting her. This attempted reversal of cause and effect, this use of pleasure as an erotic means to an end, is not restricted to sex. The same principle may be observed in an erotic's pursuit of other pleasures as well. The man who gives a party, not because he has anything to celebrate, but as a substitute for having something to celebrate, not as an expression of happiness, but as a means of escaping boredom, the woman who wants a mink coat, not for the pleasure and comfort of wearing it, but for the social metaphysical satisfaction of impressing her friends. The playboy who runs from nightclubs to yacht cruises in order to persuade himself that he hasn't a care in the world, in order to evade the knowledge that he's a restlessly worthless bum. The husband who conscientiously takes his wife dancing every weekend in order to conceal from her and from himself that they bore each other to death and that their marriage is a failure. These are people who go through the motions of pursuing pleasure but are incapable of achieving it. Such people are often described as pleasure chasers, but the truth is that pleasure is precisely what they are not chasing. What they are chasing but cannot attain by the means they have chosen is their betrayed self-esteem and their sense of a benevolent universe, that is, of a universe in which happiness and fulfillment are possible to them. It is a man's view of himself and of existence that will determine what he seeks from the act of sex. And what he seeks from the act of sex will determine what kind of partner he will choose. This leads us to the meaning of Francisco's statement, tell me what a man finds sexually attractive and I will tell you his entire philosophy of life. Consider first of all the case of Hank Reardon and Atlas Shrugged. Reardon is a man fully possessed of self-esteem and fully in love with life, but he is a man who has made a tragic error that of believing that his sexual desires bear no relation to his spiritual values. Because Reardon is a man of such great self-esteem, and because he is so profoundly psychologically healthy, he is unable to damn sex completely, unable really to believe that it is evil, and unable therefore to resist his passion for Dagny Taggart, the greatest woman he has ever met. His tragedy is that he does attempt to damn himself for his desire for Dagny, and the story shows the gradual steps by which he learns the actual meaning of sex and the philosophical source of his own desires. You will remember the scene in Reardon's office when Reardon comes, finally and fully, to perceive the nature of his error. He remembers the day when he had met Dagny for the first time. He had never seen her before. He knew only that she was reputed to be the mind that was holding Taggart Transcontinental together, the one person of real ability who was maintaining the railroad almost single-handedly. His first appointment with her was at a railroad siding. When Reardon arrived there, he saw a young, slim woman in a gray suit standing on top of a flat car, 
proudly, happily, and confidently, pointing off in the distance and giving instructions concerning the work. Britton looked at her. He did not know who she was. No thought of sex was in his mind. He was surrendered to a moment of pure ascetic appreciation and enjoyment at a lovely sight with no thought or connection to himself. Then he asked a passerby who the young woman was and was told, Dagny Taggart. In the next instant, faster than any thought could take shape in words, Reardon felt a sudden, sweeping, and violent desire, the most intense desire he had ever experienced. What created that desire? It was the lightning calculator of Rudin's subconscious, summing up the inexorable logic of his deepest premises, integrating the sight of this woman, the implications of her manner and posture, and the kind of mind and character that Dagny was said to possess, leading to the knowledge that this was his spiritual mate, the woman he had not known he had been seeking all his life, the woman who faced existence as he faced it and embodied the same values. It was an answer to this knowledge that Reardon's body and emotions responded. Remembering that day, and now clearly seeing its meaning, Reardon drops the chains of the self-torture he had been enduring, and he thinks, quote, I damn the fact that my mind and body were a unit, and that my body responded to the values of my mind. I damn the fact that joy is the core of existence, the motive power of every living being, that it is the need of one's body as it is the goal of one's spirit, that my body was not a weight of inanimate muscle, but an instrument able to give me an experience of superlative joy to unite my flesh and my spirit. That capacity, which I damned as shameful, had left me indifferent to sluts, but gave me my one desire in answer to a woman's greatness. That desire, which I damned as obscene, did not come from the sight of her body, but from the knowledge that the lovely form I saw did express the spirit I was seeing. It was not her body that I wanted, but her person. It was not the girl in grey that I had to possess, but the woman who ran the railroad. Close quote. The qualities that Reardon finds sexually inspiring are pride, self-confidence, intelligence. Yet these are the very qualities that many men would find most incompatible with feminine sex appeal. Would any of you care to claim that it tells one nothing about a man's character, whether he finds these qualities romantically attractive or romantically paralyzing? If for Reardon, sex is an act of self-celebration, the expression of an actual self-esteem, he necessarily would desire the highest woman he could find, the woman most like himself, the woman capable of knowing and of being equal to the values he wishes to celebrate. A woman without mind, character, or values, a woman without self-esteem, could not offer Reardon the experience he wanted, as she could not offer it to any man of authentic self-value. Her surrender could mean nothing to such a man if he knew that she equally well could have surrendered to a far lesser man. Her desire for him could mean nothing if he knew that she regarded sex as a meaningless act of animal self-indulgence. For the same reason, a woman such as Dagny would always desire a hero. She, or any woman of comparable self-esteem, would regard it as a humiliating self-degradation and as a contradiction of that which she desired from sex to sleep with a man she regarded as her inferior a man who could not feel the meaning of this act as she felt it, and was unequal to the values she sought to express. But there are women for whom respect and admiration are not the preconditions of sexual desire, but the enemy of sexual desire. There are women who can feel desire only when they can also feel some element of contempt. Would any of you care to claim that this tells one nothing about a woman's character and values? Now, when a man such as Reardon discovers the philosophical meaning of his desire for Dagny, this is a source of pleasure to him because he has reason to be proud of his choice and of what it indicates about himself. But the man who is lacking in self-esteem will not want to know the meaning of his sexual choices because of what he would then have to face in his own character. Consider the famous passion of Philip for Mildred in Somerset Mom's of human bondage. Mom, the author, is a mystic committed to the soul-body dichotomy. In the character of Philip, he shows a sensitive intellectual man caught in a helpless sexual bondage to a slut from the gutter, a slut totally devoid of any values of intellect or spirit. Mom does not offer any explanation of Philip's psychology. He, in effect, projects it as an unaccountable mystery of human nature, and the story is usually taken to represent the impotence of mind and values in the face of passion. 
but from the very material that Mom so graphically presents, one can see the explanation, an explanation that is diametrically opposed to the standard interpretation. Philip, you will remember, is, for all his intellectual aspirations and pretensions, a man with a desperate sense of inferiority. He has a club foot of which he feels deeply ashamed. He doubts his masculinity. He compares himself unfavorably with the men around him. He is inordinately anxious to be liked and approved of and is highly sensitive to the appraisal of others. One day he enters a restaurant and attempts a minor flirtation with the waitress, Mildred. He is not particularly interested in her and does not find her especially attractive. Her manner is crude and vulgar. But she snubs him. He leaves the restaurant, but he finds that he cannot get her out of his mind. He returns again and again. He proceeds to court her. He persists in spite of her obvious indifference and contempt. He willingly endures one humiliation after another in order to be with her, and he feels that he will die if he cannot sexually possess her. Now what is his motive? If it were merely a physical passion, which is what the story is generally held to mean, there would be no way to explain why he desires, specifically Mildred, no way to explain why any other woman would not do just as well. But the truth is that it is not sexual pleasure that Philip is so frantically pursuing. It is self-esteem. Because he has an inferiority complex and secretly doubts his masculinity, he takes Mildred's indifference as an unbearable assault on his manhood, and he is driven compulsively to win her surrender in order to ameliorate the pain of his wounded self-value. He feels, in effect, if even she snubs me, what am I? Philip, like Mom, is by basic attitude a mystic, and like every mystic, he feels inadequate to practical reality, which he has divorced from values and intellect. That is why he would feel that it is precisely Mildred who is at home in and control of reality, that is, metaphysically at home and in control. For this reason, he feels that possessing her will be a proof of his own efficacy, a sign that he is as much at home in practical reality as the other men he knows most of whom would have no difficulty at all in seducing a Mildred. Why does he believe that Mildred is in control of practical reality in spite of all the difficulties and problems from which he constantly has to save her? Because she is mindless, because she has no values, because she is utterly common, because she is not an impractical intellectual like himself. It is significant in this context that Philip is sexually indifferent to another woman in the story, Nora, who is intelligent and whom he respects and esteems. He tells himself that he should love her, but he cannot. He can feel affection for her, but not passion. At the end of the novel, when, worn out by disgust, Philip has finally rid himself of his obsession with Mildred, he falls in love with Sally, a nice little non-intellectual farm girl. The implication is that now Philip is free of his problems and will find true happiness. But if one looks deeper, one sees in fact that Philip has never really escaped Mildred, he has merely fallen in love with another variant. Sally is not vicious or cruel like Mildred, she is simple, straightforward and unassuming. But she is utterly commonplace, utterly undistinguished, totally devoid of any serious spiritual values. And in proposing marriage to her, Philip gives up his aspirations and sinks into the open and explicit mediocrity that he had always longed to escape, the mediocrity that represents his true soul and actual values. Philip's bondage is not to Mildred or to Sally, but to his own deepest premises, which he never dared to face. Fully as much as Reardon, it was his most profound view of himself and of existence that Philip revealed in his sexual desires. The difference is only that Reardon would be glad to know it. Philip wouldn't. What is Philip's view of himself? Utter self-contempt. What is his view of existence? A universe of futility. Let me now briefly tell you the story of a patient I once treated who also did not want to know the meaning and implications of his choice of sexual partner. He was an exceptionally neurotic individual, most conspicuously lacking in even the rudiments of self-esteem. He quoted the lines from Hausmann's poem in order best to describe himself, a stranger and afraid in a world I never made. He was an arch social metaphysician. Professionally, he worked in an artistic field that was inclined to be more than slightly intellectually pretentious. 
When I advanced the theory of sex that I'm expounding to you now, he protested violently. Oh no, he declared to me. Now, if you were talking about love, Mr. Brandon, and if you said that in love we reveal our deepest values, probably I'd agree. But none of you are talking about sex. Sex has nothing to do with anything. Let me give you an example to show you my point. Some time ago, I had to take a train trip, and on the trip I met a rather attractive woman. We talked for a little while, not about anything serious. We really had nothing in common. She shared none of my intellectual interests. But anyway, we ended up by going to bed together. Next morning, she got off the train, and so did I. We went our separate ways and never saw each other again. Now, what was philosophical about it? What did my view of myself or of existence have to do with any of it? It's interesting, I said to him, how people who are afraid and lonely sense each other out, just as people who are self-confident can usually recognize each other immediately. You meet this woman, you begin to talk. You're not talking about anything important but by the kind of irrelevancies you do choose to talk about, by the odd little jumps and non sequiturs in the conversation, by your general manner, you're communicating a great deal to each other, but none of it is verbal, none of it is conceptualized, it's all done by means of emotional vibrations. But here's what you're telling her. I'm lonely, I'm frightened, I'm in a bewildering and incomprehensible universe, and you feel the same way and she's broadcasting that same message to you. What was your real motive in going to bed together? Both of you were feeling, and it's as if you were silently crying into each other. Let me feel, if only for a few minutes, that I'm a human being, that somebody wants me, that I matter to somebody, that I don't have to be always alone. Let me have an instant of warmth and closeness and pleasure. Let me drown out the emptiness and feel that I'm of value. Let's hang on to each other and blot out the vacuum. Then, next morning, you wake up and she's watching you nervously to see if you despise her. And then you say goodbye and walk away, each of you wondering, now what did I do that for, and knowing that you'd probably do it again. Now tell me, was that woman, despite all of your differences, your soulmate, or wasn't she? To give the man credit, he looked at me, his face was white, and he admitted that this was a completely accurate description of his emotional state, that such had been the motive and the meaning of his act, even though he had never identified it. Is it necessary to point out more explicitly this man's view of himself and of existence? Then there was the patient, a woman in her thirties, who was passionately attracted to a man she knew to be a scoundrel. He treated her cruelly, made dates with other women in her presence, lied to her and then admitted it openly and laughed about it. But she felt she couldn't live without him. How many torch songs have been written on this theme? What was this woman's motive? She wanted desperately to be taken care of. She felt chronic anxiety in all social situations and she wanted the sanction and protection of a man who, by her barbaric standards, seemed fearless. She was so lacking in self-esteem herself that she construed his cruelty as strength, since she would never have the, quote, courage, close quote, to abuse people as he did. While she did not grasp its full extent, she was by no means totally unaware of his weakness. That was a crucial ingredient of his desirability for her. She was sensitive enough dimly to know that in some way he needed her too, as a sadist needs a masochist, and it was the common brotherhood of guilt and weakness mixed with his social aggressiveness that made her respond to him as to a soulmate and protector. What was the meaning of the sex act to this woman? It was the proof that she was a woman, that she was worthy of a man's desire, that someone did not reject her. It was a moment's respite from a terrifying universe. If a woman is romantically attracted to a man of demanding standards, if she is romantically attracted to rationality, integrity, self-confidence and ambitiousness, she reveals one kind of soul. If she is attracted to irresponsibility, self-indulgence, and sadism in a man, she reveals another kind of soul. If she is attracted to social respectability, affluence, and conventional charm, she reveals still another kind of soul. If what a man seeks in sex is a heroine, if the emotion he desires to feel is admiration, he reveals one kind of soul. If what he seeks is forgiveness and mutual self-indulgence, he reveals another kind of soul. 
and of what he seeks as a mother, he reveals still another kind of soul. If what a man or a woman seeks in the act of sex is a celebration of their love of life, they reveal one kind of attitude toward existence. But if what they seek is protection from life, if what they seek is consolation or amelioration of despair, they reveal quite a different attitude toward existence. Premises like murder will out, and above all, in what one pursues for enjoyment. It is the man or woman seemingly without standards, the chaser, the person who is sexually promiscuous, who most eloquently confesses his lack of self-esteem and fear of life. Whether it be the man who is out to conquer any woman or the woman who is willing to surrender to any man, their basic motive is the same, to reverse cause and effect and to seek self-esteem by the tribute implied in their partner's response, and to gain relief from the feeling of a malevolent universe. The key to such people's motive and the proof that sexual pleasure is not their goal is their compulsive, constant changing of partners, their inability to find happiness with any single individual, their constant need for the reaffirmation of their personal worth by some new consciousness. Very often, such people will rationalize, they will tell themselves that they are not promiscuous by basic inclination, but have just been unlucky in their choice of partners, and never stop to ask themselves why they are unlucky, why they are always bored or disappointed a month later, a week later, or else next morning. They never stop to ask by what standard they chose their partners in the first place, and what they expect to happen when they choose without standards, on the whim, impulse, mood, or terror of the moment. The evil of promiscuity is not that one pursues pleasure or sexual enjoyment, but that one debases and degrades them by making them meaningless and mindless, that one abandons one's judgment, one's reason, and any serious values one may possess. Promiscuity is immoral because it is an affront to the nature of sex, not because sex is immoral. Promiscuity is not possible without evasion, and many a sexually promiscuous patient has confessed to me that if, in the moment of performing the sexual act, he or she fully focused on their actual estimate of the character of their partner, they would become impotent or frigid. For a man or a woman of self-esteem who falls in love by rational values, it is precisely that focus that is most sexually inspiring. When consciousness becomes a threat to pleasure, that is the evidence that one is acting irrationally and self if one cannot look at one's sexual partner in the light of full consciousness, if one cannot say, this is my choice, these are my values, this is what I seek for pleasure, then one can know that there is a contradiction in one's premises, a clash between one's conscious philosophy and one's deepest values, a discrepancy between one's professed image of oneself and one's actual self-estimate and soul. It is the metaphysical meaning of sex in human life that determines the proper nature of man-woman relationships. You have all heard it said that in romance, man is the dominant agent and woman is submissive, that man is active and woman is passive, that man is the initiator and woman is the responder. There is an important sense in which this is true, but it is necessary carefully to define what one means by these concepts. In intelligence, in intellectual independence, in creative capacity and in moral stature, man and woman are fully equal. Woman is not man's metaphysical inferior or slave. But their sexual roles are different. The difference proceeds from differences in their nature and pertains exclusively to their romantic relationship, not to the other aspects of their lives. In sex, man is the prime mover. By biological necessity, by anatomical necessity, the sex act depends upon his will and choice. Without that act of choice, no sexual relationship is physically possible. A man can take a woman without her consent, but without the consent of the man, the woman is helpless. In this sense, she is totally dependent on his will. In the act itself, man is the chief creator of pleasure. This does not mean that woman can only remain passive, do nothing, and contribute nothing in the sense of active participation, far from it. It is precisely the woman's participation that the man desires. But the fact remains that man carries the basic power of achieving his own pleasure and that of the woman. If sex were not of such crucial importance in human life, the anatomical difference between man and woman would be psychologically irrelevant and without particular consequence. 
But because pleasure, and above all sexual pleasure, is so urgent and fundamental a need, this difference between man and woman sets the basic nature of their entire relationship. Romantically, man is properly the initiator and aggressor, woman is properly the reactor and responder. This does not mean that a woman must conceal her admiration for a man until he has expressed an interest in her, and it certainly does not mean that once he has expressed an interest, she must remain passive and only respond to that which he initiates. The principle of dominance and submission defines only the basic emotional style of the relationship, the essential theme of the romance, as it were, a theme that is capable of many forms of expression. The qualities of character that they should seek in each other are, of course, the same, that is, the values proper to a rational being. The proper basis of love for both is admiration. But a rational, self-confident woman wants a man who is strong enough to dominate her sexually and romantically. A rational man wants a woman who is strong enough to be worth dominating. In love, a woman of self-esteem desires a hero. A man of self-esteem desires a hero worshiper. A hero worshiper, not a clinging vine. Now why does a woman of self-esteem desire a hero? Because for a woman, sex is an act of surrender and is proper only as tribute, only as an acknowledgement of virtue. Why does a man of self-esteem desire a hero worshiper? Because for a man, sex is an act of conquest and a hero worshiper is a woman of exacting standards, not to be conquered save by the man who is able to meet them. You will now understand the answer to a question which I am sometimes asked. Why is there an element of conflict, the suggestion of adversaries, in a love scenes of Ayn Rand's novels? The purpose is to isolate and underscore the character of the participants and the essence of the spirit of sex, of man as a conqueror and woman as a being who has to be conquered. Conquered by what? Not by brute strength, but by values, by greatness, by the intensity of her own admiration. Do not make the error of believing that sadism and masochism are merely exaggerated extensions of healthy masculine dominance and feminine submissiveness. Sadism and masochism are the exact antithesis, the expression not of self-esteem but of self-contempt. The power of a healthy man over a woman is the power to produce pleasure. This is the diametrical opposite of the power sought by the sadist. The sadist goal is the power to inflict pain. A healthy woman expresses her love by her acknowledgement of the pleasure the man has the power to give her and of her need for that pleasure. But a masochist expression of love is her willingness to endure suffering. It is an altogether different motivation whether a woman wants a hero or a master, whether she wants a man to admire or a man to assume responsibility for her life and absolve her of the need to think and make decisions. It is an altogether different motivation whether a man wants a hero worshiper or a clinging vine. Whether he wants the appreciation of a woman with high standards or the unquestioning obedience of a woman with no standards at all. There is nothing more terrifying to a woman without self-esteem than a hero worshiper. A woman of moral judgment who expects man to be a hero and will accept nothing less. Who will respond neither to cuteness nor to charm nor to swaggering pretentiousness but only to authentic self-confidence. The man without self-esteem runs from such women. He often tells himself that he regards them as sexless, but the truth is that it is they who make him feel sexless. Who does such a man find feminine and sexually appealing? The kind of movie star symbolized some years ago by Betty Grable, who looks out from the screen at millions of men and projects to them, anyone could win me even you. I have pointed out that the root of the mystic's damnation of sex is their damnation of pleasure. The root of their damnation of pleasure is, of course, their damnation of life. It is impossible to calculate the enormity of the suffering caused by their anti-sex doctrines. The lives wrecked by guilt, by fear, by impotence and frigidity, by every kind of sexual neurosis to say nothing of the monstrous laws instigated by mystics that forbid abortions and thus result in the literal murder of thousands of women at the hands of quacks. But what you must understand, and what too few of those who attempt to fight the mystics' influence in sex do understand, 
is that this is a moral issue, a philosophical issue, and can be fought successfully only as such. It is a battle that cannot be won by defending sex out of context and in a vacuum. So long as psychologists and psychiatrists answer the accusation that sex is only an animal indulgence, with the defense that man is only an animal and should not be restrained by art artificial taboos, the victims of their ignorance and cowardice will continue to number in the millions. The battle for sex can be won only by challenging the mystic's entire morality of death, a morality that divorces and opposes pleasure and values, and by upholding the morality of life, by upholding the philosophical meaning of pleasure and man's moral right to the selfish pursuit of the enjoyment of existence. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening we begin our discussion and analysis of the objectivist ethics. The objectivist ethics is, of course, the branch of objectivism which has been presented in greatest detail in print in Miss Rand's novels and essays. Nonetheless, there are many crucial issues in the objectivist ethics which I shall discuss in somewhat more detail and from a variety of different aspects than was given in Miss Rand's work. I said in lecture one of this course that the three basic branches of philosophy, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics may be summarized by three questions. What exists? How do you know? And so what? Well, it is from this point on in our lectures that I shall be concerned with the so what. In different ways, that question will concern us in all subsequent lectures, not only in the discussion of ethics, but in the discussion of politics, of art, and in all the remaining subjects to be covered in this course. Let us begin by defining what is the branch of philosophy called ethics or morality. Let me mention parenthetically that while sometimes a very slight distinction is made between ethics and morality in their meaning, I use the two terms interchangeably because I don't see any validity or justification whatsoever in the type of distinctions which are sometimes made between these two terms. Ethics is a code of values to guide man's choices and actions. The choices and actions that determine the purpose and the course of his life. Ethics is a code of values to, the, to guide man's choices and actions. The choices and actions that determine the purpose and the course of his life. Therefore, the task of the science of ethics, of course, is to discover and define in what a rational code of ethics would consist. And in philosophy, one of the most formidable problems which philosophical systems have been broken over is the task of providing a rational foundation for the particular moral values a given school of philosophical thought espoused. Now, as many of you know, traditionally, a great many moralists, and this view is rampant among 20th century philosophers, have held that a rational code of ethics is impossible in the very nature of things that there is no way to justify in reason 
the superiority or the claim to the superiority of one code of values over another. That in the last analysis, all matters of ethics reflect personal choices, personal preferences, which are arbitrary, which are matters of faith and feeling. This, as I say, is certainly the dominant view held among 20th century philosophers, certainly by, for example, the advocates of logical positivism or logical empiricism, as it's sometimes called. Differences in moral values, modern philosophers, for the most part, claim merely reflect differences in taste. We may personally find murder or the slaughter, the wholesale slaughter of a nation abhorrent, but one cannot prove in reason that this is wrong. In what manner have they been answered by other schools of ethics? Well, in one sense, they have been answered in large measure with substantial agreement. That is, by the agreement of all those avowed mystical philosophers who concede that a rational code of morality is indeed impossible and claim that the justification of their particular code of values rests in the fact that it expresses the voice and the will of God or of some supernatural being who has made his beliefs and wishes in this matter known to them via revelation, mystical intuition, and which they cling to not on the grounds of reason but rather on the grounds of faith. Indeed, most ethical systems that have dominated the cultures throughout history have been openly mystical and have sought to justify themselves, except that the term justification isn't applicable in this context, by an appeal to supernatural authority and to mystical revelation. Still another approach to the problem of ethics have been those moral philosophers who, while sometimes claiming that a rational science of ethics is indeed possible, came up with an answer which did not satisfy the requirements of science or reason at all. They said, in effect, that the fundamental principles of moral right or wrong are self-evident, that they are not proven or derived, but they are, in effect, like axioms, which every man inescapably must recognize or must know. They are self-evident. They are known by direct intuition or by direct appeals to conscience or by direct appeals to heaven knows what. And while this type of argument is sometimes classified as an attempt to justify ethics on rational grounds, in fact, such a classification is wrong, is unjustified, because no moral philosopher has ever succeeded in demonstrating that any particular moral preference of his is right self-evidently. Now, sometimes the principles which these philosophers have advocated might be right or right in some respects, but they are not right self-evidently. For example, one philosopher, and perhaps more than one, might say that it's self-evident that, quote, all unnecessary pain is evil, close quote. That is certainly a sentiment with which we would all be inclined to agree, except, of course, how do you define what is or is not necessary, and why is all unnecessary pain evil? There is an answer, but it's not self-evident. It's not something which we know by revelation or by direct intuition. It can be proven, but it needs to be proven. But here is the fascinating thing about the science of ethics or the subject of ethics, that while there have been a great diversity of disagreements among philosophers and mystical theologians and ethicists about how they justify their particular ethical creeds or how ethics in general is to be justified, there have been remarkable points of similarity, of basic agreement, about the content of the different ethical systems that have dominated world history. 
In other words, while they often differed on how they arrived at their conclusions, there is a remarkable degree of agreement with regard to those conclusions. The essential point of agreement hangs, of course, as I would assume you know, upon the sacrosanct nobility of the concept of self-sacrifice. Throughout history, every ethical system which has ever been a major cultural influence has taught one variety or another of the doctrine of self-sacrifice. That is, has taught that man has no right to exist for his own sake, that the moral purpose and justification of his life is service to others, and that self-sacrifice is the noblest, the highest virtue that man can reach and his foremost duty. In different eras, different things have been held to be the proper beneficiaries of man's sacrifice, so that at one time in history, man was to be sacrificed for the glory of the tribe, or for the glory of Pharaoh, or for the glory of God, or for the glory of emperor, or for the glory of king, or for the glory of state, or for the glory of race, or for the glory of the proletariat, or for the glory of society. But always it was held that selfishness is a synonym for evil and that virtue consists of serving some allegedly higher ideal outside and beyond the interests of the living individual involved. In the 19th century, a totalitarian collectivist, August Comte, coined the name which best designates this whole approach to ethics, namely the term altruism. Altruism is the moral code which teaches, which holds, as I indicated a moment ago, that man has no right to exist for his own sake, that the moral purpose of his life is service to others, that self-sacrifice is his highest virtue and foremost duty. In modern times, of course, the chief beneficiary of human sacrifices has been represented as being society, the nation, the state. In effect, the mystical creed of self-sacrifice for the alleged sake of supernatural beings has become secularized. Society has replaced God on the altar before which man the individual is to be sacrificed. Now then, the average man doesn't really accept any systematic code of ethics or morality whatsoever. Morality is to him something of a bore, really. It's something associated with duty or grayness or boredom, that which will take away his pleasure, take all the enjoyment out of life, that to which he is, feels himself obliged to pay lip service but which has really got nothing to do, so he believes, with the job of getting along with living. What he doesn't realize is that he cannot, that man cannot, live without some kind of values to guide him. That man cannot live without some kind of guiding principles to direct his action. And that the morality of altruism has left him in a devastating kind of moral vacuum, has left him in a moral wilderness where he never knows what to do, when to sacrifice and when to collect somebody else's sacrifices, what he can claim as a right, what he can ask only as a favor, what he can achieve only by someone else's sacrifice, when is the time to take and when is the time to give, when is he to be the victim of altruism and when is he to be the profiteer. So for the most part, he tries to live his life by a kind of 
at best, common sense code of fair play, which usually breaks down in all the crucial issues when major decisions have to be made, at which time, sensing the solemnity of the task of passing a major moral decision and having no well thought out objective moral code, he almost invariably falls back in his helplessness upon an appeal to and an acceptance of the conventional ethics of altruism. In effect, in big issues when in doubt, sacrifice yourself. You're sure to be moral if you do that. That is really the operating principle upon which he lives. As a purely philosophical achievement, the most extraordinary feat in Atlas Shrugged is Ayn Rand's presentation in Galt's speech of the rational foundation of the objectivist code of morality. The most revolutionary single achievement is the method by which she validates and justifies the code of ethics upheld in Atlas Shrugged and thus smashes the notion that a rational code of morality is impossible and smashes the monopoly which mysticism has always enjoyed over the field of morality. Therefore, for some time this evening, for the next 20 minutes or so, I shall direct your attention to a rather careful consideration of how the objectivist ethics begins, how it builds, what is its foundation, how is the standard of morality in the objectivist ethics derived and justified. In order to give you a better appreciation of the problem involved, consider what the big question any ethicist is up against is, namely, he can say that, let us say, man should do such and such. Then if you ask him, well, why should man do such and such, he will say, well, in order that such and such will occur. And if you say to him, yes, but why should such and such occur? He will say, well, in order for such and such to occur. But at some point along the line, there has to be some end or goal which represents a stop. Otherwise, you get an infinite regress. Everything is for the sake of something else. You need a final end, a final goal, which is the standard which all lesser goals and all other actions must conform to. Some end, some goal, which will act as a standard and principle by which to judge all other values, all other actions which man can take. How then? does objectivism approach this problem. The first thing to point out is this. Objectivism does not begin, as most philosophies do, by taking the phenomenon of moral values as a given. That is, objectivism does not begin merely by observing that men pursue various values and by assuming that the first question of ethics is, what values ought man to pursue? No, we begin on a deeper level with the question, what are values and why does man need them? What are values and why does man need them? Why is the whole issue of morality important one way or the other? What are the facts of reality? What are the facts of existence and of man's nature that necessitate and give rise to values? Consider for a moment the following. Perhaps ethics is all a mistake from beginning to end. Perhaps the whole science should be dismantled and abandoned as a wrong trail, like alchemy or astrology or a phrenology, say. Maybe there is no such science. Maybe the whole issue is nonsense from beginning to end. Maybe the reason why philosophers have been so dreadfully inept in their attempts to find satisfactory ethical solutions to problems lies in the false assumption that there is any valid place in man's life for a code of ethics or morality one way or the other. 
perhaps man doesn't need a code of ethics or morality. Maybe he can dispense with the question of values. Maybe it's all a colossal historical mistake. Why need we be concerned with the issue of moral values one way or the other? If you want to know how to derive a rational code of values, begin there. Begin with the question, what are values? Why do we need values? What is their role and function in our lives? In other words, begin at the beginning. What is a value? A value is that which one acts to gain and or keep. A value is the object of an action. Value presupposes an answer to the question, a value to whom and for what? Value presupposes a standard, a purpose, and the necessity of action in the face of an alternative. Where there are no alternatives, no values are possible. Consider this. Imagine an entity who, by its nature, had no purposes to achieve, no goals to reach. Such an entity could have no values and no need of values. There would be no for what. Or again, an entity incapable of initiating action, or for whom the consequences would always be the same, regardless of its actions. An entity not confronted with alternatives could have no purposes, no goals, and hence no values. Nothing it did would make any difference to it. Nothing could affect its state. Nothing could hurt it or help it. Only the existence of alternatives can make purpose and therefore values possible and necessary. If you had some sort of indestructible machine that nothing could hurt, that nothing could affect, that nothing could be good for or bad for. Why then such a machine couldn't possibly have, even if we somehow imagine as a piece of fantasy that it were conscious, couldn't have any purposes, couldn't have any goals, couldn't have any values, because it wouldn't have any for what? Because nothing it did would make any difference to it. Nothing it did would have any consequences for it, one way or the other. Only when there are alternatives confronting an entity, only when it makes a difference what it does and what happens to it, can there be purposes and therefore values. To quote a very important paragraph from God's speech, quote, There is only one fundamental alternative in the universe, existence or non-existence, and it pertains to a single class of entities to living organisms. The existence of inanimate matter is unconditional. The existence of life is not. It depends on the specific course of action. Matter is indestructible. It changes its forms, but it cannot cease to exist. It is only a living organism that faces a constant alternative, the issue of life or death. Life is a process of self-sustaining and self-generated action. If an organism fails in that action, it dies. Its chemical elements remain, but its life goes out of existence. It is only the concept of life that makes the concept of value possible. It is only to a living entity that things can be good or evil. Here we have the heart of the issue. It is only to a living entity that things can be good or evil. It is only a living entity that has the capacity to generate action, and it is only a living entity that faces the fundamental alternative of life or death, depending upon whether the action it generates is successful or unsuccessful. It is only a living entity that can have needs, goals, values 
and it is only a living entity that can generate the actions necessary to achieve them. A plant does not possess consciousness. It can neither experience pleasure nor pain, nor have the concepts of life and death. Nevertheless, plants can die. A plant's life depends on a specific course of action. Again, quoting Galt's speech, a plant must feed itself in order to live. The sunlight, the water, the chemicals it needs are the values its nature has set it to pursue. Its life is the standard of value directing its actions. But a plant has no choice of action. There are alternatives in the conditions it encounters, but there is no alternative in its function. It acts automatically to further its life. It cannot act for its own destruction." Close quote. So we see on this low level of life, the plant must generate action in order to live, but the kind of action it will generate is determined by a guiding principle inherent in the biology of the plant. It will always act in the direction of preserving its life. Animals possess a primitive form of consciousness. They cannot know the issue of life and death, but they can know pleasure and pain. An animal's life depends on actions automatically guided by its sensory mechanism. Again, quoting Galt's speech, quote, an animal is equipped for sustaining its life. Its senses provide it with an automatic code of action, an automatic knowledge of what is good for it or evil. It has no power to extend its knowledge or to evade it. In conditions where its knowledge proves inadequate, it dies. But so long as it lives, it acts on its knowledge with automatic safety and no power of choice. It is unable to ignore its own good unable to decide to choose the evil and act as its own destroyer." Close quote. Given the appropriate conditions, given the appropriate physical environment, all living organisms, with one exception, are set by their nature to originate automatically the actions required to sustain their survival. The exception is man. Man is a living organism, but a unique kind of living organism. Man, like a plant or an animal, must act in order to live. Man, like a plant or an animal, must gain the values his life requires. But man does not act and function by automatic chemical reactions or by automatic sensory reactions. There is no physical environment on Earth in which man could survive by the guidance of nothing but his involuntary sensations. And man is born without innate ideas. Having no innate knowledge of what is true or false, he can have no innate knowledge of what is good for him or evil. This is the unique problem confronting man. Man has no automatic means of survival. Man is not biologically programmed always to act automatically in that way that will optimally secure his survival. Man, when he moves in reality confronted with alternatives, is not biologically pre-wired, as it were, always to make the choice most conducive to his survival. No. For man, survival is a question. It's a problem he has to solve. The perceptual level of his consciousness, the level of passive sensory awareness which man shares with the animals, is inadequate to solve it. He can't survive simply by drifting along under the impetus of his sensory experiences. To remain alive, man must think which means he must exercise the faculty which he alone of all living species possesses, the faculty of abstraction, of conceptualizing. The conceptual level of consciousness is the human level, the level required for man's survival. And it is upon his ability to think that man's life depends. Man's unique tool for coping with reality for solving the problems of his survival is his mind. 
That is the human means and mode of survival. But remember, reason does not work automatically. Man is a being of volitional consciousness. Man does not think by blind mechanical compulsion. His heart beats automatically. His lungs function automatically. But his mind does not function automatically. His mind does not pump out automatically the conceptual knowledge which his life requires in the same way that his heart pumps out the blood that his life requires. His mind works by a radically different principle. Man has to choose to think and to generate the thinking process upon which his life will depend. And it's for this reason that Galt says to you who are a human being, the question to be or not to be is the question to think or not to think. Man is the one living species whose basic means of survival functions volitionally. A being of volitional consciousness, a being without innate ideas, must discover by a process of thought the goals, the actions, the values on which his life depends. He must discover what will further his life and what will destroy it. If he acts against the facts of reality, he will perish. If he is to sustain his existence, he must discover the principles of action required to guide him in dealing with nature and with other men. His need of these principles is his need of a code of values. This is why man needs a code of morality. This is why morality is a necessary science. This is the role which it is properly to fill and to play in human life. To provide man with the abstract values and guiding principles which will enable him most efficaciously to deal with reality and therefore to maintain and support his own life. Other species are not free to choose their values. Man is. Values accepted by choice are moral values. This is why man needs a code of values. And the reason of man's need for morality determines the purpose of morality as well as the standard by which moral values are to be selected. Man needs a moral code in order to live. That is the purpose of morality. Not for mankind as a collective, but for every man as an individual. Life is an attribute of individual organisms. But in order to know what are the values and virtues that will permit him to achieve the purpose of his life, man requires a standard, a standard by which to judge. Different species, after all, achieve their survival in different ways. The course of action proper to the survival of a fish or of an animal would not be proper to the survival of a man. Man must choose his values by the standard of that which is required for the life of his particular species, namely for the life of a human being. Which means he must hold man's life, meaning man's survival qua man, man's survival as man, as his standard of value. Since reason is man's basic tool of survival, this means the life appropriate to a rational being or to put it another way, that which is required for the survival of man qua rational being. Hence the meaning of Galt's statement, quote, all that which is proper to the life of a rational being is the good, all that which destroys it is the evil, close quote. To live, man must think, he must act, he must produce the values his life requires. From the food he eats, to the clothing he wears, to shelter, to drugs, to bridges, to the surgery and the medicines that save his life. 
This metaphysically is the human mode of existence, to think and to produce. When men attempt to survive, not by thought and productive work, but by parasitism and force, by theft and brutality, it is still the faculty of reason that they are secretly counting on. The reason that some moral man had to exercise in order to create the goods which the parasites propose to loot or expropriate. Man, like every other living species, has a specific manner of survival which is determined by his nature. Man is free to act against the requirements of his nature, to reject his means of survival, his mind, but he is not free to escape the consequence, misery, anxiety, destruction. When men attempt to exist by a means other than reason, it becomes a matter of little more than chance, who lasts a decade and who lasts a year, who was wiped out by whom and who is able to consume some part of his gains before the club descends on him. Man's life depends on thinking, not on acting blindly, on achievement, not on destruction. Nothing can change that fact. Mindlessness, passivity, parasitism, brutality are not and cannot be principles of survival. They are merely the policy of those who do not wish to face the problem of survival. Man's life means this is very important for you to understand. The concept of man's life as the standard means man's life lived in accordance with the principles that make man's survival qua man possible. And this is an answer to those unthinking people who will sometimes ask in a different context when, for example, we maintain that political freedom is a necessary and proper condition of man's life. Such people will ask, well, people lived in the Middle Ages, didn't they? They lived in Nazi Germany, didn't they? They lived in Soviet Russia, didn't they? Men have survived under every kind of dictatorship, haven't they? So how can you say that freedom is a necessary condition of man's life qua man? The question to put to such unfocused, censored, is who lived? Who survived in the Middle Ages? Who survived in Nazi Germany? Who survived in Soviet Russia? When we say that the dictatorship is inimical to the requirements of man's survival, we do not mean by this that the second the dictatorship is imposed, every one of the population dies immediately. We mean that a set of social conditions are set up which are inimical to the requirements of man's survival, and that one of the characteristics of all such dictatorships is that they are able to maintain themselves only by constantly draining human blood. In such dictatorships, it is a matter of chance who dies this week and who dies next. Who survives and who perishes is largely a matter of chance because you have no way of knowing when the arbitrary animosity of the rulers will descend on you when the existential conditions are such as to forbid or largely hamper successful production and to place every kind of possible obstacle in the way of normal human life. This was true, of course, in the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages, and certainly in any modern dictatorship. Will you tell the people who died on the wall in Germany that freedom is not a necessary condition of survival? What is required here is that one learn to think in principles. If a doctor tells you that some vitamin is necessary for your life or your well-being, he doesn't mean that if you don't have it, you'll die immediately, and he doesn't mean that you might not drag out your days in a crippled state. He means that for the mode of life physically proper to you as a human being, you need that vitamin. For the maximum resistance to danger and the maximum enjoyment and fulfillment of your life. The same thing applies to the other moral precepts which will be discussed in our presentation of what man's life depends on. Just as man is alive physically to the extent that the organs within his body function in the constant service of his life, so man is alive as a total entity to the extent that, in addition to his heart, lungs, and other vital organs, his mind functions in the constant service of his life. The mind, too, is a vital organ, the one vital organ whose function is volitional. A man encased in an iron lung, whose own lungs are paralyzed, is not dead, but he is not living the life proper to man. Neither is a man 
whose mind is volitionally paralyzed. Now, the traditional mystics have declared that if God did not exist, morality wouldn't be necessary. Everything would be permissible. The neo-mystics have declared that if society did not exist, morality would not be necessary. Any course of action would be as good as any other, would be as valid as any other, would it? It is not for the purpose of satisfying the wishes of a supernatural being that man needs a code of moral values, and it is not for the purpose of satisfying the wishes of his neighbors. The source and justification of values is neither God nor society. Morality is neither mystical nor social. It is a practical, selfish necessity. The cardinal principle at the base of Ayn Rand's ethical system is the statement in Galt's speech that, quote, it is only the concept of life that makes the concept of value possible. It is only to a living entity that things can be good or evil, close quote. This is the concept which cuts through the whole mystical fog which has swallowed morality and answers the claim that you cannot have a rational code of ethics, that a code of values cannot be logically derived from facts. It is the nature of living entities, the fact that they must sustain their life by self-generated action that makes the existence of values possible and necessary. For each living species, the course of action required is specific. What an entity is determines what it ought to do. By identifying the context in which values arise existentially in reality, objectivism refutes the claim that the ultimate standard of any moral judgment is arbitrary, that normative propositions cannot be derived from factual propositions, to put the case in its modern terminology. By identifying the roots of the concept of value epistemologically, Ayn Rand has shown that not to hold man's life as one standard of moral judgment is in fact to be guilty of a logical contradiction. Why? Because it is only to a living entity that things can be good or evil. Life is the basic value that makes all other values possible. The value of life is not to be justified by a value beyond itself. To demand such a justification, to ask, yes, but why should man choose to live, is to have dropped the meaning, context, and source of one's concepts. Abandon the concept that life is a value, and you lose your right to the concept of values. Should is a concept that can have no intelligible meaning. Should is a value term, remember, if divorced from the concept and value of life. If life, that is, if existence, if man's existence is not accepted as one standard, why then only one alternative standard remains? Non-existence. But non-existence, death is not the standard of value, it is the negation of values. The man who does not wish to hold life as his goal and standard is free not to do it, not to hold it. But he cannot claim the sanction of reason. He cannot claim that his choice is as valid as any other. It is not arbitrary, it is not optional whether or not man accepts his nature as a living being, just as it is not arbitrary or optional whether or not he accepts reality. This then is the basic issue involved in how one approaches the whole question of ethics to begin with. In order to survive, man has to know what to do. He has to function long range, moreover, because, and this is a very important point, if he makes a wrong choice, the disastrous consequences will not always befall him immediately. If they did, again, he wouldn't need a code of morality because he'd choose right or he'd be dead. What confuses the issue is the fact that man acts across time, that he acts into the future that there is often a complex chain of causality between an action and its ultimate consequences. Therefore, man needs to know in advance what in logic will be the long-term consequences of his actions and by what principle should he act if he is to protect his life and to secure the optimum enjoyment and fulfillment of his life. That is why he needs a code of morality and that is why a rational code of morality by the very definition of why man needs one, 
has to hold as its standard of the good that which is required by or that which serves man's life qua man, meaning man's life qua rational being. This is briefly why, as I said in the opening lecture, what objectivism offers you is a code of morality geared to man's nature, to his needs as a living organism, to the requirements of his existence on earth. To continue our discussion of the objectivist ethics, quoting from Galt's speech, to live, says Galt, man must hold three things as the supreme and ruling values of his life. Reason, purpose, self-esteem. Reason as his only tool of knowledge. Purpose as his choice of the happiness which that tool must proceed to achieve. Self-esteem as his inviolate certainty that his mind is competent to think and his person is worthy of happiness, which means is worthy of living." Close quote. It's worth pausing a moment to contrast the three ruling values of the objectivist ethics, reason, purpose, and self-esteem, with the three corresponding alleged virtues of traditional morality, which would be faith, renunciation or self-sacrifice, and humility. Mystical ethics would teach that not the exercise of his reason, but the abandonment of his reason in faith is one of the cardinal requirements of virtue. That virtue requires and consists not of purpose, not of productiveness, not of gaining values, but of sacrificing them, of relinquishing them, of renouncing them, of surrendering them, of giving them up. And that virtue consists not of valuing oneself, not of valuing one's life and one's mind, but rather of disvaluing them. That is, of exhibiting the virtue of humility. <laughs> Ask yourself which is the root that leads to man's life and which to his self-defeat. Does his life depend upon reason or upon that state of unconsciousness called faith? Does his life depend upon producing values or upon sacrificing them? Does his life require that he consider himself competent to live and worthy of living or that he consider himself unfit to live and unworthy of living? Then, in answering this question, you will know why we call the morality of mysticism a morality of death. Because its cardinal values are precisely those which are inimical, actively inimical, to the requirements of man's life, survival, and well-being. The process of living is a process of self-generated and self-sustaining action. Life is a process of self-sustaining and self-generated action. And that means that the process of living is a constant process of working for the achievement of values. This is a process inherent in life itself. Life is action. Life is purposeful motion toward a goal. That is the meaning of life. The emotional concomitant of successful action is that psychological state which we call happiness. The alternative of happiness and suffering is the internal psychological form in which man experiences the alternative which in existential terms we recognize as that of life and death. Happiness is the state of consciousness which results from the fulfillment of one's values. Happiness in life is made possible in principle by two means, by two related means. It's a concomitant of action, of the process of acting to achieve values, and it's also a concomitant of the process of enjoying or consuming values already achieved, either by oneself or by someone else. 
Happiness is, in a word, the successful state of living. Happiness is the successful state of living. Just as life cannot be achieved by any random means a man may imagine, so happiness cannot be achieved by any random means a man can imagine. Just as man can drag himself through his life as a cripple, so that his existence is really a process of progressive suicide, so the psychological corollary or concomitant of that same anti-life mode of existence is an internal state of psychological torture, of frustration, of misery. The purpose, says Galt, of morality is to teach you not to suffer and die, but to enjoy yourself and live. But how to enjoy yourself is precisely what has to be learned. That's precisely what is not self-evident. One of the most absurd, almost farcical mistakes which many people believe is that morality is not necessary for happiness or for the enjoyment of life. That any idiot, any moron, any unprincipled whim worshiper acting in any way he blooming well pleases preserves intact his capacity to enjoy life. Well, any psychotherapist should laugh at that particular piece of nonsense. Because psychotherapist offices are filled with the human wreckage of people who believe that happiness does not require any particular conditions, that it can be reached by any route they happen to feel like. If it could, one wouldn't need such a profession as psychotherapy. Perhaps psychological illness, neurosis, misery, neurotic anxiety, neurotic depression is one of the most simple, eloquent, and dramatic means by which nature dramatizes to us the fact that happiness requires the fulfillment of specific conditions set by man's nature. Consider the following to begin with. One of the differences between a rational pleasure and an irrational one, or a rational value and an irrational one, is in terms of its consequences for one's happiness. A rational pleasure doesn't carry a hangover or a kickback with it, meaning because it is pro-life, it doesn't carry a penalty. It's in the nature of any irrational pleasure, of which drunken unconsciousness is perhaps the best example, that it always carries a hangover, a kickback of a negative kind as an integral part of it. And there is a reason for this, which we can appreciate very simply. The only way to hold a consistent code of values is to hold a consistently rational code of values. Because if your values were consistently irrational, you'd be dead. If none of your values were right, you couldn't exist at all. Therefore, among the living, there are only the people whose values are inconsistent and those whose values are consistently right. But nobody's values could be consistently wrong. Such a man would perish if some of the things he wanted weren't right. Now, Consider this then. If you hold contradictory values, inconsistent values, this means that the satisfaction of one value will entail the frustration or negation of another. If, for example, among your values are the desire to enjoy life and to have security and a stable, predictable existence, but you also decide that you want a nice little shortcut via being the, the profession of bank robber, why then, the price which is paid, even if one is not caught immediately, is in terms of the frustration of other values. And there isn't any possible escape from this principle, and that is why any irrational pursuit, at one point or another, always acts destructively for the life, the well-being, the happiness of the organism, the human organism. I want to quote a very important passage from the speech which Ayn Rand gave in 1961 at the Wisconsin Symposium on Ethics, which NBI subsequently published. I refer to the speech entitled The Objectivist Ethics, in which Ms. Rand states, and I quote, The maintenance of life and the pursuit of happiness are not two separate issues. To hold one's own life as one's ultimate value and one's own happiness as one's highest purpose are two aspects of the same achievement. Existentially, the activity of pursuing rational goals is the activity of maintaining one's life. Psychologically, 
its result, reward, and concomitant is an emotional state of happiness. It is by experiencing happiness that one lives one's life in any hour, year, or the whole of it. And when one experiences the kind of pure happiness that is an end in itself, the kind that makes one think, this is worth living for, what one is greeting and affirming in emotional terms is the metaphysical fact that life is an end in itself. But the relationship of cause and effect cannot be reversed. It is only by accepting man's life as one's primary and by pursuing the rational values it requires that one can achieve happiness. Not by taking happiness as some undefined irreducible primary and then attempting to live by its guidance. If you achieve that which is the good by a rational standard of value, it will necessarily make you happy. But that which makes you happy by some undefined emotional standard is not necessarily the good. To take whatever makes one happy as a guide to action means to be guided by nothing but one's emotional whims. Emotions are not tools of cognition. To be guided by whims, by desires whose source, nature, and meaning one does not know is to turn oneself into a blind robot operated by unknowable demons, by one's stale evasions. A robot knocking its stagnant brains out against the walls of a reality which it refuses to see. This is the fallacy in hedonism, in any variant of ethical hedonism, personal or social, individual or collective. Happiness can properly be the purpose of ethics, but not the standard. The task of ethics is to define man's proper code of values and thus to give him the means of achieving happiness. To declare, as the ethical hedonists do, that the proper value is whatever gives you pleasure, is to declare that the proper value is whatever you happen to value, which is an act of intellectual and philosophical abdication, an act which merely proclaims the futility of ethics and invites all men to play it deuces wild. If a man is caught up in some moral decision where he doesn't know what action is appropriate and he comes to you for guidance, you tell him nothing if you tell him, act on whatever will make you happy. Because the answer of a sane, intelligent, rational man will be, but how am I supposed to know what will make me happy ahead of knowing what makes sense? I don't begin with my emotions. I begin with wanting to know what course of action, in fact, is going to lead to my long-term self-interest and well-being. That's the whole problem. To say, do whatever makes you happy, that will give you the answer, implies that the answer is already there in my emotions. But if I already knew the answer, I wouldn't ask the question, what should I do? The question is, what will make me happy? That's precisely what I'm trying to decide. What will best serve my happiness? That's the question. The answer to it isn't and can't be, follow your happiness, which means follow your feelings. That's just evading the very problem I'm trying to deal with. Since reason is man's basic tool of survival, since man lives and succeeds and achieves happiness only to the extent to which he recognizes the facts of reality and adjusts his actions accordingly, only to the extent to which he's able to act efficaciously and efficiently in reality, for these reasons, the foremost virtue of the objectivist ethics is rationality. What does rationality mean? It means, first of all, the acceptance of reason as one's only source of knowledge, one's only judge of values, one's only guide to action. It means constant commitment to a state of full intellectual focus, to functioning on the conceptual level of awareness. It means dedication to the principle of constantly seeking to expand the range of one's awareness, constant dedication to the principle of intellectual growth. It means a commitment to the fact that reality is real, which means to the principle that one's goals, one's values, one's actions take place in reality, and therefore one does not sacrifice one's knowledge of reality, one's perception of reality, one's judgment of reality to any other consideration. Nothing can be higher than reality. No value can be sought at the expense of blinding oneself to reality. It means commitment to the principle 
that one's values, one's desires, one's decisions, one's conclusions must be validated by a rational process of thought, as honest, as conscientious, as scrupulous a process of thought as one is capable of performing. Of course, for a full presentation of what it means to function as a rational being, this you will find all through Atlas Shrugged. There you will see, in scene after scene, in a great variety of the kind of problems that human beings can come up against, what the principle of rationality means in practice. When Reardon is struggling to understand his family, and no matter how hurt or bewildered he is, he goes on thinking. He's trying to understand. That is the virtue of rationality. When he works, trying to discover or invent rather rude metal, abandoning one unsatisfactory solution after another until he gets what he wants. That is the virtue of rationality. When Galt refuses to try to let Dagny stay in Atlantis to get her to stay there, knowing she's not yet sold on the rightness of his cause, when he knows that that would just be a fake which wouldn't give him what he wants, and when he isn't tempted by it, that is the virtue of rationality. The scenes, the issues in Atlas Shrugged in which you will see what that human quality means. That complete dedication to the fact that the fact is a fact, it's not to be evaded, it's not to be escaped. There are any number of examples. Witness, for example, the Gaul's policy towards Dagny in Atlantis. The attitude he takes toward what he has done relative to her at first condemnation of it, or hurt at it. Look at the various kind of pressures under which the various good characters often have to function and how they preserve their cognitive clarity and keep their brain functioning no matter what. That is the virtue of rationality. That desire to know, to grow, to do better, to always stretch one's brain, to learn more, to do more. That is the virtue of rationality. First and foremost, reason as one's sole standard of truth. That means a complete repudiation of and rejection of any variety of mysticism. A refusal ever to place one's wishes or fears, meaning one's feelings, above one's rational judgment. A concern with the why of one's every conviction, not holding or maintaining convictions arbitrarily or capriciously. A profound respect for facts. A commitment to the principle that one's desires and goals have to be held in the full long-term context of one's life that one has to function by means of long-term principles as a human being, not as an animal whose foresight can't extend beyond the next half hour. It means a concern to permit oneself no contradictions among one's ideas or one's desires. It means a respect for the law of causality, meaning never to permit oneself desires without concern for what it would take to achieve those desires. Meaning, no desire for effects without concern for the necessary causes. It also means no concern for actions, no pursuit of actions without a concern for their consequences, for the logical consequences to which they will lead. No acting on the premise of, it's my function to act, somebody else has to worry about the consequences. And here, a very important issue. Never to allow the range of one's action to exceed the range of one's thought. Never to allow the range of one's action to exceed the range of one's thought. Meaning, when one acts, one has to know what one is doing. One way of appreciating what the virtue of rationality means is by studying the art type in Atlas Shrugged of the irrational man, Mr. James Taggart. In any issue, his primary concern is not what is true, but what would I like to be true. Not what exists, but what is it convenient for me to see. Not what is possible, but what do I want. Not how is it to be gotten, but only I want it. Let somebody provide it somehow. One of the magic words in the arsenal of the irrationalist is that word somehow, which always means somebody. Somehow always means somebody. When a person permits himself irrational desires, 
with no concern for how they're to be gotten, and answers when queried, oh, somehow, he means somebody. Somebody will provide it. Now, some of you might wish to ask the following question. Granted that, as a general principle, man should always remain in full intellectual focus. Granted that he should function long range, that he should be guided by principles, that he should be concerned to know the reason of his convictions. Granted that he shouldn't hold values or desires or goals out of context. But he shouldn't permit himself contradictions. Granted that in all the fundamental, all the major issues of one's life, obviously it's to man's self-interest and well-being to function as a rational being. But aren't there surely certain absolutely marginal issues in life to which the concept of rationality surely doesn't and cannot apply one way or the other? Where reason is irrelevant in the choice of a movie, which movie will I see tonight? In the choice of a flavor of ice cream, how could one possibly be rational in such issues as these? What could the principle of rationality mean in such issues as these? Well, consider. Let's take, first of all, the case of a choice of going to the movie. Suppose, for example, that you're sitting home one evening and you're thinking, I'm going to go to the show tonight, and you know that you have the time to spare to go to the show and that you would like some form of entertainment pleasure. So you look at the newspaper, and there are two movies you'd like to see, both of which you have reason to think would be worth seeing. And you say, I don't know, I just feel like seeing movie A tonight rather than movie B. I don't know why, it's just the mood I'm in. And so you go to see movie A. Would you say that that's an example of acting non-rationally? If you would, check your premises. What's the principle that's applicable here? When you are confronted with two or more alternatives, and you know that in the nature of the case, no choice can be wrong, Meaning that there's no objective reason why one should see one movie rather than the other, since you plan to see them both in this particular case, but I'll give you other examples later. In the word, when you are confronted with alternatives, choices, where you know in the nature of the case, no choice can be wrong, why then it is quite rational to decide to go on the basis of whatever movie emotionally attracts you most. You may or may not be able to identify exactly why you're more in the mood for a movie A rather than B, if you're a good introspector, you'll probably be able to know. And you do know as a general fact of human psychology that sometimes according to the events of our day or our context, we can be more in the mood to see one movie than another. And there's nothing per se wrong or strange about this. And what makes either choice honestly and legitimately optional is the fact that the nature of the case you can know in advance that no matter what you see, it cannot be a wrong choice. Under what circumstances might it be? Well, suppose you have to study for an exam tomorrow and you know you're not prepared. And the choice now isn't between movie A or B, but between staying home and studying and going to any movie, even one you've seen six times, just to get out of the house, let us say. And you know that it's very much against your self-interest to go to a movie tonight because it's important to pass this exam and you know you're not prepared. Well, then the fact that you happen to feel in the mood to see movie A, B, C, D, or X becomes quite irrelevant. Because here you are dealing with alternatives where clearly the choices are not equal. One choice is objectively preferable to another. You have to, in effect, know under what circumstances it's appropriate to follow your feelings. For example, a very crude, simple example. You're out for a walk on a summer day in the field, let us say. And suddenly you take it into your head that you feel like running. And all you are aware of is that you're feeling very good and this would give you an emotional experience of pleasure. Well, it, this is not irrational because rationality consists of taking cognizance of what is the context in which you are functioning. There couldn't be any possible argument against your running. And if there couldn't be any argument against it, and if you know it would give you an experience of pleasure, why then it becomes rational to do it. But you have to know that. So that if, for example, you're a severe cardiac case, the fact that you happen to be in the mood to run doesn't mean that you should do it. Rationality requires that you be cognizant of the context. I'll give you a rather facetious, humorous example of this. Some years ago, talking to a young man, 
he got hung up on the following problem. Namely, somebody had said to him, well, how can you be rational all the time? You're out on a date with a girl, let's say, and you park the car. What are you going to start discussing? Astronomy or the celestial motions? How can you be rational all the time? Well, of course, the error here is in assuming that that would be rational. <laughs> being rational all the time doesn't mean being always engaged in the process of problem solving. Part of what being rational means, indeed a crucial part of what rational means, is knowing in any given context what sort of mental processes are appropriate to that context and i don't mind telling you there's a whole lecture in that last sentence i said to you several weeks ago that man's biological distinction one of his biological distinctions is that man is self-regulating with regard to the action of his consciousness and this involves among other things the decision concerned with what type of mental processes are appropriate to different contexts. And obviously, it isn't the case that the same kind of concrete, literal mental processes are identically appropriate in all possible contexts, except the most fundamental one of being conscious, of course, and knowing what you're doing. But for example, if this young man is studying for his exam or working on a mathematical problem, then it's appropriate to be engaged in a purposeful problem-solving activity. If he's out on a date with his sweetheart and he's parked the car, that is not the kind of activity that is normally appropriate. And one would question his rationality if he thought that it were. And therefore, a crucial part of rationality is taking cognizance of context and seeing that one's mental and physical actions are appropriate to a given context. Take still a simpler example, perhaps the silliest. How can one be rational in one's choice of ice cream flavors? Well, I've already given you the principle by which to answer that question. In one's tastes in food, two factors clearly are involved. One factor, of course, is association. We form certain associations with certain flavors. Secondly, there's considerable evidence to suggest that there are certain inherited physical factors which will be relevant to taste preferences in food or drink. Therefore, again, if you are weighing, shall I have a chocolate ice cream cone or a vanilla or a strawberry? You can know in the nature of the case that there is no such thing as a wrong choice, unless you happen to be allergic to one of these flavors or be dreadfully overweight, etc., 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 and there that you could fill in for yourself. But there are issues in life in which all of the options are equally valid. And maybe you could say, well, I don't know by what association I happen to like chocolate more than banana cream. What difference does it make if you never know how you happen to form that preference or you never happen to know what particular physical inherited factors might be involved? What you are able to know is that it doesn't make any difference in this particular case. That's what you have to be responsible for knowing. Now then, in the course of the next lecture or two, I will be concerned to pursue further this whole issue of what are the principles, the values, the principles of action which man's life requires for its successful fulfillment. But before concluding this evening's discussion, there is one last issue relevant to the clarification of the concept of man's life as the standard that I want briefly to touch on. In principle, I have already covered this point, but experience has taught me that sometimes students are confused by it, and therefore I want to elaborate on it now. When we say that the objectivist ethics holds man's life or the life appropriate to a rational being as its standard of value, this means the objective requirements of man's life qua man in the full context. It does not mean, it does not mean that in any value choice, one's only or foremost consideration should be one's immediate physical self-preservation. Man's life as the standard of value does not mean that in any moral choice, the primary consideration 
is only, or first of all, your physical self-preservation through the span of the next moment of your existence. Indeed, such a policy not only is not entailed by the principle of man's life as the standard, more than that, it's actively incompatible with the standard of man's life. Why? Well, remember, life, as I have said, is a process of self-sustaining and self-generated action. The life proper to man, as we have seen, is a process of pursuing, achieving, and enjoying values. The values which is life as a rational being requires. But, in the nature of reality, in the nature of life, the pursuit of values entails a struggle. And struggle entails risk. The pursuit of values necessarily involves the possibility of failure and defeat. A rational man does not rebel against this fact as he does not rebel against any metaphysical fact of reality. Therefore, to choose to act for one's values only when no risk is involved is to give up values, is to forsake values. And of course, to forsake values is to forsake life. A rational man does not venture senselessly. He does not attempt the impossible. He does not indulge in grandiose, empty gestures that can result only in his destruction. But when crucial values are at stake, he accepts the fact that the risk of his life itself may be necessary. Thus, the man who, to choose an obvious example, the man who consciously and willingly risks his life in the attempt to escape a dictatorship, the man who dies in the effort to achieve freedom, is acting on the principle of man's life as the standard of value. He knows what human existence is and he will not accept anything less. He is unwilling to endure and regard as normal a non-human state of being, that is, a state where men act and function with a gun aimed at their heads, with destruction aimed at their values, and with escape from death, not the achievement of life as the best they can hope for. It is in the name of the life proper to man that a rational person may be willing to die, not as treason to his life, but as the only act of loyalty possible to him. Conversely, the man who makes terms with the rulers of a dictatorship, the man, let's say, who delivers his wife and closest friends to destruction in exchange for being allowed to survive, it is this man that does not hold man's life as a standard of value. His motive is terror of dying, not the passion for living. He is willing to sacrifice every value he had ever found. He is willing to live without values and to surrender that which had been their root, his mind, his independence, his judgment, his love, in order to gain the security of a caged animal. Remember that the concept of man's life and value are very wide abstractions, are they not? For every individual man, the value of life is experienced by him through the particular values he has chosen. These constitute the source of his enjoyment of life, and that enjoyment is the emotional fuel that keeps him moving. The greatest of these, as we shall see in subsequent lectures, the greatest of these values to anticipate are work and love. And such values can become irreplaceable. That is, once holding them, a man may have no desire to live without them, without the particular values which grant the pleasure, the enjoyment, the fulfillment of his life. For this reason, a rational man might willingly risk death to save the life of the woman he loves because the value of life to him has become inextricably tied to her existence. We're only wide open, let us say, with regard to the issue of values at the moment of birth. From that time on, we're forming concrete value attachments, and we're not in love with life as some sort of floating abstraction, or with values as some sort of disembodied abstraction, but with our life and with the particular values we choose. That is what gives meaning and enjoyment to our life. The man who, in any and all circumstances, would place his physical self-preservation above any other value is not a lover of life, 
he's an abject traitor to life, to the human mode of life, because he sees no difference between a life proper to a rational being and the life of a mindless vegetable. He sees no value as non-expendable. His treason is not that he values his life too much, but that he values it too little. Quoting Francisco, to love a thing is to know and love its nature. To love life is to know and love the nature of life. And since life is a process of self-sustaining action, this means to love the process of self-sustaining action, to love the thought, the effort, the struggle, the challenges that such action entails. Don't imagine that the man who dreams only of security, therefore, and who's fearful of any risk, is the lover of life. That's the man who's in passionate, irrational rebellion against the very nature of life. Because life does entail risk in the sense that it entails struggle. That is the nature of what life is and means. Anybody who says the only thing he has against life on earth is that all of his desires are not automatically guaranteed to him, except for that life would be wonderful, is the man who hasn't any understanding of what life is or what it means. That is the person who doesn't want to live in the literal meaning of the term. No, he doesn't want to live because to live means that process which we have been concerned with discussing this evening, that process of accepting an at one's nature as a living organism, as a certain kind of organism, of pursuing values, of struggling, and that involves, to repeat, always the possibility of failure and defeat. One doesn't like it, one doesn't want to fail or to be defeated, obviously, but a rational man doesn't rebel against that which is metaphysically part of what life itself entails. Therefore, to accept or to hold man's life as one standard of value means to live in accordance with the principles that man's life qua man requires and to accept the metaphysical nature of life as the base, as the starting point, as the context in which one frames or forms any particular values, desires or goals which one might elect to pursue. One doesn't hold any values or goals rationally which are inimical to incompatible with the nature of what the existence of a living being is metaphysically. And observe to what extent, again referring you to the villains in Atlas Shrugged by way of demonstration, observe to what extent the very fundamental essence of the evil of the villains, again using James Taggart as the simplest, purest example, is their virulent hatred of the very nature of life. That is what it means when Galt speaks of them as functioning on the death premise. James Taggart is against all of the cardinal aspects which life requires or which serves life, from intelligence to ability on the one hand to the phenomenon of challenge or risk on the other. Human life is exactly what he actively disvalues and feels the most, if you could elevate resentment into a metaphysical emotion, that's James Taggart's attitude towards the very metaphysical nature of life. And here what you want to appreciate is the fact that a mere fear of dying or fear of the pain of dying has nothing whatsoever to do with dedication to life. Because dedication to life means dedication to the life process. And that's what any irrationalist such as James Taggart is conspicuously not dedicated to. Well, if man is to live efficaciously, what are the fundamental principles of action which must guide him? The first of these and the most fundamental is, as we have seen, the exercise of the virtue of rationality. Next week, we shall continue our discussion of the other principles of action which are required by man's life and shall discuss not only what these principles of action are, but why they are required by man's life and in what way they support and further man's life. To be continued. <laughs>